Chapter 16 in the Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16, Adolescence, Spontaneous Religious Awakenings. The period of adolescence is somewhat naturally marked off by the facts at hand as extending from 10 or 11 years to the age of 24 or 25. This agrees only fairly well with the common use of the term. It is the custom to regard puberty as the index of the beginning of adolescence. This is the result of interpreting adolescence in physiological terms, but if it is viewed from a more psychological standpoint, we shall find that its earlier limit is pushed back two or three years, in so far as there are any definite events which mark the end of the adolescent period. They agree pretty well in placing it about 25. Clauston, for example, who makes the period coincide with that of the development of the functions of reproduction, and accordingly to end with the full perfection of these functions, places the limit at 25. Foster's Medical Dictionary puts the end of adolescence at 25, for boys and 21 for girls. There is considerable individual sex and race variation in regard to both the initial and latter limit, for which our purpose does not need to be taken into account. Adolescence is, in some respects, the most interesting period from the standpoint of religious development as from every other's point of view. It is the great formative period. Youth has stored up vast undercurrents of will and emotion and cross-currents which oppose and conspire to bring about the most varied and contradictory phenomena. For this reason, it is also one of the most difficult periods to study. The whole religious history of adolescence, as it pictures itself in the cases before us, is too large and complex to grasp except in fragments. Now one stream and tendency, and now another, arises in bold relief and reveals the forces at work in human life. Certain aspects of adolescence will consequently be taken up in turn, and will be seen later falling into harmony. 1. The period of clarification. Late in childhood, at the beginning of adolescence, there is a more or less definite clearing of the religious atmosphere. It appears to be the rule with girls, and is frequent among the boys. As we have already seen, the ideas of God and duty in religious observance have been external to the child during the earlier years, but now they take root in his life and have a vital significance. Heretofore they have been embodied in precept or custom or his own playful imagination. Now they have begun to be shown his own. Often the growth from within has been unconscious, and the freshly organized little world presents itself to the child as something large and new, and with an emotional accompaniment. The awakening is manifested variously. In putting the instances together, they fell naturally into three groups. A fresh insight involving a distinct rational element, a first-hand perception of right and wrong, and an emotional response. These instances illustrate. Insight, female. One morning, when a child coming home from church, as I was walking in at the gate, the thought came to me, there is a God. I had always been taught it, but never realized it until just at that time. Female. When eleven, I woke to the realization of deeper truths. Male. At puberty, I became more serious and rationally conscious. Male. When fifteen, I began to realize for my own self the importance of prayer and to feel that God was a spirit. Moral. Female. When nine, the seeds which had been sown began to grow. I did wish earnestly to be good. I would go into lonely places to pray. Female, 110, I became especially good at home and at school. I do not know what made me think so, but I thought God loved me better. It influenced me for good for a long time after that. Male, my inward development began at this time, 14, marked by a general clearing up of moral ideas. Male, I told a lie, 114, I had done evil things before, certainly. The lie revealed to me my conscience. Emotional. Female, when eleven I had a sudden and violent awakening, a continuous state of religious fervor. I had had a dangerous illness. Female, when ten I had a sense of being saved. My religious nature was awakened and I felt for myself the need of religion. Male, while sitting alone at home one Sunday, thinking of religious duties, I heard a distinctive voice within me, My son, give me thy heart. Female, on one occasion, ten years of age, while singing the hymn ending, Repentant to the Skies, etc., I remember lifting up my arms and feeling as if a divine presence were in the room. So strong was the feeling that I drew back my arms 
and said to myself, Why, that must have been God. I was in my room alone at the time. Grouping these in similar instances, we have Table 19. The gross result is that there is a pretty definite period of clarification with at least half of the girls and a third of the boys. Complete records would doubtless have made the percentages higher. It is thus seen to be a very common phenomenon for the innocence of childhood to give place suddenly to religious intuitions which arise unexpectedly. The age when such clarifications occur, as will be seen from the table, is on the average about 11 for girls and 13 for boys. The exact age was not always given. This, with the fewness of the cases among the males, makes the average ages put in parentheses in the table too uncertain to build on. Taken as a whole, it is safe to say that there is a difference of about two and a half years between the sexes, which coincides with the difference which is usually supposed to exist in the maturity of the sexes at this period. The number of cases of boys were scattered, but the ages fall principally between 11 and 15. Those of girls range from 8 to 16, but mostly from 10 to 12 inclusive. The cases of girls in which the exact age was given form this series. Number of cases 6, 7, 13, 10, 10, 2, 4, 3, 1. The year of greatest frequency is 10, which is likewise the time of sudden increment in the number of cases of conversion. It is instructive to compare these ages with those of conversion as shown in Part 1. The rapid increase in the number of these sudden beginnings is at 10, while in conversion it was at 11. It is significant that girls first awaken most frequently on the emotional side and least often to new insight into truth. The boys, on the contrary, have the emotional awakening least frequently, but organize their spiritual world most often as a moral one. In these first beginnings of religion, we have doubtless a glimpse into the most vital and primal elements in it. It is as if suddenly the curtain were lifted, and one had a glimpse into those forces which have been lying dormant during the earlier years of childhood. The emotional outburst may be interpreted as a sudden realization in consciousness of the latent life, forces which express themselves in terms indefinable to clear consciousness. The sudden intellectual perception into the significance of religion seems to signify the expression of this energy with an intellectual concomitant. In the sudden bunning of conscience and the perception of the moral worth of things, we are tracing one step further the ethical root of religion which we saw already showing itself in childhood. 2. Spontaneous Awakenings The phenomena we have just noticed are not to be distinguished in character from those which come all through adolescence. They are distinguishable from these we are now to consider only by being the first awakenings to a vital experience of religious truth, generally after credulous and thoughtless childhood. Similar experiences are liable to occur at any time during adolescence even after joining church or being confirmed, or engaging in active religious work, there is often a deepening of feeling, a fresh outburst of life, a sudden revival of interest. The nature of these experiences will be made clear by a few typical instances. Female. Father died when I was 15. He was not a church member. I determined I would stand or fall with him. I was hostile to religion and looked on it stoically. I came to the conviction when 17 that I was living far below my ideals. The pressure became too great. A spontaneous emotional awakening came, which lasted three months. At the end of that time, I joined church. The pressure from without and the desire to please mother do not seem sufficient to explain it. Male. While walking along a woodland pasture on Sabbath morning, 24 years, I experienced an unusual realization of the goodness and love of God. It was the richest moment of blessing that ever came to me. Female, I grew up into the simple, strong, pure faith of my parents. When 15, I began to think more of God as a personal element in my life, turning to Him for comfort. Male, when attending Holy Communion at 16, I was filled with a wonderful feeling and lifted up to a sense of my duty. It was a spontaneous awakening within me. We have, in these instances, experiences with which we are already more or less familiar from the study of conversion. The phenomena here suggested are very close related, in the purest instances, to conversions of the milder type. Let us inquire what religion they bear to conversions. 
the distinction is in part purely one of terminology had a few of the deepened experiences we are now studying happened to those accustomed to describe them in evangelical phraseology they would doubtless have been called conversions there seems to be no dividing line between the most decisive transformations from sin to righteousness which all would acknowledge to be conversions and the milder forms we are now considering and which clearly fall outside of that distinction they form a continuous series the distinction at the extremes of the series is clear spontaneous awakenings represent some phase of the larger experience embodied in conversion though they lack the all-aroundness of the latter the conviction phenomena the feeling which follow the awakening the sense of a definite change in life or some equally important aspect of conversion is usually wanting in individual instances the following case will illustrate male i had been on the rocks all day shut off by the tide i took little thought of time but all day looked out upon the waves which came rolling up to me and then receded i was awed by the forces and manifestations before me and on that day i came to wonder if it were possible for everything to proceed in so regular a way unless there were a god who had designed it and managed it all all at once there came over me a sudden feeling of insignificance and a sense of the immensity of the universe of the existence and omnipresence of god i fell upon my knees there and my inmost being seemed to commune with something higher than myself by this time the tide was down and i walked back as the sun was setting life seemed new i had been lifted up the field of vision was larger there was within me a love of mankind and a determination to bear the burden of others this experience in its definiteness is suddenness and in the new feeling toward life which followed is similar to conversion it is more like the vision which comes to the poet or to the philosopher it is not preceded by a sense of unworthiness and as the awakening was not followed by a definite turning about a reformation it is such an event as might occur again or often the more striking experiences gradually shade off into those which are attained simply by a deepening of feeling and increased enthusiasm of a more or less sudden character in spiritual things that at some time during adolescence there should come a fresh awakening of religious feeling is provided the data we are studying are representative the rule rather than the exception from the fact that they shade off into common experiences it is an arbitrary matter to limit the class and consequently to give a statistical estimate an attempt to do so keeping only fairly distinct cases such as are quoted above and including with them joining the church when it was a vital step gives the following result among the females eighty percent and among males sixty eight percent pass through such experiences or we may say in round numbers that they are present in about three-fourths of the cases further evidence that they are a common occurrence may be found in dr lancaster's study of adolescence of five hundred ninety eight respondents to his questions five hundred eighteen report new religious inclinations between twelve and twenty five he makes a generalization that more than five out of six have had these religious emotions as we should expect the age at which religious awakenings occur tend to mark off a definite period in life the exact age was not always given in all there were eighty eight cases among the females and fifty among the males who specified the age the distribution of these according to years is shown in figure twelve distance to the right indicates the age and upward indicates the percent of the whole number which occur at any given year thus twelve point six percent of the awakening of girls were at ten for both sexes they nearly all fall between the years of ten and twenty one there are only a few scattered ones before or after those ages another small set of statistics not included in the present study was collected from among the soldiers of the standing army of thirty two cases of religious awakening they fell with only two or three exceptions between the years thirteen and twenty one the larger number in dr lancaster's study also fell between twelve and twenty this much we may say with certainty that spontaneous awakenings are distinctly adolescent phenomena although these instances are almost wholly limited to adolescence there are a few scattered ones later on there is one instance as late as fifty five male i graduated from h at forty five for ten years i practiced medicine then without any definite plan or human purpose i became an ordained clergyman 
it was a new unfolding in which i had nothing more to do seemingly than does the bud in blossoming i had always followed a slow movement onward and upward this occurred in a person who had been active mentally throughout his life but whose opportunities for intellectual pursuits had not kept pace with his interests in that direction it is conceivable that a new unfolding of this sort might occur at any time in life provided an ideal is kept fresh in advance of present possibilities and that physiological functions which underlie development are still active it is hardly probable that it would occur later than fifty five which is the average age at which the nervous system begins its decline in weight and possibly in its capacity for undergoing definite changes as will be seen from the curves in the figure the distribution throughout the years bears a striking similarity to that of conversion the number of cases is too few to produce curves of any great regularity but by comparing those in the figure with the ones for conversion in figure one one sees that there is a tendency here just as those for each of the curves to have three peaks those in curve f for females are at ten and twelve at fifteen and eighteen respectively in m for males they are at eleven to twelve fifteen and eighteen to twenty one respectively the earlier peak for the girls is larger than that later one while exactly the reverse is true for boys the tallest peak for both sexes is the middle one the average age of these deepened experiences and of conversions closely correspond the average age of spontaneous awakenings from this study is thirteen point seven years for females and sixteen point three years for males from dr lancaster's study of two hundred autobiographies is sixteen for males the average age for conversion is fourteen point eight for females and sixteen point four for males we have in these facts a strong suggestion of the connection between conversion and spontaneous awakenings the greatest evidence of their likeness or difference to be sure must be looked for in the content of experiences rather than in statistical comparison on the surface however it appears that there is a close connection we have noticed that both sets of phenomena are sharply marked off between the same years that the average age of their occurrence differs by only a fraction of a year and also that the peculiar distribution through the years is very similar it is safe to say that conversion is not a unique experience but that it has correspondences in the common events of religious growth there is however this difference that should be noted namely that spontaneous awakenings come earlier than conversions religious awakenings begin about a year earlier in both sexes than do conversions and the periods of greatest frequency that is the large middle peaks in both curves likewise culminate one year earlier the explanation of this difference may be found in part in the fact that the awakenings are not so deep going and vital it would appear that the religious ideal embodied in the dogma of conversion gets a hold of a normal tendency in life and emphasizes it rather than hastening the normal trend of religious life it tends to deepen it it establishes a standard of conduct which must be thoroughgoing and full of significance to be experienced at all and consequently which requires some degree of maturity to undergo having now before us all the available data in regard to the age of religious awakening of both the cataclysmic and the milder type we may sum up what they seem to show most concisely by expressing in the form of curves the frequency of their occurrence this is shown in figure thirteen the curves are not drawn directly from statistics but are meant to be composites of all the curves we have studied they leave out minor details and take the general trend we may call them the curves of probability that religious awakening should occur at any definite year in each of the sexes the curves show that religious awakenings of all kinds are mostly confined to adolescence say between the years ten and twenty one they seem to indicate that religious feeling comes as a tidal wave which culminates shortly after puberty and that lesser waves proceed and follow its crest let us sum up the conditions underlying the variations in the curves together with the additional evidence adducible from the present study the earlier outburst which gives rise to the peaks at about twelve is fuller of religious feeling and more liable to come among girls these awakenings come at a period when there is a sudden impetus in almost all aspects of mental life 
The second rise in the curves, most frequently at 15 and a half in both sexes, is the more important one, and appears to have some relation with puberty, and to be more or less connected with the rapid development in weight, which comes near the time of puberty. As we saw in the study of conversion, the religious awakenings seem to supplement puberty, to follow it by a little, and perhaps to be somewhat definitely, although remotely, connected with it. There is a little fresh evidence to corroborate the previous facts. The study of deepened experiences in the soldiers of the American Army heretofore referred to indicates the same relations between the two events as was shown in conversion. Religious awakening occurs most frequently at 17, while in these same subjects puberty came most often at 14 and 15. Aside from the evidence suggested by the concurrence of the two periods as shown in the statistics, there is considerable evidence of their connection in the statement of the respondents in regard to their inner experiences. Male, I was confirmed at 15. Contemplation of the awfulness of sin nearly overwhelmed me. At this same time, I had one continual struggle with sexual passion. Male, at 14, came my first interest in Christianity. It was at this time that I first yielded to a secret sin against my body. Male, when deeply moved religiously at 16, evil made its appearance. By prayer and faith, I withstood it. Male, when 14, I had a terrific love affair. I conceived a fondness for the Stoics and bought an Epictetus, which I read with interest. A pointed evidence of the relation is shown in the character of the two curves, that of the girls being more rounding and less decisive in its middle peak, while that of the boys rises much higher at this point than at any other year. This agrees with the character of the physiological event, which is far more climacteric in the cases of males. For a long time it has been customary to point out the connection between spiritual exaltation and the sexual instinct. At the time when Anstey wrote, says Mr. Havelock Ellis, the connection between the spiritual exaltation and organic conditions was not so plain as it is at present, but he clearly perceived the special faculty with which the ecstatic condition passes over into sexual emotion. Since then, the almost constant connection between ecstasy and sexual emotion has been fairly well recognized. The phenomena of the religious life generally are, to a large extent, based on the sexual life. Although, as will be shown in the latter chapter, this connection is a remote one, and the religious instinct in its higher development is dependent upon other conditions and has other sources nevertheless, the various phenomena, ascension to puberty, rapid physical development, transformations in mental life, and spontaneous religious awakenings are so closely interwoven that we may say with certainty that they have had in evolutionary development a direct and intimate relation. The third rise in the curve seems to correspond to a period of mental maturity, as the second rise does to physical maturity. The same thing was observed in the study of conversion. This distinction has been clearly recognized by students of adolescence whose point of view has been a distinctly physiological one. Dr. Beerent, for example, divides puberty into three stages, the premonitory stage, puberty itself, and the seceding stage. The last one follows the other by a year or so. He characterizes it thus. He, the young man, is no longer astonished at his sensations. He reasons about them. His ideas become more serious and his judgment more certain. He is in the perfect blossoming of intelligence and memory. Clouston, in like manner, distinguishes the adolescent period connected directly with puberty from the latter stage, from 18 years on. The latter one is more clearly marked by development in the higher cortical centers, or, on the physical side, by development in the higher aspects of the mental life. A qualitative study of the experiences which come at the time of the third rise in the curve shows that they are more mature and have a greater degree of insight, in this respect being different in kind from those that come at the earliest period. This is more characteristic of the boys than of the girls, a fact which will have considerable significance in the discussions which follow. These three periods mark off three crises in adolescent development. They are periods in which the life forces tend upward toward the higher brain centers. At this time, the latent energy which has been stored up during the activities of childhood, and even during racial life, becomes actualized and expressed in terms of the higher psychic life. This energy is expressed not only 
in an emotional and rational form, as the evidences already adduced would seem to show, but also in motor terms. A rather common aspect of adolescent religion is that the youth sets out to do things. It is a period of heightened spiritual activity. The average age of the beginning heightened activity is 13.6 years for females and 17 for males. Female, I began to take an active interest in church when I was 10. Male, when 16, religious faith became the all-absorbing interest of my life, and I thought it should be for all men. Female, when 16, I became ultra-evangelical. I was proud and impetuous at the same time that I cultivated self-renunciation. Ascetic tendencies were strong. I thought pleasures were a snare. I was over-humble. Female, I held myself, when 16, responsible to God for my life and the use of it. Under different circumstances, I should have wished to be a sister of charity. As it was, I thought the missionary the ideal person. I exalted everything religious and admired the old Puritan ideal. Before I united with the church, I threw myself into all its activities and considered secular demands of slight moment. A study of the records indicates that 26% of the females and 20% of the males, or about one-fourth of all the subjects studied, passed during adolescence through a period of marked religious activity. In Lancaster's study of 200 biographies, 58 of them mention times of great energy and unusual activity during adolescence. The fact that females have such periods more frequently than males might give rise to the inference that females are more given to religious activity than males, which would be in direct contradiction to what we shall see later. With males, the active element is more constant throughout the youth, while the females, as will be seen, are more apt to fluctuate between activity and feeling. The distribution of these experiences through the years is nearly the same as that of the deepened experiences already noticed. This fact seems to indicate that the emotional awakening and the heightened activity which expresses itself in enthusiasm in church work or in the missionary spirit are two aspects of the same thing. It is a newly realized energy which passes over directly into conduct. The dips and the curves are partly explained by the discussion of the peaks, but they deserve more than a passing word. They correspond to periods of indifference which are marked by spiritual callousness. The conditions underlying this peculiarity have already been discussed. They are found in part in the fact that religious development either supplements some other phase of activity, the life energy now expending itself in one direction, now in another, or that it comes along with some other aspect of development as its normal correlative. The causes are to be looked for in the ebb and flow of religious feeling. In the same individual, emotion is rhythmical. In the cases studied, 15% of the females and 13% of the males experienced two periods of marked religious interest, similar to the ones we have been describing. They are separated by from one to six or seven years, but usually by three or four. The intervening period is often one of relaxation or indifference to religion. This will illustrate. Male, when 11, while others were professing conversion, I was strongly moved to take part. I was thought too young to understand and I was much grieved at being repressed. I lost interest and had a tendency to seek lively company. I had no more marked religious impressions until 18. At that time I became serious, thoughtful, and penitent. I found in a few days there had been quite a change. Female, I joined church when 11. At about 13 there came a dark period of reaction. It was the worst period of my child life, of my whole life indeed. I was not sure I was a Christian that I ever had been, or that I ever wanted to be. I was wayward, impatient of restraint, discontented, ill-tempered, selfish, and hateful. I felt like doing the very things I knew I ought not to do. How I grew out of this period of restlessness, unreligion, I do not know. When our church was reorganized, when I was 15 or 16, I was glad to be in the fold again. There was some remorse for my past waywardness, but I soon felt that I had been forgiven and was happy in church life and it seemed as though those years of rebellion had been dropped out of my life. In the restlessness and irritation that are shown in this intervening period, one sees an evidence of the unsettled condition of the nervous system during the rapid growth period. In this particular case, it is accompanied by exaggerated sensitiveness aroused by maladjustment of the complex growth processes. It is just as frequently marked, on the contrary, by deadening of the sensibility to finer impressions,
and consequently by complete indifference to religion. Female, for a little while, before I was sixteen, I turned to other ideals. I gave up trying. I felt myself very wicked. It seemed to me that some power outside of myself was turning me around. I never could say I was converted at such a time, but after I was sixteen I had given up the idea of being one thing and seeming another. The case of John Stuart Mill, as related in his autobiography, is a classic one to illustrate complete callousness. I was thus, as I said to myself, left stranded at the commencement of my voyage, with a well-equipped ship and rudder but no sail, without any real desire for the things which I had been so carefully fitted out to work for, no delight in virtue or the general good, but also just as little in anything else. The fountains of vanity and ambition seemed to have dried up within me as completely as those of benevolence. Thus, neither selfish nor unselfish pleasures were pleasures to me. I frequently asked myself if I could, or if I was bound to go on living, when life must be passed in this manner. I generally answered to myself that I did not think I could possibly bear it beyond a year. Sometimes, especially among women, the fresh activity or enthusiasm shows itself first, only to be overtaken soon by relaxation, uncertainty, and indifference. Sometimes, on the contrary, adolescence begins with uncertainty and indifference, often accompanied by pain and activity, seems to come as a relaxation from the strain and tension under which the person is bound. With other temperaments, these periods alternate with rhythmical regularity. A study of double awakenings reveals this interesting coincidence. In the case of females, the first experience is, on an average, at 12.1 years, and the second at 15.4, making a difference of 3.3 years. Among the males, the average of the first is 13.7 and the second 18.2, with a difference of 4.5 years. This rise and fall in religious interest or activity in individuals seems to correspond almost exactly to the dip in the curves for groups of individuals. Until we know more of the conditions which underlie the ebb and flow of the emotional life of adolescence, this period of religious activity and indifference must simply be accepted as a fact. It is often remarked by persons who have had long experience in dealing with young people that there are periods when efforts at religious culture are apparently almost entirely futile. If the cases we are studying are representative, such a period is definite and frequent enough to raise the question vigorously, what is the proper regimen of an adolescent during these periods? Should the efforts at spiritual training be intensified, or, on the contrary, should they relax and await the time when there is an active response to higher influences? That such a period exists suggests at least the necessity for patience in the treatment of youth, that at such times the boy or girl is not necessarily hopelessly given over to the control of evil. The spiritual callousness which shows itself on the surface we are able to say with some degree of certainty, may be simply an indication that the life forces are expending themselves in other directions, and that if the surroundings are free and healthy and normal, new life and fresh insight and awakened enthusiasm will, in all probability, come in due time of themselves. End of chapter 16. Chapter 17 of The Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in a public domain. Chapter 17, Adolescence, Storm, and Stress. Early adolescence is clearly a time above all others when new forces are beginning to act, new powers to function. They seem to well up out of the sea of unconscious. They show themselves first as feeling, sometimes as a fresh burst of life, as we have seen, but more often with a pain of accompaniment. Ferment of feeling, distress, despondency, and anxiety are so common a feature of these years that for a long time early adolescence has been designated a period of storm and stress. It is as if the being were struggling to give birth to new ideas and fresh life forces, which it already does do a little later, as we shall see. It is as if one's being were strained or torn by the pent-up winds that swept it, and which are trying in some way to vent themselves. It is by no means the exception but the rule. For such a period to come, there is a well-marked display of the phenomena in 70% of the females and 52% of the males. There are, fortunately, two other sets of statistics on the prominence of storm and stress. Mr. A.C. Nutt, in an empirical study on the advantages of philosophical training, 
reports that 67% of the cases studied passed through such a period. In Dr. Lancaster's study of adolescents, of 776 respondents, 471, or 61.5%, report spells of depression. The nature of Mr. Nutt's study naturally called out a special class of subjects, which may account for the slightly larger percent in his statistics. Dr. Lancaster's cases, like those in the present study, may be regarded as representative. The three classes of statistics are strikingly in accord. It appears conclusive that over 60% of average American young people pass through such a period. Character of the storm and stress experiences. The welling up of new life forces onto the plane of the higher consciousness is the central thing in the storm and stress phenomena. But when this new life breaks at the surface, it manifests itself with as great variety as there is diversity, on the one hand, of temperament, and on the other, of environmental conditions. When compared among themselves and viewed in their relations, these experiences form certain well-marked types, the most distinct of which we shall notice in turn. The most prominent of these types is the sense of incompleteness and imperfection. Underneath the surface there has been a moving onward toward an ideal, but the ideal is not yet assumed at definite outlines. A new personality has been taking shape, but it is enshrouded in a mist. There is the same disquietude and unrest and aching irritation that we saw preceding conversion. The following extracts will illustrate this state of mind. Female, when 14, I had a pitiable struggle to do what I thought I ought. I often got out of bed and prayed for reconciliation and peace of mind. I struggled and strove to be willing to lead others to Christ. Female, from 12 to 16, I lived a sort of up-and-down life. I tried hard to be good. In times of deep trouble, I have prayed and prayed in anguish of spirit. Female, I suffered for years, thinking the joys of religion were not for me. Male, from 16 to 20, was a period of struggle. I came upon higher ideals and did not live up to them, even approximately. One sees in these instances, either explicitly or implicitly, the presence of a higher ideal, the difficulty of attaining it, and underneath it all, an incipient constructive moral consciousness, which drives one on resistlessly toward some goal. One is often in a state of poise between various possibilities, and the uncertainty which is felt as to the proper mode of procedure increases the vexation of spirit. This is shown in the following instance. Male, when about 18, I studied and thought long on the question of sanctification. The experience I sought was not in the conquest of marked evil habits, and on the whole was rather vague. Two or three times, with fear and nervous apprehension, I took the start, saying, Now I claim as mine perfect holiness. But I found nothing very different save a trying nervous strain of anxiety and painful scrutiny, lest some shade of thought should prove false my mental claim to perfect sanctification. This feeling is often heightened until it becomes a sense of sin, with the meaning of which we have become familiar. The following quotations will suggest the similarity between the experience as it shows itself in these cases and those who pass through conversion. Female, I was extremely nervous and passionate and lacked self-control. I ultimately sinned through weakness and morbidly brooded over my wicked nature. At times I concluded I never could be good and might as well not try. Then would follow a long fit of remorse. Female, when eleven I began to think about the future. I became restless. Everything I did seemed to be wrong. Then I would make fresh resolves not to do it again. Male, when seventeen I began to seek salvation. I felt helpless and convicted of sin. Male, when fourteen I fell in with wayward companions. I was upbraided by conscience. It was a terrible period of life. I felt remorseful and convicted of sin. Male, after my twelfth year, I began to run with a set of boys whose influence was far from good. At first I was conscious I should not go with them and do the things they did. Every now and then something would come up to recall my old feelings, and for days I would be in great despair. About my fifteenth year I became once again very much interested in religious matters. These experiences show the background of the sense of sin and the sense of incompleteness. They are the result of the present and ideal personality brought into contrast. There is a twofold distinction between the sense of sin and the sense of incompleteness. 
On the one hand, the sense of sin is an exaggeration of the sense of incompleteness. The hiatus between the ideal and the present attainment becomes so great that the latter is looked upon as something objective, as a thing in itself, and often as a thing which holds the personality in subjection. It is conditioned, perhaps, by an impulsive nature which is intermittently thrown into extremes of action and then into remorse. This is shown in the case above in which the person alternately sinned through weakness and morbidly brooded over her wicked nature. On the other hand, the sense of sin is frequently distinguished from the sense of incompleteness by the presence and feeling of actual waywardness. A still further exaggeration of this same feeling is the fear of eternal punishment. The easiest explanation of these fears which come up in adolescence is that they are due to the sway of theological doctrines. A study of the cases reveals the fact, however, that they occasionally come to the persons whose religious training has been of the freest sort. This is well illustrated in the following experience of a woman reared in apparently the most liberal religious environment. She writes, When fifteen I began to have a horror of death. I did not believe in immortality, but had an almost frenzied despair at the idea of going out into nothingness. This grew until the idea made life infinitely, wretchedly hopeless to me. I would have become insane, I think, had hope not come. Such experiences are due pretty clearly to organic physiological conditions. It is apparently a haunting dread that comes over one when a larger spiritual world of truth is about to break in. It is apparently the idea of vastness, of infinity, that cannot be comprehended and still must be grappled with. One woman writes, From 8 to 17, I had horrid fears of having to live an eternal life. Such instances seem to be frequent, in which the idea of punishment is not the essential background of the feeling, but the sense of complete incapacity to grasp some large conception. It is a singular fact, which Dr. Scott has brought out in his study of old age and death, that the thought of death, even when completely dissociated from religious conceptions, is most pronounced during adolescence. When life's forces are most rapidly becoming realized is the very time when the possibilities of its discontinuance appeal most strongly to consciousness. The feeling doubtless centers in the fact that the new personality is uncertain and unstable, and it feels vitally its own vacillating nature. In view of the fact that the most diverse development towards virtue or genius or criminality or whatever direction life takes is usually begun in adolescence, it appears that youth often rightly interprets its instability and its liability to go out into nothingness. The point for us in this connection is that the fear of death and hell is not the direct result of the religious doctrine. On the other hand, we may go behind the dogma and see the conditions on which it rests. A type of the storm and stress experience which is second in frequency is brooding, depression, and morbid introspection. These quotations will illustrate. Female, I was naturally reticent about religion. At a revival, I rose for prayer. Afterwards, I thought I wasn't a Christian. The pastor talked to me about joining the church. I couldn't talk to him. I went back into my old feeling of unrest and grew more and more onto myself. Female, from 13 to 17, I became very morbid. I took but little interest in life at all. The cause was probably ill health. Male, at 24 I fell into morbid hopelessness and unwise self-dissection. Every imperfection was thought a sin. Female, I joined the church on probation when 12. I went home and cried, for I didn't feel happy. I did everything I could to appease my conscience. Read the Bible, told mother everything, put aside my jewelry, felt very solemn and unhappy. These experiences arise just as those we have already noticed, both in connection with and outside of the dominance of religious doctrine. The conditions underlying them are not different from those which give rise to the sense of incompleteness and the sense of sin. There is, however, as the cause of this type, a greater passivity of temperament, more of a feeling of inability to reach out and attain. It is only different from the sense of incompleteness in that the degree of self-consciousness is greater. These distinctions are reflected in the following instance. A woman writes, I was building up my character with more self-conscious than a child should have, and setting up a puritanical conscience to judge my progress. I applied to myself everything that I heard, 
and mourned that I was so selfish and unstable. Sometimes this brooding and self-condemnation passes over into a desire to make propitiation for unworthiness and sinfulness. This results in asceticism. Female, from 13 to 15, religious enthusiasm and mysticism ran high. I had read my father's books on mystics. I practiced fasting and mortification of the flesh. I secretly made burlap shirts and put the burrs next to the skin. I wore pebbles in my shoes. I would spend nights flat on my back on the floor without a covering. Male, I didn't enjoy religious observance, yet forced myself to do it. As a matter of conscience, I spent hours each week on my knees. Still another type which helps to complete the picture of the storm and stress phenomena is distress over doubts. This development usually comes a little later than those we have been describing. Female, when 16, the study of history led to disbelief of what I had been taught. All my ideals in life were smashed. I talked with college friends, and we spelled out many things together. Very bitter feelings accompanied it. Male, up to 18, I had tried to weigh the matter of religion with the cool reflection of a judge. Now it loomed up large, and some solution seemed imperative. It enlisted my emotions, and the struggle was severe. It is a tendency which usually develops when one comes in contact with a larger social environment or with intellectual conceptions which seem to undermine traditional belief. There is almost always evidence that the external conditions interplay with subjective propensities, and not infrequently the doubts seem to arise without being awakened by adequate external circumstances. The most frequent occurrence of storm and stress in which there is an intellectual accompaniment is that the period in which there is a third rise in the curves for religious awakening shown in the last chapter. The rational life which now begins to show itself threatens to destroy the integrity of the self. One naturally craves wholeness, but when the life is driven on toward the point of view which seems to shatter the old, there naturally arise stress, tension, and pain. When there is already a partial organization of the new selfhood, it is sometimes difficult to adjust it to its environment. In that event, storm and stress expresses itself as friction against surroundings. Female, I joined church when eight, 14. At 18, I could not believe many of the doctrines of the church. I felt myself a hypocrite and often wished that I had not joined. Male, from 13 to 16, I dreaded coming in contact with Christian people. To be compelled to attend family prayer, church, and Sunday school was severe punishment. I often felt a voice saying, Repent, but was too stubborn and would not yield. Not infrequently, the struggle is between the tendency of the new life to express itself, on the one hand, in the higher ideation centers, and, on the other hand, to centralize in the reproductive instinct. Consequently, storm and stress is the accompaniment of effort to control passion. The struggle becomes so vital and far-reaching as to involve the whole religious nature, and sometimes takes a definite religious turn. This is illustrated in the following quotations. As far as records show, this is confined entirely to the males. Male, at 15, I made a desperate effort to control passion. I prayed and cried, but couldn't resist. Male, I had terrible struggles, 19, to control passion. Often, I would as soon have been dead as alive. I was in hell for about two and a half years. Male, from 14 to 21, I yielded to secret sin. Each time came remorse and prayer for forgiveness. When 21, I confessed publicly, having yielded to sin, and determined to confess each time. A numerical estimate of the part which each of the above items plays is given in Table 20. The percents give only the relative value of the various headings at the time when the storm and stress reached its highest point in adolescence. That the fear of death and hell, for example, does not appear in the column for males does not mean that they were not troubled with it, but in no case were such fears central in the adolescent disturbance among the males. The percentages show that the feelings of youth central principally around the sense of incompleteness, aspiration after an ideal, striving, longing, etc. The sense of sin, a morbid sense of right and wrong, friction against surroundings, and anxiety over questions of belief. Asceticism is almost absent. Fears rarely occur. It was noticed also that fear seldom rose to the surface preceding conversion, 
however much it may have furnished a strong background for the sense of sin. Averages for the separate items are suggestive. Fears come earliest, as was also true in the study of conversion. They are doubtless instinctive and racial, and issue forth most naturally during the earlier emotional waking at the very beginning of adolescence. They do not involve a rational content, in fact are apparently driven out by the advent of the higher conceptual life. The sense of sin is next and comes earlier than the feelings of incompleteness, which later involves a greater element of will and insight. Latest are the struggles with doubts. The average ages for nearly all the types are, as one would expect, somewhat later in males than in females. There is the one exception of friction against surroundings, which comes later in females. This is perhaps explained by the later development among females of an independent rational life. Taking all the types together, the average age of the beginning of the storm and stress period for females is 13.6 years and for males 16.5 years. This is nearly the same as the average age of the most rapid physical development of both sexes. It almost exactly coincides with the average age of spontaneous awakening, which is an additional evidence that the two sets of phenomena are closely connected. It is well to keep in mind that the figures given above represent the beginning of storm and stress, and not the time when it is at its height. The duration of it varies greatly with different individuals. The average duration for females is 3.1 years, and for males 5.5 years. This shows that in general, storm and stress covers the years during the middle of the adolescent period, that is to say, during the period of greatest instability. It could not well come during the early prepubescent stage of adolescence, for then the new life has not the check of ideas placed upon it, and so comes to the front as an emotional impulse. Nor is it likely to come during the last stage of adolescence, say from 18 to 25, when habits have already begun to form and the functional activities of mind and body have become more settled and constant. The fact that storm and stress should continue longer in males than in females is in harmony with most of the other facts we have noticed, and also coincides fairly with the relative duration of the conviction period preceding conversion, to which it closely corresponds. In each case, the duration is about half as long for females as for males. The distribution of storm and stress through the years giving the years when it began, is seen below. For the purpose of comparing males and females for the same years, the numbers between 8 and 18, about the first and last years for females, were made out on the scale of 100. The similarity of the series for both sexes is strikingly similar to the schematic curves for spontaneous awakenings above. In the case of females, the numbers thicken up at the period of 12, 13, and 14, and at 16, with a distinct falling off at 15. Just as in the curves for conversion, there is further coincidence that the heavier part of both curves is at the earliest rise. The storm and stress curve for males is somewhat similar to that for spontaneous awakenings, except that it comes about a year earlier. The correspondence makes the evidence yet more convincing that the two sets of phenomena are fundamentally related. In fact, we may go one step farther and see that storm and stress and spontaneous awakenings and the conviction phenomena preceding conversion are all three results of the same underlying condition. The evidences are numerous and convincing for the close relationship of storm and stress and conviction. The average age of conversion and of the beginning of storm and stress differs in each sex by only a fraction of a year. The age distribution is almost the same, with the exception that the curve for the beginning of storm and stress is somewhat earlier than that for conversions, and that in the case of females, the earlier rise in the storm and stress curve, which comes at 12, 13, and 14, is relatively much heavier than the latter one. That is to say, storm and stress comes earlier than conversion. But if we bear in mind that the conviction phenomena precede the age of conversion, on the average by as much as a year or more, we shall see that the two sets of phenomena really exactly coincide in the frequency of their age distribution. Again, we have just noticed that in both, the length of duration was about twice as great in the case of males as for females. There is this difference, that the pre-conversion phenomena seem to continue only about one-fifth as long as the storm and stress. 
This is one among the many indications that conversion is a condensed form of adolescent growth. Still more significant is the correspondence in the quality of the feelings in both cases. If we compare tables 9 and 21, we see that all of the types of experience which are present in storm and stress are likewise characteristic of the conviction period. A few comparisons will make the similarity clear. The feeling of incompleteness is the most prominent experience. This is clearly distinguishable from the sense of sin. Friction against surroundings during storm and stress reduces itself to the tendency to resist conviction, which is found to be a pronounced type of pre-conversion experience. Doubts and questionings in both cases are more characteristic of males, while brooding and morbid conscience apply almost exclusively to females. There are, of course, many differences in the tables, but they are explainable by differences in temperament and by the greater emotional strain that is brought to bear at the time of conversion. We are now in a position to see the relation existing between the three sets of phenomena, conversion, spontaneous awakening, and storm and stress. The fact which underlies them all is the physiological and psychical readjustments incident on the transformation from childhood to manhood and womanhood. Spontaneous awakening and storm and stress are perhaps the purest and most characteristic types of adolescent phenomena. Conversion, as we saw, in its most characteristic aspect, is identical with such spontaneous awakening as we have found in the so-called gradual growth type. The central facts in adolescent life, namely spontaneous awakening and storm and stress, have become crystallized into a dogma. The result is conversion. Theology takes these adolescent tendencies and builds upon them. It sees that the essential thing in adolescent growth is bringing the person out of childhood into the new life of maturity and personal insight. It accordingly brings those means to bear which will intensify the normal tendencies that work in human nature. It shortens up the period of duration of storm and stress. The conviction phenomena we have seen are about one-fifth as long as storm and stress, but they are very much more intense. The bodily accompaniments, loss of sleep and appetite, for example, are much more frequent. The essential distinction appears to be that conversion intensifies but shortens the period of storm and stress by bringing the person to a definite crisis. Whether a person shall experience conviction or storm and stress, whether the new life shall begin as a conversion or a spontaneous awakening, depends in part at least upon certain temperamental and physiological causes which determine the character of one's response to environment. A consideration of the differences between the sexes is of itself convincing of the physiological background of storm and stress. As may be seen in Table 20, these differences are so great and so much in line with those we have found heretofore that their significance is unmistakable. Brooding and morbid sensitiveness belong almost exclusively to women. The ratio between the sexes is that of 31 to 6. Fear, one of the deeper instincts, is mentioned only by women, who likewise are swayed far more by the sense of incompleteness, the struggle after an ideal. Males, on the other hand, work out their ideals from the side of reason, as is seen in their greater anxiety over doubt, apparently as 31 to 8. The same thing is indicated in the greater friction with surroundings, which is an index of the power to judge and choose. In short, the constructive and rational elements are more pronounced in males. With them, the push up through adolescence is more specialized, while women are more given to agonizing their way. The contrast grows, doubtless, out of the constitutional unlikeness between the sexes. These same differences are brought out by Clauston, considering that the very highest mental and moral qualities of all with the subtle differentiation between the male and female mental types, are only fully seen between 18 and 25 in the average human being. We must look still to the apparatus through which all this is brought about in the brain cortex. In its organization and qualities alone is to be found the explanation of why in the male sex the mental development at that age is in the direction of action, of cognition, of duty, and of the higher imagination, while in the female sex it takes the direction of emotion, of protective instinct, of a craving for admiration and worship, and the creation of an ideal hero to be loved and worshipped in return. The storm and stress of women often clearly grows out of imperfect physical conditions, 
and many times there is a strong suggestion that such is the case when not definitely stated. Up to the age of 13, I think, I felt real enjoyment in worship and in living the Christian life as I then understood it. From 13 until 17, my life was less even. At times, I was much troubled with doubts concerning religion and even grew very morbid. I became so morbid at last that I think I took but little interest in life at all. As I look back, I should trace the cause in ill health, as I was quite unwell during most of this time, and under the care of a physician. When I was a young girl, I began to have a horror of death, not a fear of it for myself, but a sense of the baffling terror of it, for I had lost the peace and calm of my religious feeling, and I could not believe in immortality, or even in any life within me but the material one. The year after I left school, this despair at the nothingness, which disbelief in a future existence made life seem to me the horror of it, and also a longing infinitely deep and infinitely wretchedly hopeless made life fearful to me. Whether it was this which affected my health or vice versa, I came on the edge of a nervous breakdown. The records of the males likewise indicate that the morbidity is a direct outcome of ill health, although not so frequently as do those of the females. I have had some periods of great depression, especially during recent years. Sometimes have arisen from ill health, sometimes from disappointment and misfortune. At times I have prayed myself into a better state of mind, but ordinarily relief has come in the ordinary natural way, returning health. I became thoroughly morbid on the subject of religion after twelve. I thought in all likelihood I had committed the unpardonable sin. I was of a self-distrustful temperament and easily given to forebodings of evil. I was also, I suppose, growing fast and perhaps rather low in physical vitality. My mother was alarmed about my condition, so utterly hopeless in spirit, and wisely sent me to Massachusetts on a visit. The idea also came to me somehow that if I was a lost soul, it was yet worthwhile to go on doing my duty just the same. I can see that I had here substantially arrived at the state of being, willing to be damned for the glory of God. The ill health and mental anxiety which so frequently arise simultaneously are doubtless expressions of the same basal condition, viz. the rapid growth during my early adolescence which entails great instability in the nervous system. The facts which proceed show that adolescent storm and stress is due to the functioning of new powers which have no specific outlet and are driven to force for themselves an expression in one way or another. If there is no resistance to the expenditure of the new energy, there results a burst of life, fresh consciousness and appreciation of truth, a personal hold of virtue, joy and the sense of well-being. But if there is no channel open for its free expression, it wastes itself against unyielding and undeveloped faculties, and is recognized by its pain accompaniment, distress, unrest, anxiety, heat of passion, groping after something, brooding, and self-condemnation. This stage of adolescence is the period of most rapid physiological readjustments, and consequently is characterized by great instability. In the study of the line of growth of the various psychic activities for for example, there are none of the curves which represent degrees of efficiency that have not great fluctuations during adolescence. The period from 13 to 18 is the one likewise, according to statistics of Gowers, in which epilepsy is most liable to occur. This disease is due to the mental and motor instability of the organism, which prevents the normal inhibition of the energy of the motor areas. The years of its greatest frequency are those likewise in which Storm and stress most frequently occurs. The most marked readjustments at this period is that the areas in the cortex, especially concerned in rational insight, rapidly begin to function. These areas have during the period of childhood lain dormant. Looking to the gradual development of men up to puberty, says Clouston, and the enormous and rather sudden leap that is then taken towards the higher mental life of the adult, we must assume an almost completed apparatus ready to be brought into use just as the centers of respiration are ready for their functions at birth. If it is borne in mind that the central nervous system is the most delicately adjusted part of the human organism, 
and that it requires a greater supply of blood to restore the metabolic changes which accompany mental activity, and that likewise this is the period when the greatest strain is made on the circulatory apparatus because of the rapid physiological development in all parts of the body. One will appreciate the high degree of improbability that these new brain areas should begin to function in a harmonious manner. The available energy is not sufficient to irrigate these new areas properly in order to stimulate their functional activity to its highest degree of efficiency. One sees striking evidence of this state of affairs in the fact that physiological disorders and spiritual difficulties are so apt to show themselves simultaneously. Even under the most wholesome physiological conditions, it is to be wondered at that this readjustment should be made without friction and waste of energy. The child must come out of his little sphere and almost suddenly become the possessor of the spiritual wisdom of his kind. This is tersely stated in the words of Clauston. In the upward course of evolution, the mental part of man's brain has been the highest point hitherto reached. It has been the goal towards which all else has apparently tended. It is a superstructure without which all the other results of evolution would have had no meaning. Though it has probably taken hundreds of thousands of years of the evolutionary process to attain this high result, yet we must never forget that it takes only about five and twenty years and nine months to develop this organic miracle in an individual from the sperm cell and the germ cell up to the grandeur of function, the immeasurable complexity and the inexhaustible capacity that is possessed by the brain of a man of genius. Instead of one brain cortex in a thousand going wrong in this developmental process or failing to reach a fair working capacity of function, the wonder is that, in almost any case, it never attains this. The anguish of the person who undergoes storm and stress is analogous to the cry of the child at birth. He experiences a readjustment equivalent to a shock, and just as it requires a child usually one or two weeks to adapt himself to the new conditions and begin to grow, it is likewise perfectly natural that the youth should experience some years of turmoil in working out the higher spiritual readjustment. The pain accompaniment is a natural result of the lack of harmonious functioning in the organism. Incipient ideas begin to make themselves felt, but do not easily fit in with old customs and habits, and the mental life is accordingly strained and torn. If the question should arise why pain results, it is answered by a similar question why, when a foreign substance comes in contact with a physiological organism, there is no rest until the new body has been cast out or assimilated. It is the nature of the mind to work out its environment into a systematic whole. One of the greatest pains, says Baghout, is the pain of a new idea. The youth is not simply struggling with a single idea, as in trying to solve a difficult problem, but with the authority and majesty of the world order is bearing in on him from every side. The wisdom of the race appeals immediately to his inner conscience. The multiplicity of the demands made upon him leave him in a state of mental congestion. From the standpoint of his inner consciousness, they appeal to him as vague, indefinable possibilities. Peace can never come until equilibrium is restored until he either gives up the struggle or works over and assimilates the larger world that is crowding in upon him as part of his own personality. If our analysis so far is correct, it is evident that adolescence is one of the most critical periods of development, a time when the youth should be treated with the utmost delicacy and discretion. The germinating personality is poised between an infinite variety of possibilities. New forces are tending to sweep it this way and that, Whatever culmination of forces and crystallization of tendencies is undergone at this period will perhaps determine its whole future life. It is the point toward which all the lines of tendency during childhood converge, and interplay with racial forces to determine the direction of the latter development. It is the point at which a blunder may prove most fatal, and that likewise in which wisdom and discretion can reap the greatest harvest, especially in regard to religious training is the situation a delicate one. Religion is concerned with the deeper instincts. It touches life at its most vital point. It is noticeable, for example, that it is in connection with religious feeling that the pathological elements of adolescence reach their most malignant form. Most of all, the difficulties of one at this critical point should be taken seriously. It should be borne in mind that 
the forces that are imperative to consciousness are out of the reach of the individual, that there is a new budding personality that is trying to make its way. It is usually filled with self-distrust, and what it needs most of all is to be inspired by confidence and wise counsel. It is doubtless the idea to be striven after that the development during adolescence should be so even and symmetrical that no crisis would be reached, that the capacity for spiritual assimilation should be constantly equal to the demands that are made on consciousness. The attainment of such an ideal is perhaps to be reached both from the physiological and the psychic side. From the physiological standpoint, the end will be partly attained when the conditions which are conducive to ill health and unhygienic conditions during adolescence are counteracted. The avoidance of physical strains which make too great a draft on the nervous system, the observance of laws of health in the way of wholesome exercise, outdoor games, fresh air and the like, which stimulate circulation and fill the brain with good, rich red blood. These are means which will without doubt be conducive to spiritual health and beauty. On the psychic side, the dangers are readily appreciated. The fatality of impressing the fact of sin and personal unworthiness, of holding out before the adolescent who is trying to develop the horrors of eternal punishment and the emphasizing unduly the ideal of perfection, instead of stimulating the halting and self-distressful soul towards wholesome activity, these and numerous other indiscretions which are so frequently indulged in, need only be seen to be avoided. In view of the significance of the storm and stress phenomena, it is hardly safe to lay it down as an unavoidable rule that the ideal is to escape it entirely. Unless the condition is distinctly pathological, it is conceivable that the youth is, in such times, in a most normal and hopeful state. If he is discreetly let alone at the proper time and helped over difficulties when the occasion demands it, if he is honest and earnest in struggling with his difficulties, the strife may simply mean that he is on the border of a new spiritual revelation. Not infrequently the respondents say that the greatest significance for after development has come out of the struggles of youth. Not infrequently the feeling towards the struggle is like that expressed in Browning's lines. Then, welcome each rebuff that turns earth's smoothness rough. Each sting that bids nor sit nor stand, but go. Be our joys three parts pain. Strive and hold cheap the strain. Learn nor account the pang. Dare never grudge the throw. End of chapter 17. Chapter 18 of The Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18, Adolescence, Doubt. Doubt seems to belong to youth as its natural heritage. More than two-thirds of the persons whose experience we are studying pass through a period sometime, usually during adolescence, when religious authority and theological doctrines were taken up and seriously questioned. To be exact, 53% of the women and 79% of the men have had a pretty distinct period of doubt, which was generally violent and intense. In Dr. Burnham's study of adolescence, three-fourths of his cases pass through such a period. We shall find that the reason underlying the prevalence of doubt is a corollary to those we have come upon in the study of storm and stress. The racial push upward and the individual adolescent development are both, most of all, a growth into a life of clear consciousness. It is a process of emerging from the sea of diffused sensitivity into a life which is characterized by clearness of definition and which is fully organized on the basis of logical order and sequence. During childhood, the force of law and order has been largely external, but now the person must see it for himself. He must be the embodiment of law. In historical development, the tendency has been for that which exists to lose sight of the reasons which produced it, and to become worked over into the nature of an authority. Although the authority may be based ultimately upon reasonable principles, the youth cannot accept it unless its excuse for being has worth to his own intellect. He turns logician and proves everything, and accepts that only which seems to possess a reason, or for which he can construct one. We shall be led a little way into the nature of the doubt phenomena by considering the causes which bring it about. By far the most common occasion of doubt, with men especially, is the study of science and philosophy, 
or the coming into contact with new books or educational surroundings which give rise to new ideas. The following instances are representative of a large class. Male, I studied Darwin and Hume. This, with personal failure, led to doubt of the divinity of the Christ, the geniusness of the Old Testament, and the belief that spirit is separate from matter. Female, when 16 I read the doctrine of evolution and the idea of God. Everything seemed different. I felt as if I had been living all my life on a little island and now was pushed into a great ocean. I have been splashing around and hardly know my bearings yet. I don't see any need for a belief in the resurrection. Our interpretation of adolescent phenomena has so far usually been a physiological and psychological one. We now find some evidence of the sociological forces that give rise to adolescent experiences. One of my respondents, a skilled historian, writes, I have no doubt, if one could vary experimentally the time of contact with new scientific knowledge and shield the mind from it, for a longer or shorter time, in a great majority of cases, this contact would determine the beginning of doubt instead of its being determined by the physiological stages. In my own case, the beginning of doubt was much later than your physiological epoch, but coincident exactly with my first real contact with modern thought. With the change of historical conditions, the whole tone of the biographies would change. The story of doubt, alienation, reconstruction, was not present in early New England history. I think simply because the conflict between an advancing science and an unprogressive church was not known then. The frequency with which educational influences are given as the occasion of doubt, amounting as it does to 73% of men, shows conclusively that external surroundings have a vast deal to do with calling out these experiences. Still further evidence is found in cases like the above in which doubts come relatively late in life. It is a satisfaction to the writer, likewise, to be free a moment from the psychophysiological standpoint, but the escape from it is only apparent and for a moment. It should be admitted once and for all that the forces at work during adolescence which have the most significance from the educational point of view and also from the scientific are those which arise in the interplay of one life upon another and which grow out of the contact between the individual and institutional life. This is eminently true if one looks at the matter from the present epoch in racial development, but one finds oneself directly looking behind the sociological causes for the conditions which underlie them. Why do the forces that are at work in the social complex take effect during adolescence, and not at some time earlier or later period in life? Looking through the cases, we find that almost all the doubts begin between 11 and 20. There are a few scattered ones during the 20s, and almost none after 30. The scattered ones that come later than 26 are so few as to tend to establish the law that doubt, like the other irregularities in development that we have been noticing, belongs almost exclusively to youth. If the person is thrown into constantly changing environments during the whole period after adolescence, one would expect, if the external influences were the only occasion for doubt, that there would be throughout life a continual turmoil and upheaval. Since that is not the case, we must look for deeper causes than the sociological and historical ones, and these are to be found again in the psychophysiological organism. Further evidence of the justice of this point of view is found in the fact that doubts often spring up without any apparent cause. It is more often women than men who are not able to trace the origin of them. Female, as early as 11 or 12, dark thoughts would sweep like a nightmare over me without any cause. I thought it all fable which I had been taught about God and heaven. Female, I have had at times of doubt when I wondered almost if anything were true and how we could believe it. This would usually come at times when I felt unusually despondent and nothing went right. It would end as soon as I felt better. These cases fall at the extreme other end of the series from those we first noticed. They are clearly traceable to physiological causes. The continuance of this series brings us upon those in which the subjective conditions play less and less part, and in which the external influences have greater and greater significance. It is common in both sexes for doubts to work their way quietly from small beginnings. Male. When 15, I got a hold of a book giving the Egyptian origin of the Moses idea and the Assyrian origins of Genesis chapter 1. I thought it skeptical. 
I did not suspect at the time that I had lost faith in anything. At 17, at high school, I was growing skeptical, though I did not recognize it at the time. I remember to have suspected the principle of doing his piety as an academic requirement. Later, I stood quite outside the Bible. Female, after prayer, I would repeat slowly, for Christ's sake, wondering what it meant. When 15, I became disappointed in the Bible and not finding beautiful things there. Revulsion came, and I said to myself, I don't like the Bible. I did not allow the thought to grow. When 18, my sister said she did not know whether to believe in Christ or not. I sprang up excitedly and took her to task severely. In a year, I doubted as much as she. These instances illustrate the force of unconscious activity of the mind and show a nature which is already ripe for the growth of doubt. There are several other causes mentioned as leading to doubt, such as calamity, the misconduct of others, unanswered prayer, and ill health. The most prominent influences mentioned as occasions of doubt are shown in Table 21. Taking both sexes together, educational influences stand highest. Considering the men alone, they are more frequently mentioned than the other causes together. Doubt most often comes in the case of women as a natural growth, and generally bears strong evidence that it has its rise in physical disorder. These differences, together with the fact that unanswered prayer and ill health occasion doubts only among women, are fresh evidences for the differences between the sexes that have already been observed and need no further discussion. Turning now to the objects of doubt, we find them to be, principally, those which have become crystallized into creeds and theologies and passed on by tradition. If we consider both sexes together, the things doubted in the order of frequency are the authority or inspiration of the Bible, the divinity of Christ, some attribute of God, as his goodness or justice, his existence and immortality. This is the order, also, through which the doubts usually progress in the same individual, although the variations from this sequence are numerous, and there are several other objects of doubt not included in this list. The illustrations given below are typical of the progress of doubt. It should be observed how useful it is for doubt to pass on from one thing to another. Male, when 18, certain educational influences led me to doubt the absolute truth of the Bible. It was a gradual process. By 20, I disbelieved in a personal God. The way was thought out step by step. I stopped prayer because it seemed idolatrous. At 21, I stopped Bible reading. Male, I intended to enter the ministry. I began the critical study of the Bible under blank. Doubt set in. In practical life also, I came to see that what I sought successfully was sought under natural law. The next five or six years was a period of constant transition under study and reflection until the supernatural factor disappeared, and by 28 I should have answered the question of God and immortality in the negative. Female, at 15 I began to give up the faith of my childhood point by point, as it would not stand the test of reason. First, the belief in miracles went, then the divinity of Christ. Then, at 18, metaphysical studies showed me that I could not prove the existence of a personal God and left me without a religion. Female, when 18, I began to doubt the Bible. I read books inclined to increase my doubt. By 19, I ceased to find any firm ground to stand on in Christ's atonement. It didn't seem just or right. I wanted to stand before God with no intercession. Soon, a personal God gave way to power, vague, unformed. Sometimes I called it goodness. In some of these instances, a cumulative effect of doubt is observable. If one thing is found which will not stand the test of reason, it leads to the rejection of other things with which the first is supposed to be inextricably bound up. The progress of doubt is found also in exactly the opposite direction. The line of approach already considered is the customary one for men who begin with doubts in regard to specific things, and work their way gradually towards the most abstract and universal conceptions. Women usually take the opposite course. With them, doubt most often begins with a conception of the existence of God, or by lumping everything together and question it all at once. Female, I had a religious awakening when twelve. Two years later, I had bitter struggles for my belief. Reason seemed to undermine my faith on every hand. When praying, the question continually arose, Where is God? To whom am I praying? 
Who is he? Female. I joined church at 13. Shortly I began to think about God, where he came from, etc. I kept dwelling on it till I almost doubted his existence. Female. I joined the church at 12. Since then I have had many doubts and struggles. I have had the feeling that I didn't really believe what I said I did. This has gradually deepened until I don't know, 17, what I do believe. Female. Doubts began at 20 in connection with the death of a very dear friend. Its form was philosophical agnosticism, beginning in materialism and distrust of traditional faith. Some of the more important details with regard to the things first doubted are seen in Table 22. It shows only the objects concerning which doubt had its beginning. It will be seen from the table that doubts usually center around the conventional theological doctrines, although it is highly probable that the inherent disposition to doubt would find some other object if this were not selected. The frequency with which there is one tremendous doubt of everything indicates an organic revulsion. In the table, the difference between the sexes above noted comes out in statistical form. The first three items, namely, doubt of the authority or inspiration of the Bible, the divinity of Christ, or some other traditional custom and belief, all of which are of a specific nature, are much more frequently entertained by men. The existence of God, on the contrary, or some attribute of God, conceptions which are much more central and vital, more abstract in general, or a tendency to question everything, are more often the beginning of doubt among women. Women respond in more organic and indiscriminate ways, live more in the heart of things than men. A definite circumstance or experience is apt to be interpreted by them in universal terms. The doubts of special providence, which are not mentioned by the men, usually come in connection with personal disappointment or unanswered prayer. The distribution of the ages at the beginning of doubt, made on a scale of a hundred for both sexes, gives this series. Note from reader, age goes from 11 to 26, and for females in those years, 12, 6, 12, 14, 16, 16, 10, 10, 2, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Male, 0, 2, 2, 12, 10, 7, 7, 17, 10, 10, 2, 5, 7, 2, 2, 5. We find in these figures an important contrast between the age at which doubt sets in, and the age of the other adolescent disturbances which we have been studying. In fact, the distribution of the ages in this respect exactly contradicts the other curves. Doubts begin oftenest with females at 15 and 16, which is later than the period of the most rapid physical growth. The period of 12 to 13 at which the conversion curve culminated shows a decided falling off in regard to the number of doubts. Among the males, there are fewer cases at 16 and 17, which are the ages of the culmination of the conversion curve and also the period of most rapid physical growth. But just before and just after this point, there is a thickening up of the number of cases of the beginning of doubt. This contradicts, too, the curves for both spontaneous awakening and physical growth. That is, doubts for both sexes seem to arise most frequently outside of the nascent periods for physical and spiritual activity. This leads us to the important conclusion that the beginning of doubt corresponds to the period of arrested mental and emotional activity. The individual records tend to bear out the same conclusion, that the period of doubt is frequently at the time of least religious enthusiasm. One person writes, From 11 to 16 I had religious feeling, although I always prayed, attended church, and believed. I began, however, to use my reason more, and sometimes to wonder why things in this world and the next were as the Bible stated. Whether the doubt is the cause of the apparent spiritual relaxation or the result would be hard to determine. The interesting fact for us is their coincidence. The physical and mental inactivity seems to be an index of the specialization of development which is taking place at this period, and which centers in the perfection of the rational life. Expressed in physiological terms, it is the period of development of the intellectual centers in the cortex at the expense of other areas. This corresponds to the point of view taken in the last chapter in the discussion of storm and stress. These two aspects of adolescent development have much in common. In fact, in more than 40% of the cases in both sexes, storm and stress and doubt 
both occur either at the same time or successively. That the two phenomena are somewhat different is also suggested by statistics. 27% of the women undergo storm and stress without accompanying doubts, while on the other hand, 37% of the men experience doubts without storm and stress. These two phenomena seem to have this in common, that both indicate a rapid development of the intellectual life. There is a difference, however, that storm and stress is a growth of a more confused general inorganic nature than doubt. In the latter, the development seems to be in the same brain areas, but is of a more specialized kind. The same difference is suggested by the fact that doubts come later. Taking the average of the years when both sets of phenomena begin, we find that doubt occurs later on the average by one and a half years. The doubt period thus comes toward the latter end of adolescence, which is a time, as we have seen, when the intellectual life has greater worth in religious development. This coincides fairly well with the period of the most frequent occurrence of adolescent insanity as distinguished from epilepsy and hysteria, the former being of a distinctly mental nature as distinguished from the latter. Storm and stress and doubt are developments of the same essential nature, but in the former there is more of the emotional quality which contains incipient idealational life in solution, while in doubt the intellectual life has become more definitely crystallized. The facts just noted indicate in a pointed way one of the essential six differences. Men are more apt to have doubts without storm and stress, while women are more apt to undergo a ferment of feeling in the absence of doubt. Only 10% of the men have storm and stress without being plunged into doubt, and exactly the same small percentage of women have the intellectual difficulties without accompanying stress. That is, we must say that the adolescence is for women primarily a period of storm and stress, while for men it is in the highest sense a period of doubt. A word should be said in regard to the meaning of doubt as a step in development. We have scarcely outgrown the conception, especially in ecclesiastical circles, that to doubt is sin. There are several instances in the records we are studying in which, when honest questionings have occurred during late childhood or youth, they have been hushed by well-meaning parents or teachers, the result is usually a weakling who cannot grapple with the more serious matters of life, or a person in whom the normal currents of life are dammed up, only to have them break out more violently at some later time. It should be seen that doubts are a part of development which, given certain temperaments, is inevitable, and which is natural and normal if the personality is to attain its highest possibilities. If the full significance of this development is appreciated, we shall not be surprised to find that the higher life purposes develop and intensify simultaneously with the growth of doubt. One person writes, It was during my senior year at college that I first began to feel any troublesome doubts as to the things I had been taught. The influence of study in the natural sciences and the reading of some of the Huxley controversial articles were responsible in part for this. However, my religious intensity increased at this time and it was during this year that a conviction began to form in my mind that it was my duty to become a minister. Doubt is a process of mental clarification. It is a step in the process of self-mastery. It is an indication that all the latent powers are beginning to be realized. A prominent clergyman of an Orthodox church says, I have not passed through a series of beliefs. All my thinking has been an expansion of the fundamental conception reached while in college that the death of Christ was a declaration that there never was and never could be an obstacle between God and man. I always hailed doubt as sure to reveal some unexpected truth. As often as I have tried to dodge doubts, I have suffered. My real doubts have always come upon me suddenly and unaccountably and have been the precursors of fresh discovery. Instead of trying to crush doubt, it would be wiser to inspire earnestness and sincerity of purpose in the use of it for the discovery of truth. If doubts are evil, it is because there is a wicked nature behind them. Doubt is a means of calling up and utilizing the latent possibilities of one's nature. If there is a boundless substratum of healthy life on which to draw, and if there is a high degree of earnestness in the desire to know truth in order to use it, doubts are rather to be met and mastered than to be shunned. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 The Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Adolescence Alienation. 
More than half of those who doubt or who experience storm and stress come a little later to feel themselves quite outside the conventional mold. Leaving out the women from 16 to 19 inclusive, since many of them may have become reactionary later, we find that 35% of all the women and 47% of all the men have passed through more or less definite period of alienation. Or we may say more than one-third of all the persons studied indicate such experiences. The duration of the period of alienation varies all the way from a brief space of time to several years, or, judging by the person's present attitude, it may become a permanent condition. The most frequent length of duration is five to six years. Alienation is distinguished from storm and stress and doubt, in part by the quality of the feeling which attend it. They are less intense and very different in character from those of the periods we have been studying. A few typical phrases will suggest the difference. The feelings during doubt and storm and stress are described in such phrases as these. I have had a very bitter feeling. It was a pitiable struggle. I went on groping in darkness. I suffered much in silence. I chafed against restraint. It was a prolonged fit of remorse. I prayed in anguish of spirit. I was filled with mental distress. I wrestled for the salvation of others. My spirit seemed to be crying out in despair and longing. I became morbid and thought I had committed the unpardonable sin. I was in spiritual agony. My health was shaken. These, on the contrary, represent the feeling during alienation. I was gloomy and cynical. People said I was getting cross. I never think of religious subjects if I can help it. I came to a state of desperate indifference. On thinking how the world consciousness might be even blinder and less organized than my own, I gave up the search for God and no longer cared even to die. Church got monotonous and meaningless, and I stopped going altogether. I professed to believe nothing. The whole thing seemed hollow mockery. I began to be disgusted with religion and gradually dropped religious considerations altogether. These two sets of phrases represent fairly the distinction between this latter adolescent period and the earlier one. They indicate that the new personality has a point of view of its own and is gaining for itself an independent standpoint. It has greater poise and is better able to judge the situation for itself. This is most clearly shown in those instances in which there is a clear rejection of convention. If the young life is not yet complete possession of itself, it still has a firm enough grounding stubbornly to resist upon itself, as is shown in the tendency to become gloomy and cynical, and to be cross when things do not go right. Alienation is most commonly the natural outgrowth of doubt. One reasons, analyzes, and criticizes. One thing after another is set aside, until finally the whole fabric seems to fall together. The result is a temporary philosophical reconstruction, which seems to stand outside of conventional religion. I began questioning everything. Popular belief seemed unreasonable. I studied science when 19. I rejected old beliefs and find it impossible, 20, to come back to them. Male, I was reared with Calvinistic surroundings. I left home at 18, talked with liberal people, listened to liberal clergymen. It resulted in my conversion from dogmatic tradition. I came to regard tradition as superstition. Male, when I began to reason and read books that taught common sense, I was disturbed. I ended it by becoming convinced that what I had been taught was false and wrong. This process, largely an intellectual one, is far the most common among males. Just as frequently, alienation is the natural outgrowth of storm and stress. The new attitude is worked out unconsciously and comes as a natural growth. One aspect of this development is shown in the following instance. A woman writes, I joined the church when 17. I went to communion once, but my feeling was only one of horror. It seemed heathenish. I never went to church after that or read the Bible, but prayed much. I believed in holiness, but was horrified at what I saw around me. I still believe, 24, that that branch of the church which I joined and its doctrines are death to the religious life. In addition to native reactionary tendencies which lie back of such an experience, there has been unconsciously a growth of the individual point of view which makes a personal grasp of truth seem to transcend traditional beliefs. In the following instance, likewise, one sees how the growth in the same direction precedes the consciousness of it. Male, from 18 to 24, I gave up all the traditional beliefs one by one. I left off Bible reading and attending church. Spiritual growth preceded the doubt. 
I always felt beneath me a strong foundation of truth. It was giving up a weaker for a stronger incentive to virtue. It cannot be too much emphasized that the occasion of the reactionary tendencies in many instances is traceable to ill health, just as we found in storm and stress. This is true especially of women. Female. All my life has been a struggle with doubt, disease, and nervousness, which affected my religious nature. I had nervous dyspepsia, was anxious, and thought only of myself. I had a period of asceticism and reaction with no outward cause. Female. With a highly sensitive organism, life had been a continual struggle with hereditary tendencies. At times I believe in no future and no God. Such feelings come when my vitality is weak. Within the last three years, with physical culture, I am growing stronger physically and mentally, and life has more meaning. Frequently the direct cause leading to one's aloofness is found in environmental conditions. The individual and his surroundings come into antagonism. There is a clash in the inability of the person to harmonize himself with his environment. His integrity is threatened and is preserved only by his pitting himself against his surroundings. Female, one day, while calling at his house, a minister suddenly asked me if I was a Christian. I had a terrible dread of being talked to about religion, and blurted out, No. I was so worried I could not sleep for a long time after that. I was more careless about doing right. I could listen coolly to prayer and see baptism without the least bit of feeling. I only felt far away from it all. Female, I suffered one bereavement after another, and finally, twenty-one, Bitterness filled my heart toward the avenging God whom I believed in. I tried sincerely to believe there wasn't a God, as this seemed less wicked than hating him. For several years I had no religion at all. Male, I heard the first indecent story I ever listened to told by an officer in the church. It was a great shock. It led me to doubt his sincerity and that of everyone, the worth of religion, the inspiration of the Bible, and the existence of God. I read books against the Bible, talked with ear religious men, studied other religions, read of crimes committed in the name of Christ. Alienation seems often to be due to the physiological necessity of gaining relaxation from the strain of storm and stress and doubt. It is one of the best established laws of the nervous system that it has periods of exhaustion if exercised continuously in one direction and can only recuperate by having a period of rest. This will become more clear in the discussion of the fluctuations which follow conversion. The point of interest in this connection is that the same ebb and flow of spiritual interest occurs whether conversion is, is experienced or not. Given only a temperament which works itself up to a lively pitch in the earlier adolescent stage. This is clearly shown in the following instances. Female, I had a desire to lead a Christian life. Time after time, until 16, I tried to experience what others said they did. I felt myself a hypocrite. After trying over and over, I fell into a state of absolute indifference. I could sit through the most serious revival and make fun. I thought professing Christians hypocrites. Female. After joining church, I found that my profession of religion hadn't altered my conduct, and I doubted that to which I stood pledged. The well-meant efforts of a friend, radically different from myself in temperament, made bad matters worse. I decided desperately that I didn't care. Male, I didn't believe in the doctrines of the church. I disbelieved in resurrection of physical bodies, a literal hell, an angry God, etc. I professed to believe nothing, though I did believe in God and His goodness. Closely connected with these are the cases in which the person holds aloof in order to see things in their true perspective. Male, for a year or two, 18 to 20, I stayed away from church entirely in order not to be influenced unduly by persons. This shades off into the true seeking spirit, which is willing to stand or fall by personal conviction. Male, I began studying Plato's philosophy. I rejected miracles. I accepted conditions and took the consequences. The most central principle underlying the whole alienation phenomenon is found, doubtless, in the necessity to preserve, in one way or another, the wholeness of the individual life when it is threatened with dissolution. In the presence of conflicting forces within and without, this one thing cannot be surrendered, namely the integrity of one's own personality. To surrender this would be to do violence to one of the most central and deep-seated instincts. 
In studying the cases together, it appears that people avail themselves of all the means possible for accomplishing this end. Those who are of an active and vigorous temperament, if they are to preserve their own identity in the midst of the conflict between the personal and social will, can only maintain their equilibrium by expending their energy in some positive way. The result is a vigorous defense of the personal point of view as against that of society. A passive temperament, on the other hand, may find its salvation by sinking into a state of indifference, by letting the old problems take care of themselves and give place to other interests. Halfway between these two extremes is a temperament which becomes irascible and gloomy and cynical. It stands outside the conventional forms and lets society go its own way. It either utters a wail at the friction it feels between itself and the social complex, or remains doggedly outside and growls at the current of life as it is passing. It frequently happens that one's wholeness is preserved and the pain of the friction is allayed by a playful attitude towards the beliefs and actions of other people. A friend of the writer who is a lecturer but who feels keenly beforehand the ordeal of facing an audience becomes not only jocular but positively foolish, as he himself admits in order to divert his attention from the task before him. It is noticeable that the richest humor is that which has beneath it an undertone of pathos. Perhaps, if rightly understood, the cause underlying an experience like the following would be found essentially to consist in a personality trying to make sure of itself. One of the respondents writes, When sixteen, I experienced a period of skepticism, when infidelity seemed fascinating and romantic to me, and there was a pleasure in shocking my friends by avowing such sentiments. It was due, I think, to the natural unrest of the girl developing into womanhood. Perhaps such attitudes should not be taken too seriously. This leads to the consideration of another cause underlying the reactionary tendencies. The occasion of them seems often to be the pleasure that comes from the sense of freedom. The doubter is inventive and constructive and delights in feeling that he is organizing his own world and is responsible to no one. Female, I didn't think it necessary, 24 to 29, for a healthy person in prime of life to believe in a personal God. Female, by the help of mystical writers, the gospel of divine humanity, and Emerson, I passed out of orthodox Christianity into the free atmosphere of thought. Male, I perceived that evolution conflicted with current orthodox beliefs and held it more strongly on that account. These attitudes seem likewise to rest back on one of the deeper instincts, the pleasure in free activity, and another closely allied to it, the delight in personal freedom and independence. In understanding the phenomena of alienation, it should be noted that they occur usually towards the latter end of the adolescent period. It is the time when the intellectual life is coming into prominence. The storms and difficulties of earlier adolescence are being settled, and settled from the standpoint of the intellect. As we have noticed, epilepsy and hysteria each indicate an unsettled condition of the motor centers in the brain at this period. These largely disappear and give place to adolescent insanity itself, which is a mental development. Religious doubt, storm and stress, conversions and spontaneous awakenings rarely occur during this latter period. During doubt and storm and stress, the person is wrestling helplessly with forces beyond his control, which tend to distract and tear his spirit. It is largely a struggle between the powers that be and the force of his own individual will. During the period of alienation, there is less feeling of any kind. There is a greater poise. The person has either dropped the struggle or decided it for the time in favor of his own will. The attitude is that of indifference or of cynicism and antagonism. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 The Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This Silvervox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Adolescence, the Birth of a Larger Self. If we stop to glance at the various directions in which the religion of youth tends to develop, adolescence will appear at best to be a very complex affair. We have seen that if we take a cross section of the composite life of a large number of people at any year during adolescence, it has great diversity of coloring. There seem to be forces interplaying, opposing and conspiring within any one year. If we attempt to follow these forces through successive years, there is distinct continuity, although at the same time great variety in the lines of development. We have found that almost simultaneously 
they are common different individuals and occasionally overlapping in the same individual the distinct breaks in character which we call conversion the sudden bursts of life which we have termed spontaneous awakenings fresh enthusiasms and heightened activity in religious work the emotional strain of storm and stress and mingled among these periods of carelessness and indifference these latter coincide likewise with the periods of most rapid physical development and come at about the same time as the great physiological transformation which centers in the awakening of the reproductive life if for example we take the average age of all these events it should be borne in mind that averages in these cases show only the most general tendencies and even blur the finer distinctions they differ only by a fraction of a year later by a little comes the doubt phenomena and still later towards the end of adolescence the tendency towards alienation from conventions we have found indications all the way along of essential kinships existing in the character of these phenomena aside from their chronological relationships the question for us now is to inquire if we can find a simple point of reference for all these phenomena which will bring them into system and order and relative simplicity what is the central thing in the whole adolescent development if there is one from which all these lines of growth diverge if we follow up the directions indicated by the facts in the preceding chapters they seem to lead us toward this fundamental point of view back of the whole adolescent development and central in it is the birth of a new and larger spiritual consciousness the little child begins life without a consciousness of his selfhood he looks out upon the world as purely external his hands and his feet he gazes at as objects and not part of himself it is two or three years before he uses the pronoun i and perhaps nearly as long before he is conscious of selfhood before this time it is true this fact is implicitly present in his consciousness as is shown in the instinct of self-preservation which shows itself almost from the beginning but it has not yet arisen into clearness during the years of childhood the self consists largely in the physiological mechanism and the complex physiological sensations which come through the senses somewhat of the outer life has already been taken up into the self but the world is largely looked upon still as external and objective the essential thing in children's religion we found was the tendency to look upon god and heaven as something above themselves and the body of religious doctrine as something external and expressed in ecclesiastical customs and doctrines but there comes a time in the normal process of development when the essence of all these things is worked over as itself belonging to the subjective life god is a spirit the kingdom of heaven is within you christ was constantly saying he that hath ears to hear let him hear these are the attempts to transform life from a purely external point of view and lead one to find the central truths of religion within oneself just as the hands and feet were discovered by the child to belong to itself the birth of a selfhood the awakening of life to a self-conscious appreciation of things is the central fact underlying the variety of adolescent phenomena for the sake of clearness let us represent this fact by a diagram as shown in figure 14. the self of childhood we shall call little i in a as a child's higher psychic life begins to have worth in the complex of impressions that are interpreted as making up its own personality it seems to be brought in contact with a larger world outside its former self represented by capital i either gradually or very suddenly as the case may be these new elements of which it has an inkling flock together and break in as a part of the real self instead of something outside of consciousness the condition now is shown in b where capital i is the real self and looks back at little i as something which it has outgrown it is the world of ideas that now comes in and takes possession of the self and the inner appreciation of the worth to consciousness constitutes spiritual insight expressed in physiological terms the adolescent development consists in the commencement of the functioning of the higher intellectual centers in the brain instead of a self of sense little i as it existed in childhood we now have a world of ideas and spiritual perceptions capital i with which the personality is identified the test during the present chapter if our point of view is the true one will constantly be as to whether or not it explains the facts if they fall in harmoniously and without straining as the natural expression of this central condition then we shall keep it as a true explanation it will be readily observed that this point of view is another way of expressing that which we found to underlie the phenomena of conversion a transformation of character consists in the sudden functioning of the higher brain areas 
so that I, capital I, becomes the real personality as distinguished from little I. The old life is blotted out or swallowed up in the new. In the spontaneous awakenings among the persons who have never experienced conversion but belong to the group we are now studying, we are able to detect exactly the same type of experience, although it is generally not so far-reaching and monumentous in its significance. For the picture of this, we need only refer to the accounts of spontaneous awakenings given in chapter 15. Some of the experiences are so pointed, however, in the direction of our present discussion that we should know a typical instance. One person, a minister who has never professed conversion, writes, With me, coming to myself came through suddenly, seeing my whole figure reflected in the mirror in a shop window. When I was about sixteen years old, the impression was tremendous. The thought came to me, I am I. I have a life of my own to live. For some time after, the sense of personal responsibility for life and conduct weighed so heavily on my boyish mind that I identified myself with the Church of Christ. The essential distinction between this instance and one of sudden conversion is that the new revelation, although it is extremely vital, is not sufficient to constitute a new self, but is interpreted as a deepening and intensification of the old personality. A common tendency observable in the records of the respondents, especially in those of younger persons who are still in the adolescent stage, a tendency which seems to show what is going on beneath the surface is the sense of estrangement. It is a very frequent experience for persons to feel themselves shut off from others, to think their individual revelations peculiar to themselves, to look upon customs and conventions as external to their own experiences, to feel that they have a newer and greater revelation than other people have. One young man writes, I have a striking and peculiar experience, and one you don't see often. But an outsider, on reading his record in connection with many others, is able to find in it nothing either striking or unusual. When 22 years of age, Kinsley wrote to his mother, I am not like common men. I am neither clever nor wiser nor better than the multitude, but utterly different from them in heart and mind. A girl writes, I am different from other people. I have never been a blind follower in thought or deed. A woman of middle age says in regard to her girlhood experience, when 18, I joined the church. In my earnestness, I found myself almost alone. In these instances, there is a consciousness of the fresh life within, and everything is judged in terms of it. It becomes the center to which all else is referred, hence the sense of aloofness and estrangement from other people. This often increases to the extent of leading the person to look with scorn on conventional religion and to regard it as inferior to his own male form seemed mere show and a fetter to individuality fifteen to twenty three male i have not turned against christianity twenty five but have outgrown it i am glad it exists for a certain class of people who can be reached by it male twenty six when i go to church i am repelled by the bigotry of what falsely calls itself the only religion male i wouldn't go to sunday school fourteen and nineteen because they wanted me to believe things i knew were not so Male, I did not like traditional theology. I thought there was something better. Female, I thought Christian slow, stiff, and conceited. Female, I am satisfied I feel more serene in church than most Christians. Female, I felt the form of joining church artificial, 13 to 15. I could not talk to mother because she could not understand me. Female, 17. Almost every minister has disgusted me. No one has talked to religion that satisfied, so I have my own. Many of the subjects show the reform and missionary spirit while in this condition and an earnest desire to bring the rest of the world up to their own point of view. In fact, the missionary spirit, which, as Dr. Lancaster found in his study of adolescence, is a common feature of youth, seems to gain its impetus in part from the inability to objectify the new insight and to harmonize it with the point of view of other people. The apparent bigotry on the part of one who is newly awakened is the result doubtless, of regarding other people as being at the same time of development as is represented by the old self that has been abandoned. The new life which bursts forth, the new energy which surges up towards the higher brain areas, is manifested in the heightened activity and increased enthusiasm which are so frequent in youth. Most of the adolescent phenomena center in the disparity which exists between little i and capital I in figure 14, that is, between the old self and its new possibilities. Youth is a time of the awakening of ideas, a time when there is an imitation of a larger life ahead, 
a fuller life is still on the outside. One person says, I scarcely dared to think I was living far below my ideals. Another, I made many good resolutions which would last only a few days. Still another, I had the strongest desire for a better life. I would try and then sink back into the same old attitude. I was not satisfied with myself and had the greatest regret that I was not better. These are typical of a very large number. To quote more would be repetition of a type we saw in the sense of incompleteness, which was the background of the storm and stress period. It is a common thing for the Bible or church or religious ceremonials or customs to stand for the embodiment of the ideal which the person wishes to reach. Male. I fell in with wayward companions, 13 to 15. I stopped Sunday school and avoided the society of good people. I was upbraided by conscious. Did often wish earnestly to be better. Male. I had a period of doubt. I tried to live a strictly moral life, but was harassed by numerous evil, invisible agencies. Male. I became painfully aware, 13, and sequence, of the hiatus between the natural life of a boy and the supposed ideal of a Christian. I spent hours each week on my knees. Female. I felt that others had something which I lacked. 15 to 17. I, only, of an orthodox race, had no honest desire for what the rest felt. Female. All through young girlhood, I felt my sister's affectionate nature to be in contrast with my selfishness and shallowness. We were inseparable companions, but she was isolated because she was on a higher plane. The direct result of this lack of harmony between the two cells is that the power of insight and appreciation grows in advance of the power of activity. One sees what to do but lacks the ability to execute it. Heightened activity during adolescence is rare as compared with the other phenomena. There is a breach between the motor areas in the brain and the ideational centers. One is thrown back helplessly, and the chasm between knowing and doing becomes greater instead of less. There are several sets of causes distinctly traceable in the records which tend to increase the discord between the present attainment and the ideals which open up before one. The numerous impulses that arise during youth, if expressed in some positive way, are not always expressed rightly. Like the individual variations which come in biological evolution, some are in the line of progress and persist, while others are abnormal and constitute evil. With certain natures, adolescence is a time of acting and acting wrongly, of running against a wall and suffering, of sinning and repenting, which results finally in remorse and lack of self-confidence. Female. Everything I did shortly before 16 seemed to be wrong. I would make fresh resolves not to do it again. Female. I alternately sinned through weakness and morbidity, brooded over my wicked nature. Male. When 16 I broke my standards of right. I felt remorse. I struggled with new ideas, did wrong, and was in despair. This is evidently one element in the differentiation of ideas. The person acts wrongly, and in consequence is thrown back upon himself and realizes the futility of his action. This gives chance for ideals to grow, but at the same time leaves one helpless to attain them. Another element which doubtless sets the ideal in advance of present attainment is physical incapacity to act. The person quoted above, who felt the hiatus between the natural life of a boy and the supposed ideal of a Christian, says further, I was growing fast and my physical vitality was low. Mother was alarmed at my perfectly hopeless condition. Male, I felt I was far behind my ideals. I fell into morbid hopelessness. Female, at 12 I became serious and it increased with years. When 16 and 17, I was very melancholy and pensive. I thought about the great responsibility of life. I had a desire to act, but was sure of my stupidity and inability. I suffered much in silence. We have seen above that spontaneity on the spiritual side seems to culminate just before and just after the greatest increments in physical growth. Another element is clearly the duplicity or multiplicity of demands made on the will. Each impulse to act is inhibited by some other or others. The person is left helpless before the greatness and indistinctness of the revelations which come to him. Male. I passed through a period of skepticism in which I questioned even the fundamental morals. The experience fostered my natural indecision before action. Male. From 15 to 20 I struggled with the ideal of being wholly consecrated to the will of God. Fear of being called to do missionary work stood in the way. Female. I thought I ought to undertake grandfather's salvation. 
For months I was in a pitiable state between fear of him and for him. I prayed for him, but never dared to speak to him. Female, to talk to others about their salvation, I considered the test of religion. I would write to my cousin and then be afraid to look him in the face. We have seen that another cause of the heightened insight is contact with broader minds, the study of science and philosophy and the like. Whatever be the line of approach, the disparity between insight and the power to act is a prominent characteristic of youth. The first factor in it all certainly is the increased complexity of life which comes through the germination of new powers and the capacity for new functions the immediate sequel to that has already been described the next factor to be emphasized here is the seeing but not doing feeling but not responding by some adequate activity having an impulse in a certain direction but seeing it deadened by a lack of vital energy or through the paralysis of the will under opposing motives Dr. Lucan finds a period in the 8th and ninth grades in our schools corresponding to the years of about 11 to 15, when there is no improvement in the ability to draw, but a heightened appreciation of art. Unlike the period of 7 to 8, when the child draws everything with little appreciation of its meaning, the youth has the beginning of the art instinct without the power to execute it. This is the same thing that we find in the religious sphere. Dim, indefinable, irresistible impulses press in on one. They are too large and hazy to find definite outlet. The person is comparatively hopeless in the breach between theory and practice, between insight and the ability to act, between appreciation and the power of execution. Now, keeping in mind the fact of a budding spiritual personality and the chasm between the ideal before it and its present imperfection, how does the fact explain the other phenomena of adolescence? In understanding the variety of experiences, we have to keep before us two facts which have worth in the differentiation of the types, namely temperamental conditions and environmental forces. Some persons are apparently so happily constituted and have such wholesome surroundings that the awakening of new life comes as quietly as the growth of a plant, and it is impossible to mark off periods in their growth, but such cases are the exception rather than the rule. Among those whose development is marked off by stages of common occurrence are those in which the life forces have not appealed to clear consciousness, those in which the power of self-analysis has fallen behind the unconscious processes of growth. In such cases, the realization of the new life comes suddenly as a great new revelation. There is only a slight inhibition between the energy latent in the lower brain areas and its discharge through the higher and the overflow into the latter is sufficient to bring a vivid report to consciousness. If the newly awakened brain areas are readily connected again with the motor areas, increased impulse in the direction of religious conduct and heightened activity is a result. Storm and stress appears to be the outcome of that condition in which there is not an easy coordination of the higher and lower brain areas. The higher areas, which are lying ready to function, and which do function sufficiently to arouse crude ideals, do not work themselves into harmonious relationships with the rest of the nervous system. Frequently it appears that the different ideation centers are beginning to function separately, and there is friction between them to determine which ideal shall be the organizing centers of consciousness. Life is not a unity. The strain and friction between its contending parts leaves one in the helpless and wretched condition with which we have become familiar. One of the purest types is that of Tolstoy. He says, I could do nothing but think, think of the horrible condition in which I found myself. Unanswerable questions never cease pressing to one dark spot, like lines converging to one point. The doubt phenomena are of the same sort, except that they are less organic, and in them the battle is fought out on the plane of reason as distinguished from that of the emotions. The ideals which present themselves to clear consciousness are weighed and balanced against old customs. It depends, perhaps, on both temperament and the strength of surroundings that pull in the one direction of the new life or bind him to the old, which way the decision shall finally fall. If it is in favor of the new life and the connection is not readily appreciated between this and the old, we have alienation, a phenomenon whose significance now appears clear. As the new life rises to present itself, it rarely finds its own spiritual perspective coincident with the conventional and traditional one. Then follow friction, clash, storm, and stress, and doubt. 
the individual feels his own worth and clings to it as a choice becomes necessary between the personal and social points of view a little less than half allow the scales to tip toward custom and begin the process of adjustment as we shall see a little more than half rebel and hold their own individual point of view how long one remains in this attitude is probably a matter of temperament a few remain there and never recover others are partially constructive but the greater number find in the relaxation and pain of doubt an occasion for getting their bearings and make it the antecedent of a definite reconstruction the extreme difficulty of bridging the chasm and the length of time that the youth is left struggling toward a higher plane of life seem to belong to the difficulty of learning new things in the experiments of dr byron on learning the telegraphic language he found that each of the subjects learned to receive messages rapidly during the first few weeks of practice just before the proficiency required for receiving mainline messages was reached there was without exception a plateau in the curve of improvement extending through several weeks a long period when the student can feel no improvement and when objective tests show little or none then follows a sudden raise in the curve suddenly within a few days the change comes and the senseless clatter becomes intangible speech this brings fresh and well-established evidence to what we were trying to picture in conversion it helps to bring many of the facts in that study and those in this into harmony the child is born into a social organism which with or without his choice has set certain religious standards that he must attain if he is to take place as an organic part of it his adolescent awakening is really a birth into appreciation of the demands which the social whole makes on him the storm and stress and doubt periods and the period of conviction preceding conversion appear to be each in a time of inefficient effort to apperceive and realize that which is the common experience of mature minds after some weeks or months in the conversion cases and some months or years in the gradual growth cases of striving building and developing the new life comes in an immediate possession in a real experience some points as to the significance of the adolescent disturbances seems clear from the foregoing considerations in the first place the apparent futility of the striving during youth should not be understood to have no value in the final attainment of a satisfactory experience just as it would be impossible for a telegrapher to cross the line representing the degree of proficiency required for mainline work without trying for it day after day so it is improbable that one will ever break through the limits that enclose the body or world wisdom and enjoy from the inside that which has come as the result of racial experience without struggling and even agonizing to enter into it a vital consideration is whether young people should be allowed to undergo the stress and turmoil that so frequently occur or whether they should be steered clear of the real or supposed difficulties when we grasp the full significance of adolescence we shall see that all the instability and anxiety and uncertainty and even the extreme pain is one of nature's ways of producing a full-fledged self-poised human being with a high degree of self-reliance and spiritual insight because the currents of life are not running evenly and smoothly we cannot safely infer that there is not growth in fact when we take into account the great frequency of doubt and storm and stress among supposedly normal human beings when we observe that many of the persons who have risen to eminence and that many of those who have become the leading exponents of religious truth have undergone great spiritual conflicts in youth when we keep in mind that the fact that this is the time for the awakening of that clear consciousness which is the distinguishing characteristic between the most highly developed human being and the animal it seems highly probable that the extreme experiences of adolescence with all their unevenness and turmoil are the result racially of the survival of the fittest in which the fittest is he who wrestles in youth with the inextricable mesh of impulses which spring up and often pauses in despair while the deeper forces of his nature are working themselves into clearness and harmony if this is true we should rather welcome such experiences in young people than free them from all their spiritual difficulties in fact one of the extreme unkindnesses grows out of the indiscretion of people who try to solve for them the problems which arise in the minds of young people one's whole life must be worked into a harmony and this can be done by allowing the natural and wholesome impulses which are stirring in one's life to produce a unity after their own kind the insight which comes to a human being must be his own revelation dr lancaster found that ninety percent of the large number of young people whom he studied loved solitude 
This fondness of seclusion is probably one of the wholesome instincts that nature has implanted in human nature. Muhammad went to his cave to solve the divine mystery. Christ went to the wilderness. If we are generous in our interpretation of natural tendencies, we shall doubtless believe that the alienation phenomena in which people so frequently condemn and hold themselves aloof from the customs and social institutions which are the embodiment of racial wisdom are in accordance with nature's way of enabling a human being to stand out free from the rest and work out clearly his or her own point of view that which is worked out independently as an individual insight is often brought back to society as a newly discovered treasure thus is life enriched it is a process of differentiation which ultimately increases the complexity and fineness of the social fabric it cannot be too much emphasized on the other hand that youth is at the point of development at which it is beset on every side by liabilities of abnormal and pathological extremes. It is the point at which not only genius begin to develop, but also criminals, not only persons of greatest spiritual insight, but likewise those of the extremest sensuality. It is at this period that religious difficulties most frequently develop into insanity. It is the point at which possibilities open up in every direction. If too much let alone, the crystallization which shall set the pattern for the whole afterlife, or maybe some excess or fatality quite abnormal. The little tottering child learns best by experience, but may be destroyed in the process of learning. It is of the gravest importance to look toward the means of steering clear of the developmental tendencies when they are liable to become too extreme. The cure for helplessness that comes with storm and stress is often found in inducing wholesome activities faith without works is dead let us call to mind the fact that storm and stress and doubt are experienced some time during youth by something like seventy per cent of all the persons studied on the other hand heightened activity which is characterized not only by an interest in religious matters but by engaged in actual religious work was experienced by only about twenty two per cent of all the persons this is doubtless very much out of proportion Many persons have found the solution of their difficulties by actually setting about doing things. Female, I had doubts as to the value of prayer. I desired a certain thing very much, and prayed for it, simply ignoring my doubts. It wasn't answered, but I have not been troubled since with doubts. Male, passed through a period of doubt. My cure was activity in doing what good I could. Male, I have doubted everything but mother's love and the existence of my poor self. My doubts have somehow been resolved in the stress of trying to live uprightly. I could not carry doubts far while trying to be a good son, student, husband, father, and citizen. The proper balance during youth will doubtless be found in evening up the percentages quoted above by bridging over to a certain degree the chasm between insight and the power of execution, by carrying bits of spiritual wisdom over into action. An idea is strengthened if it can find expression. The multitude of ideas which try to break into consciousness will be best judged as to their fitness to persist by embodying them in deeds, and testing them as to whether they will fit into life as mainsprings of conduct. The test of the worth of an idea is the fact of whether or not it is fit to live by. When put into execution, ideas are brought out into clearness, and the extreme confusion that is behind storm and stress is relieved. In the complex of sensations which underlie the development of self-consciousness from childhood up, there are doubtless none which have so great worth as the muscular sensations, not even excluding visual imagery, in terms of which so much of our knowledge is symbolized. Now, although development of the new spiritual selfhood is largely in the sphere of ideas, we shall never reach the point when these will not have to be embodied in sensuous symbols and the ideas at the highest point of development will be more in terms of muscular activity than in any other sense. We appreciate what we have done or able to do. The one who enjoys the game most is the person who is actually engaged in the sport, and who plays the game over again as a spectator. A vocalist listening to a concert by another vocalist finds the muscles of the larynx fatigued after leaving the concert hall, and in consequence of the muscular response, has really lived into the concert more vitally than anyone who has not experienced such a motor effort. It is deeds that make life real. It is actions that help most of all to unravel the inextricable skein of impulses. It is actually setting about doing things which drives the blood through the nervous system and helps it to carry out its normal activities. If any man shall do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. 
But now we are liable to go too far in this interpretation. We must preserve the balance. One cannot lay it down as a general rule that the wise treatment of the youth is to induce activity. Our records show that often one of the surest means to precipitate the difficulty is to act when there is not sufficient wisdom and insight behind it to ensure that the action be wisely directed. One person who had been harassed with fears for some time says further, I joined the church when 15 and felt better. I confess myself a Christian, but I began to awaken to the fact that I was not a Christian. For three or four years I sought salvation. I felt helpless and convicted of sin. While talking with the pastor one day, the whole matter cleared up. It was a simple acceptance of Christ. Two or three more instances will emphasize the point. Male, I lost sympathy with the doctrines of the church. Afterwards, I tried to come back to it, but failed. My only satisfaction was a real reconciliation to the doctrines of Christ. Female, I joined church when twelve. I was not so anxious as before, but had the feeling that I did not believe what I said I did. Female, I saw that my friends were living far better and happier lives than I, and I felt I was living below my ideals. When seventeen, I joined church. Almost immediately a reaction set in, and I regretted the step I had taken. I felt it had not altered my conduct, and doubted that to which I stood pledged. One of the most ungainly sights, and one of the most hopeless, in view of religious development, is that of one who hastens about in a fever of excitement, supposing to be for the glory of God, or for the good of the world. The determination of the proper courses as regards action or inaction during adolescence seems to be an individual matter, and depends on conditions too complex to be stated as a simple principle. This much seems clear, however, that there should be the proper mixture of conduct and insight, that the activity should be constantly backed up by a higher degree of wisdom. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21 of The Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. Adolescence. Substitutes for Religious Feeling. During early youth, the whole nature is in a state of change and transformation. The readjustment seems to be even greater on the spiritual side than on the physical. During this time, there is comparatively little display of feelings which could be termed distinctly religious. There is more of ferment than contentment and evenness of feeling, more of doubt than faith. The person is filled with unrest and uncertainty and self-analysis or, on the other hand, with willful activity and the disposition to take the control of the universe into his or her hands. We set out next to inquire what has taken place among the life forces at this time. Is there relatively a blank, or are there other lines of interest and activity which persist during doubt and storm and stress? We are learning to expect that if one's energy is not expending itself in one direction, it is probably active in another. In physical development, the different organs do not grow harmoniously, but have their particular nascent periods of development. The energy which makes for growth is focused now in one and now in another. Between the growth on the physical side and on the spiritual, we have repeatedly noticed in this study evidences of a compensation that is going on. Periods of slow spiritual advance are frequently coincident with those of very rapid development of some other kind. It is noticeable among professional athletes that excessive training in the muscular system is apt to be accompanied by lack of proficiency in mental acumen. In regard to the use of the psychic functions, specialization in one given direction limits one and others. A man is not liable to be at the same time a poet and a scientist, and to succeed in both. Mr. Curtis, in a study of supply and expenditure of nervous energy, has made it appear highly plausible that the moment of nervous energy available for use at any given time is fairly constant in the same individual. If it is used up in one way, there is none left for other activities. The opposite of this principle is equally true, that if one finds a deficiency at any given period, unless there is a lesion or some definite abnormality in growth, one may expect to find an increase of activity in some other part of the system. This is as true in regard to spiritual development as in the distinctly physiological characteristics. One cannot serve God and mammon. Neither can one be at the same time a skilled theologian and an exhorter. 
If the forces in one nature which make for richness are specialized in any one way, they determine the peculiarity and aptitude of the person. If one stock of energy which is normally expended in the cultivation of spiritual things is drafted off for some other purpose, the result is directly noticeable. This compensating tendency is well illustrated in the following instance. One of the respondents writes, The evenness of growth has been disturbed twice. During two periods of pregnancy when my health was very poor, being deprived of church work and unable to do any Christian work, it was hard to keep from getting despondent. During these periods I felt I never would get back in the same relations that I had had. I think it was simply my health and inactivity, as I feel as much interest now as before these periods. We are able to see clearly that there are elements which continue and are indeed often heightened during storm and stress and doubt. The lines of interest which come to the front, or which persist when everything else seems to be torn away, are the moral, intellectual, and aesthetical instincts. A. The ethical instinct usually persists or is heightened during adolescence. Often it is the only thing which remains firm in the midst of chaos. One woman writes, I had a lack of religious feeling at that time, but prided myself on humility. I determined to devote my life to God's service. I went into Christian work, but it seemed more practical than spiritual. The practicality of the motive behind the activity and its lack of spirituality are a good index of the ethical impulse that gave it sanction. That the instinct is a moral one which impels to action is strongly evidenced in the fact that a morbid conscience was the central thing in storm and stress. There is often a worrying over trifles, a tendency to magnify little omissions or little slips in conduct into the proportion of great sins. Religious feelings have vanished, but conscience is left in full possession of the field, and it exercises its power with unchecked sway. One woman says, Between the years of ten and nineteen, if I overstepped in one thing, I felt awfully wicked. One night I had a dream of Christ beckoning me to follow him. I took it to mean I was not doing as I should, and was even stricter after that. Some other typical instances are the following. Male, while changing my beliefs, Religion was a matter of conduct. I went through a rational stage at 17 or 18, when the sense of duty only was left. Male, I passed out from my old views, and gradually I dropped religious considerations altogether between 22 and 26. I led an active life. My religious nature was entirely dormant, but there was an increase of moral and intellectual soundness. Male, between the years of 17 and 20, I came to regard myself as agnostic. I prided myself on being more moral than those about me who professed religion. Male, I was in spiritual agony. My spirit was smitten with such a darkness that only one of all the early faiths remained. It must be right to do right. There are a few instances in which the moral nature is shattered and falls with the rest. Female, from 14 to 19, I could not bear to be talked to about religion. Heaven seemed further off than ever. I was more careless about doing right. Male, began to doubt theological beliefs, went to college, overthrew ideals of childhood, 18 to 19. Had a period of moral license. Male, had a period of skepticism, questioned everything. It lowered my ideals unconsciously, or doubled them with lower ones, while the higher ones persisted. The cases are relatively rare in which the moral instinct declines. B, the intellectual interest is often the all-absorbing one. This fact has already been anticipated in the consideration of the prominence of doubt. Not only is the rational power a vigorous tool for the criticism of religious ideals, but frequently its use becomes an end in itself, and the interest in it seems to approach a kind of aesthetic of logic. Female, when fifteen, intellectual questioning arose. I became intensely imbued with Swedenborgianism. It was the cold philosophy of his teaching that satisfied my mental needs. Female, during the year 19, I read books inclined to increase doubt, would go out under the stars to think and reason, contrasted ministers of the gospel with scientists, and thought the latter more likely to find truth. At present, 23, have no settled religious belief. I accept no belief I cannot understand. Female, I said, as to something above me, I will never believe one inch beyond what my coldest thinking tells me is most probable. Male, for a year or more, after fourteen, the whole matter of religion seemed eclipsed 
by the desire for intellectual growth. Male, have never been able to supplement my most general conclusions by the mysterious strength of simple faith. Have a keen desire, 31, to have a satisfactory, rational basis for would-be beliefs. Male, 15 to 19, cared more about my doubts than the solution of them. The fascination that centers around the use of intellectual powers furnishes a good indication of the line of development which is going on during youth. Its incentive is the pleasure that comes from the exercise of a newly acquired function. Dr. Burnham observes in his study of adolescence that many philosophers have begun their systems during adolescent doubt. See, the aesthetic interest sometimes either continues or is heightened during doubt and storm and stress. Female, from 24 to 29, do not believe in religion at all. I wept over the pathetic in literature, had strong emotions on hearing the Messiah or Easter music at some great church. Female, I had no religious training. Later I lost the calm and peace of childhood. Fifteen to twenty-two had despair at the idea of going out into nothingness. I do not believe in God, immortality, or prayer. During this time I had a vague imagination of something beautiful and beneficent in nature. My enjoyment was largely sensuous. Flowers, perfumes, music, deep, soft colors, awakened more emotion than any thought of the holiness of God. Female, all that religion means to me, 17, is kindness and goodness. In music, soulful pieces move me strongly. Chopin's funeral march seems to grow into me. In nature are glorious sunsets, the ocean in its vastness, and all scenery on a grand scale. Make me believe that there must be some divine power. Male, I came to stand quite outside religion generally, 15 to 22. Natural phenomena were everything to me, health, inspiration, and consolation. Male, during my doubt period, before and after twenty, the love of nature constituted all my happiness. The vast and sublime affected me almost to madness. A rough quantitative estimate of these factors is given in Table 23. The number of cases in which dormer stout and stress was present is the basis of the percentages. The numbers show the percentage of those in which the supplementary elements in question was clearly present. The absolute value of the numbers is heightened here because most of such statements as are quoted above do not come from a direct question, but were given voluntarily in the general record of experiences. The ethical factor stands out in the greatest prominence, persisting during doubt and storm and stress in at least 33% of the women and 43% of the men. The intellectual element is less frequently mentioned, but arises into distinct importance. It is remarkable that considerably more than half the respondents mention some one of the three elements as constituting part of the bone and sinew of life during adolescent struggle. The question arises, what is the significance of the act that these three lines of development come out so pronouncedly during adolescence, when the distinctly religious feelings are relatively absent? It means either that these are the most fundamental factors in the religious life, so central and vital that when all the rest disappears they remain as the skeleton and framework of the religious life, or, on the other hand, that they are factors somewhat distinct from those which make up religion, and have now begun to rise into prominence, while the religious instincts are held for the time in abeyance. In an earlier interpretation of these facts, the first alternative was chosen, and in view of the fact that the moral impulses rose into greater prominence than any other element, it was said that the ethical instinct seems to be the great taproot from which the religious nature is nourished. It is to be noticed that in childhood, religion, the moral impulse shows itself very early. Also in the beginning of adolescence, the first thing to appear when the individual life dawns are those which center about conscious. And now we have seen that the last thing to go when one is torn by doubt and perplexity is the moral nature. This seems to furnish strong reason for the former interpretation, but one is met by these considerations. The moral nature is often shattered during adolescence. During adolescent insanity, as Cloughton points out, the moral instincts are the first to disappear. Pleasure in the exercise of the intellectual nature comes to the front, and reason can hardly be regarded as one of the central roots of religion. It seems a fair interpretation to say that these three lines of development, in the direction of morals and reason and aesthetics, are relatively late products in racial growth, and in adolescence have just begun vitally to function. The moral nature, as we saw in the chapter on childhood religion, 
is already present in early years, but it exists in germ rather than as a vital element in consciousness. In childhood, we are coming to see all the possibilities of later development exist and show themselves already in little ways. Reason, for example, has its nascent period during youth, but it rises to assert itself in the questioning age of early childhood. The mind at three or four years of age is bristling with scrappy bits of reason. Nevertheless, they have not the same value to consciousness as the reason which shows itself later. The elements of morals and reason both assert their presence in these early years. But in adolescence, the youth knows them in a living way as part of himself. He grasps their meaning with the absolute certainty of possession. They blossom out in his consciousness as a part of himself. He feels that it is I who have a conscious and I who reason. These are elements which are closely bound up with religion and will later be taken up into it as some of its most immediate constituents. The prominence of the ethical instinct leads us to believe that from this time, when it has its real birth, it will be one of the central factors in fully developed religion. An experienced teacher of young people reports that if she asks her pupils to select those they like best among a number of poems, some representing beauty of form, in imagery others tending to awaken some vast conception and still others which have a strong moral undertone they almost invariably choose the last they are attracted first by the moral aspect of poetry these three lines of development then are those towards which the racial growth has tended they are the latest fruits of evolution the culmination of the lines of racial development we are in a position now to see why the moral nature falls first in mental disease, why it vanishes like a mist when mania sets in. It is probably because the moral instinct is so highly organized and so finely poised. It is for the same reason that the intellectual life, which is one of the highest products of developing consciousness, is most susceptible to insanity in this very period when it should come forward and develop into the highest perfection. During their period of greatest instability, both elements are most susceptible to hopeless disintegration. In view of this fact, we see why during adolescence the moral nature should sometimes be weakened during storm and stress and doubt, although it is usually brought out into greater clearness. It appears to be in some instances the result of failure to attain the possibilities before one when this developmental crisis is reached. There are many instances likewise on the intellectual side in which very great precocity in childhood is followed by failure to realize the possibilities of development of rational nature in adolescence. The weakness of the moral nature may be the result of the excessive development and be closely allied to the usual forms of adolescent mania. During these crises in adolescence, life is in a certain sense laid bare so that one can look into it and see the elements which compose it and their interplay upon each other. In these three factors we have been considering, one sees avenues along which it is possible to approach the lives of young people when religious faith is low. They represent demands which must be met in the educational treatment of the youth, and which it should be appealed to in order to help him safely through a most critical and crucial period. End of chapter 21. Chapter 22 of The Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22, Adult Life, The Period of Reconstruction. A turning point in development almost as distinct in character as that at the beginning of adolescence is one a few years later, which marks its close. It consists in a reorganization, readjustment, and reconstruction of religious experience. Adolescence is a period of turmoil, a spiritual unrest, of instability, and often of negation. The close of adolescence is characterized as the beginning of religion as seen from within. The person has worked out a standpoint of his own. He interprets life for himself. He has gained a positive faith, although it does not of necessity agree with the conventional types. This reconstruction consists either in working out one's beliefs and faith independently of that of other people, accepting one's own point of view and beginning to live it, and to be happy in it, or in coming back to the old forms and dogmas of childhood and putting new life into them. It is more frequently a mixture of both of these tendencies. Rarely does a person remain unmindful after the period of reconstruction of the usual theological tenets 
and ecclesiastical customs. And, on the other hand, we have no instances of those who drop back into the childhood method through sheer exhaustion from the struggles of youth. None, in fact, of whom it would be fair to say that they have simply put the new wine into old bottles. The person has acquired a spiritual grasp, a new insight, and that becomes the basis for apperceiving the essential elements in old doctrines, generally with keen discrimination between their essential and non-essential aspects. The nature of the process will be best understood by quoting a few typical instances. The following represent those who construct a faith largely outside and independent of the commonly accepted forms. Female, I cannot come back to my old beliefs, but I believe that I worship 20 as truly as God desires. Female, I am influenced in my own conduct by far higher considerations and nobler ideals of duty, 26, than I ever was while I held evangelical beliefs. Male, the struggle is over, 21, but my beliefs do not now agree with all the popular ones. Below are various instances of the way in which one comes to see the truth involved in former beliefs held when religion was looked upon as something external, but which have been worked over as a part of one's inner life. Male, 30, the dark period was nearly past for me. My beliefs are largely what they formerly were, and the reconstruction was perhaps not entirely independent of the influence of the old beliefs, but it does not rest on them as a foundation. Male, I have had a slow process of reconstruction and extreme simplification of belief. My few religious tenets seem perfectly in harmony with natural law and rational ideas. I have not accepted again anything once completely discarded. I have simple beliefs, yet strong on a few fundamental points. Male, 30. I find what has proved itself more and more true all the time, that the positive beliefs that I have gradually worked out in the school of experience and freedom of thought are one in essence with the religious beliefs of my childhood that had been taught in the first place in terms so simple that they seem to have nothing profound about them at all. Male, 30. I have come back to a firm belief in God as revealed by the Holy Spirit, in Jesus Christ, but I cannot return to the traditional beliefs concerning inspiration, atonement, the person of Christ, election, etc. Female, 30. The terms God, freedom, love, immortality have more meaning to me now than ever before. Not so theoretical as a few years ago, but near and more real. From 24 to 29, she was without a religion. Female 54. I have often thought that if I could come to the Bible as to other books, it would be more helpful. The last year or two, it has been so. The illumination which evolution has thrown on some passages will evidently make it a new book for me. Female. From 17 to 24, I was constantly awakening to larger meanings of truths, heretofore supposed narrow and personal. Male, 30. I have returned to something like the faith of youth, but it is much more spiritualized and liberal in its views. Male, gradually, 16 to 20, I lost all my religion but the sense of duty. Then gradually I felt that I hadn't lost much. It all came back to me transfigured. Since the readjustment, religious feelings have tended to become stronger, and I have put new meanings into old forms. The age at which the reconstruction occurs is generally between 20 and 30. Of those before and after those ages, there are, of females, one each at 18, 33, and 37, and of males, one each at 50 and 55. The age was not always given, but it was evident that the reconstruction generally fell somewhere between the years specified. The years of greatest frequency for both men and women were 24 and 25. The average age, omitting scattered ones, which come very late, is 24 for women and 24.5 years for men. There is great unanimity in all of the cases quoted above, and these are fairly representative of the entire class. To what extent, let us inquire, is this a characteristic experience? Omitting girls between 16 and 20, who are not to be supposed to have yet completed the reconstruction, or even to have had a fair chance at doubt and storm and stress, we find 42% of the females and 39% of the males who have had experiences similar to those quoted. Allowing for imperfect records and for difficulty of self-analysis, it is evident that they are very common. But we should look at the matter from another standpoint. It is evident that in arriving at a fair estimate of the tendency toward reconstruction, one should include only such 
as have at some time in their growth found themselves partially outside of religion that is we should exclude those whose growth has been so gradual as to not be marked off by definite stages looking through the records we find that 41 percent of the women and 38 percent of the men belong to this latter class if we exclude from these the 16 percent of the women who are between the ages of 16 and 20 we have for both sexes about one-third whose development has been gradual that is if these are typical subjects we may say that about two-thirds of both sexes tend at some time in their growth either to rebel against conventional religion or to find it alien to their personal interests of this number there are only thirteen percent of women and four percent of men who are still in a negative attitude besides this there are eleven percent of the women and eighteen percent of the men who profess not to be satisfied with their present point of view but who are trying to work on to a more satisfactory experience and who show withal a definite tendency to make their beliefs harmonize with their earlier ones or with those of other people those whose reconstruction is not complete show in some respect in a more definite way than the others a natural trend of growth in them one sees life in the process of formation they are like the nebulous systems which show how worlds are made we may safely lay it down as a law of growth that it is almost a universal tendency for the perplexity uncertainty and negation of adolescence to be followed by a period of reconstruction in which religious truth is apperceived and takes shape as an immediate individual possession there is further evidence that there is a critical period at the end of adolescence usually in the twenties found in the records of those whose growth has been even during adolescence many of these had a definite awakening or a period of more rapid and intense development at this time sufficient to mark it off as a turning point the following quotations will illustrate female 120 i heard impersonate david garrick i experienced a swelling and overflowing of life and joy so keen it was part pain the high plane of insight has never been lost female 123 i had a struggle with selfishness and came out victorious male 121 i became more serious growth from that time was less influenced by environment male at that time 25 came new insight into the meaning of life putting experiences of this kind with those of reconstruction of faith already noticed it swells the percent to 53 percent for each sex of those who have a pretty distinct turning point somewhere in the 20s the average age given above is changed by only a little with the addition of these instances in order to see if this was a separate period or only a continuation of the spontaneous awakenings the numbers of both occurring at the different years were plotted together they leave almost a blank at nineteen and twenty and rise again to the greatest frequency at twenty five the break between the phenomena which mark the beginning of adolescence and those which seem to determine its close seem to set the latter off as belonging to a different period the experiences are also of a quite different character as seen in the quotations already given the period of reconstruction which marks the end of adolescence is a time when the ragged ends of experience are pulled together into a unity when that which has been objective has now become a subjective possession when that which has been seen from the outside is now lived from within the fact that this is the natural drift of religious growth is brought out in a new way in table twenty four in which the age groups are kept separate it is the result of an attempt to classify all the cases in order to bring out whether the old persons are more liable to have passed through a period of reconstruction than the younger ones the cases fall into four groups first those which had got more or less completely outside of religious interests through doubt and reaction and had finally reconstructed a belief in faith satisfactory to themselves secondly those who had gained some solid footing and were still making stringent efforts to believe thirdly those who were still negative and reactionary lastly those who had never felt themselves removed from and antagonistic to religious interests even during doubt and storm and stress the separation into these groups was of course somewhat arbitrary that it was not wholly so was shown in the fact that as in other points of difficult judgment my wife and i made them independently and found very doubtful cases these last are placed in the unclassified list in the table the value of the table is largely 
in showing the distribution of the different groups among the various years. It is made out entirely in percentages of the whole number of cases. As we saw in Table 23, the number of cases which fall in the various year divisions is about the same with the exception of women between 16 and 19, inclusive. So the percentages as given represent fairly, with the exception of the first column, the relative values for the different vertical columns, in example, for the different year groups. Looking now at the year groups, we see from class 1 that the numbers increase with years of those who have had a period of definite reconstruction. In contrast with that, the number of those who are still reactionary or are still in the process of reconstruction decrease with age. That is, it appears that very few who have stood outside of religious interest at any time in their growth have not readjusted their faith by, say, the age of 30. That class 4, those whose growth is distinctly gradual, should be greater in earlier years, can hardly mean other than that they would have been good subjects for doubt and reaction later. The naive and simple way in which most of the girls from 16 to 20 gave their experiences and described them in the phraseology of the prayer book or catechism is added evidence. If the table is accurate and the facts on which it is based are typical, we may say that the common trend of religious growth is from childhood faith, through doubt, reaction and estrangement into a positive hold on religion, through an individual reconstruction of belief and faith. It was a surprise to find the period of reconstruction so clearly marked, and it raises a question somewhat difficult of interpretation. The meaning of it from the psychological standpoint seems clear enough, but to grasp the biological significance of it, to find the reason why the period should be so clearly marked and come out at about the time it does, is not so easy. Maybe why to the mark, but it seems possible that this turning point may be a culmination from racial experience and represent the time when the individual must leave his tutelage and take his place as a positive unity in society, as husband, father, or citizen. Just as childhood is the time when one should drink in the best of that which human beings have worked out and stored up in habits and customs, and as in youth these must be taken up and criticized and questioned preparatory to apperceiving them, so maturity is the period when one must carry back into life and utilize that which has been learned. There are some bits of evidence in the records that seem to show that such an interpretation is the fair one. One woman writes, From 18 to 24 my religious experience fluctuated because of pleasure-seeking and worldliness, which troubled my conscience. But after this I became more settled by entering on the duties incumbent on a wife and mother, and my religious life was deepened as my responsibility increased. Psychologically, this period marks off the end of the adolescent ferment, the unsettled and stilted quality of both body and mind is outgrown, and new insight is worked over into habit and becomes ingrained as a part of the new personality. The bigotry and willfulness of the adolescence becomes toned down. The unrest and hopeless striving become realized. If the experiments in learning telegraphy, referred to above, hint at a fundamental law of growth involved in religious experience, this culmination of adolescence is the time when the curve of proficiency suddenly rises and crosses the line which represent the standard of the religious life of the social whole. A most instructive insight into the relationship between adolescence and maturity is reflected in the means by which the transition is made from the one to the other. A most instructive insight into the relationship between adolescence and maturity is reflected in the means by which the transition is made from the one to the other. We shall take up in turn some of the ways of approach to the positive religious life. At no point of development is the transition more clearly marked. A very common way of escape from storm and stress and doubt is through some sort of activity. One woman writes, I had severe struggles through selfishness and jealousy. Family troubles came upon me in full force, so that I could bear my sorrow only through serving Christ and working for Him. I taught a class in Sunday school and sang in the choir. I set up ideals and made great effort to live up to them. My real change in character began at this time. It is through setting about to do things that the pent-up forces in one's nature are relieved. The difficulty during adolescence is that the tendency toward one sort of motor discharge is inhibited by some other equally strong tendency which offsets it. 
As one grows towards maturity and the impulses to activity increase in number, the soul whose highest joy is in self-expression becomes self-imprisoned. The life is an aching center of possibilities. One comes to feel that the only means of escape is to do something whether or not the specific thing to be done is at all recognized. The way out is that picturesquely described in Carlyle's chapter on the everlasting yea. Produce, produce, wear it but the pitifulest infinitesimal fraction of a product. Produce it in God's name. Tis the utmost thou hast in thee. Out with it then. Up, up, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with the whole might. Work while it is called today, for the night cometh wherein no man can work. It more frequently happens that the activity is of a special than of a general sort, and comes from following up some one line of insight which separates itself out from the mesh of possibilities. We saw in the last chapter that there are three elements which persist during adolescence in the absence of the distinctly religious feelings, namely the ethical interest, the intellectual, and aesthetic. It is interesting to note that each of these is a great highway along which persons pass out from adolescence into mature life. The way out of adolescence is perhaps most frequently found by following up some thread of intellectual insight. Female, I knew that an acorn would not come up, a beanstalk, and thought that to plant in that belief is as much religion as anything. I came to believe that somehow good will be the final goal of ill. One cannot live without deep religious feelings. They are a legitimate part of one's nature. Female, I got hold of the conceptional law and settled the problem of the world in favor of determinism. This brought repose and rest. I gradually ceased to pray for anything external, but only for spiritual perfection. My whole afterlife has been a development from this point of view. Male. Reaction practically ceased by becoming convinced that, allowing the Bible equal credit with other sacred writings, it was, as a whole, true that the religion of Christ was the most potent factor in lifting humanity to a higher plane that the church was the only organized means of advancing religion, and by seeing fruits of religion in the lives of others. Male, I learned to distinguish between the lives of so-called Christians and that of Christ, between imperfections due to Christianity and those due to human weakness. I went up one day to a favorite grove by the river, summed up all my doubts and fears, and Christ was mine again. Others found some organizing principle in science or philosophy. The typical solution seems to be to sift a large truth which is part air and to discriminate out the vital element in it. Male, by 18 I was a skeptic, by 20 an unbeliever. When 21 I came under the instruction of a man who taught me the difference between essentials and non-essentials. He taught me that if I had the mind of Christ within me and had the spiritual truth of the Bible, it made no difference about Jonah and the whale. He first really led me to Christ. Another way which is just as clearly marked is that of following up the thread of duty. Female, one day while musing despairingly, something stirred within me, and I asked myself, Can I not rise once more, conquer my faults, and live up to my own idea of right and good, even though there be no life after death? I may yet deserve my own respect here and now. If there be a God, he must approve me. I was led back straight to religion through the moral instincts. Female, Severe Conflict, 16 to 30. When 30, I heard some of the sermons on religion as character building. They led me to be the Christian I am now. Male, my morals and theology both went at the same time. I came later to see the distinction between them and to have as my only code utilitarian ethics. Male, I have outgrown the church. I believe in a high standard of morals. Honesty, morality, and integrity are my only watchwords, and they are my prayers. This is one of the most clearly marked, even if it is not one of the most frequent ways of approach to maturity. It is so clearly described by Mr. Brooke in his Life of Robertson that his words deserve quoting in this connection. It is an awful moment when the soul begins to find that the props on which it has rested are many of them wrong. I know but one way in which a man can come forth from his agony scatheless. It is by holding fast to those things which are certain still. In the darkest hour through which the human soul can pass, whatever else is doubtful, this at least is certain, 
If there be no God and no future state, even then it is better to be generous than selfish, better to be true than false, better to be brave than a coward. Blessed beyond all earthly blessedness is the man who, in the tempestuous darkness of his soul, has dared to hold fast to those landmarks. I appeal to the recollection of any man who has passed through that agony and has sat on that rock at last with a faith and hope and trust no longer traditional but his own. Finding the vital element religion from the side of aesthetics is the line along which one often works one's way. Female. The reading of Woodsworth and Keats and Kant's critique of practical judgment combined with the lectures of Woodsworth and Keats opened up a new world to me. It showed me that religion was not identical with any church. I felt God to be the great artist of all the outdoor world of which I was so fond. The change of the good into the beautiful became the acceptance of God's law. A good example is found in the deepened insight of one whose growth was gradual. Male, when 22, I drew the picture of a little aspen tree. As I drew, the beautiful lines insisted on being drawn. I saw they composed themselves by finer laws than any known to man. At last the tree was there, and all I had thought about trees, nowhere. He hath made everything beautiful in his time, became thenceforward the interpretation of the bond between the human mind and all invisible things. The presence of the aesthetic element in the reconstruction is also hinted under the next heading. In the last three paragraphs we see, very naturally, that the way out into positive religion is along those lines which we found to persist during doubt and storm and stress. An appreciation of the strength and beauty of personal life is often the means by which one comes again to solid footing. A woman who had passed through a period of despair from 19 to 33 writes, The chief factors in the change were change of work and love for a little child. By slow degrees came back warmth for other human beings. I became possessed, I have no knowledge how, of a little faith. Male, I have never felt the emotion of love in any form until 26. Then a little child, eight years old, became fond of me because I told her fairy tales. Her words were the first expression of tender feeling I ever received that I did not suspect. I could understand God's love better after that. Female, doubt and storm and stress up to 22. I heard a grandly benignant man preach on the joy and peace of the Christian life. I felt a hope that it might come to me and began to pray vaguely but earnestly for faith and to hold on truth. Gradually a sense of the wonderful vitality of the personality of Jesus came to me. His life seemed to be in all things, in civilization, beauty, purity, art, and life. Slowly I felt in myself this other life in force and divinity. One of the most common ways of entering on positive religious life is through surrender of self and coming to live in more general or universal life. Female, I experienced complete resignation and threw aside selfish anxiety about a future life. I got rid of the prison of self and took my stand in the objective universe. Female, I came to a point where to go on and live without divine aid was impossible. In a time of sore temptation, help came. The simple acceptance of it changed everything. After a year or more of sore distress of mind, religious feeling came back again. Male, my struggle was with independence. I find it easier now since I have submitted completely. My growth has been from purely intellectual religion to acceptance of the Spirit's aid. Male, heretofore, up to 25, religion had been a personal matter. The final solution of my difficulty was in recognizing the social side of morality and religion. That was a brand new revelation to me. Male, the difference after starting for a higher life was that God was recognized while before he was not. The correspondence between these phenomena of self-surrender and those described under conversion is readily appreciated. They doubtless have the same psychological foundation, although those we are now considering are usually more mature. The conviction period in these instances has been prolonged by several years, and when the solution of the difficulties is finally reached, the person sets out more unfalteringly toward the higher life and is not so frequently overtaken by the perplexities of youth as are those who were converted at some earlier year.
The above are ways by which the person passes from external perception to inward appreciation of the worth of religion. In reading them through, one feels that the central thing underlying them all in one way or another is coming to see religion from within. The instances are numerous in which the persons themselves described the transition as being of this nature. This is shown in the following quotations. Female, 29, I no longer think of God as a being sitting on a throne in space, but as a force boundless and infinite which pervades all nature as I pervade my own body. Female, having passed through the various periods of doubt, I find myself without any special creed and too busy to speculate. My faith in God has never wavered, but it takes rather the form of faith in myself as his child and in the result of my own best effort. Female, I came to see religion as a personal matter and not limited to creeds. Female, I gradually came to realize, 26, that vital religion is the breadth of life to all earnest souls and is not confined to churches or formulas. Female, from my sister I learned, 27, that religion is not something tacked on to life. From external observance, I passed to subjective life and oneness with spirit. Male, I came to see that to know God is not a matter of the intellect, but that to live is to know him. Male, I came to feel, 24, that all dogmatic teaching was a matter of chance and habit, that the life of religion depended on the force of faith, not the terms of it. The interpretation of the Reconstruction period in physiological terms seems to be that the personality is now identical with the higher brain areas. If we accept Hewling Jackson's theory, it is coming to live on the highest level of the nervous system, or, in the Fleschig terminology, the self has become wholly organized in the association centers of the cortex. There has been a complete coordination between the higher brain areas and the lower. Life is reduced to a harmony with the synthesis on the side of the higher spiritual centers of consciousness. The various experiences easily harmonize with this point of view. For example, the fact that there is so often a reversion to the earlier childhood conception shows that the lower levels of the nervous system have been taken up and organized into the higher. It may be either that from fatigue the person has fallen back into the old brain tracks as the most convenient center of organization, or, on the other hand, that the old conceptions and the new point of view are found to be in essence equivalent. In the cases we are studying, there are no instances of an apparent retrogression, a reversion into the identification of the self with the old channels of nervous discharge, although an instance or two of that kind has been found since the present study was organized. A pointed instance of this is that of a girl who, through religious struggles, experienced nervous prostration and as a matter of self-defense gave up the struggle and fell back into extreme orthodoxy. She herself was conscious that she did not dare to continue the struggle. Those cases in which there is an entire reorganization of life along independent lines in this point of view are those in which the synthesis of life is so complete from the newly formed associational centers that kinship with the old is lost sight of. Either the earlier conceptions were not vital or not enough one in nature with the new to be assimilated. An interesting type of this is illustrated in the following instance in which the ideas continue to be the same as in the doubt period, but the attitude has changed from a negative into a positive one and bends toward sympathetic cooperation. A man about 30 writes, I have changed very little in my religious ideas since the first period of skepticism, except that I am less critical. I sometimes feel that I would like to be in some church because the church is the greatest organized instrumentality for good that exists. But when I imagine myself taking an active part in religious exercises such as prayer, I feel that it would be a sort of mockery. That the trend of experience should be most commonly towards a broader interpretation of childhood conceptions is in line with what we know of the functioning of the nervous system. It is the earlier impressions that are made in the nervous structure which are most apt to persist and through repetition become most indelible. They are consequently the ones that function either consciously or unconsciously in most vigorous ways throughout life. They will always remain the great channels for the expenditure of nervous energy unless by some miracle they are annihilated. When in later life one attains the power of religious insight and the deeper forces speak through one, they call into activity the whole nature 
and must consequently be tuned to the harmony of one's earlier habits of thought and activity. On the other hand, it is doubtless equally true that one cannot attain a deep revelation without approaching it from these central channels of one's nature. Except ye become as little children, ye cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Childhood things enter into the latter conception for two reasons. First, because it is impossible to escape the effort of the earlier conceptions, since they correspond to the great channels in the nervous mechanism. Second, because childhood conceptions are doubtless in the main right. What other test we have of the rightness of the central conceptions which constitute the bone and sinew of religion than that the race has expressed itself most deeply through them, that they harmonize with our deepest impulses. These religious conceptions are the fullest interpretation of the life of any period. The child drinks unconsciously the quantities in his environment that naturally lead him to these conceptions. He possesses an aptitude through heredity toward these ideas, which are the common possession and drinks in, through his instinct of imitation, those habits of thought which lead him irresistibly in this direction. Hence it is that there is passed on from one generation to the next that which is the purest essence of the life of the people, and at the same time the child contains within himself the germs of his life. It is not because the great truths which are embodied in dogmas and conventions are wrong that youth cannot understand them, but only that youth holds them at arm's length in order to look at them and try to understand them. They have no meaning to him, simply because they are objects to his consciousness. To be religious facts, they must constitute a part of his own nature. They must be worked over into the world of values. They must not only be the thing seen, but must be part of the consciousness which sees. The soul of the youth is longing for a religion and is trying to manufacture one. It is trying at the same time to be the maker and the thing made and fails in the attempt. The kingdom of heaven cometh not with observation. The life of the senses must give way, and one must be willing to be an organ for the expression of the universal life. The kingdom of heaven is within you. This is the revelation that comes only in its completeness with maturity. One appreciates religious truth from within. He himself is the embodiment of the deeper spiritual truth of the world, and is one in essence with the spiritual universe, which he has been trying to discover. For only by unlearning wisdom comes, and climbing backward to diviner youth. What the world teaches profits to the world. What the soul teaches profits to the soul, which then first stands erect with Godward face, when she lets fall her pack of withered facts, the gleanings of the outward eye and ear, and looks and listens with her finer sense. Nor truth nor knowledge cometh from without. Having found the revelation within his own being, the full-grown man or woman sets about as one of the units of an organized whole to transform it into life. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of the Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. The Slibervox Recordings in the Public Domain. Chapter 23 External Influences Up to this time we have been looking for the processes of growth, regardless in large measure of the forces from without which help to determine them. The force of surroundings has constantly been reflected, but it is worth our while for the sake of equilibrium to take our point of view for the moment in the external influences and see how powerfully they act in shaping the character of the religious life and to get a crude notion of the relative value of these influences in the opinion of the subjects themselves. The relative importance of some of these influences is suggested in Table 25. It is made out on the basis of percentage of cases in which the different items were mentioned. Foremost among them are the influences of home life. First, and this is, naturally, the influence and example of parents. It is often spoken of as the most powerful of all influences. For example, my parents have been the strongest influence of my life, religiously and otherwise. That of the mother is oftenest mentioned separately and in the warmest terms. It is frequently the atmosphere of the home that is most strongly felt. One person says, I was kept steady during my youth by reflection on the happiness which so markedly characterized both my parents' and grandparents' homes. Next in prominence is the influence of a friend or the example of persons whose character is admired. 
female my life was influenced most by a bosom friend whose loftier noble character put to shame small things in me male i had a tendency unconsciously to imitate a friend whom i admired someone sinned i smiled my friend frowned i never forgot it male the strongest influence was a girl now dead who was a schoolmate i think she was worthy of worship female the sunlight of the real god in my aunt warmed and inspired me male my uncle shook me from my lethargy and immorality somewhat less frequent are the influences connected with church life female the church has been a second home to me all my life female the church has furnished spiritual food and been a rudder and anchor to my life male hearing a sermon led me to devote my life to the ministry brief hints of many others are found in the following female nature calls up religious feelings constantly male in reading books i have had a tendency to become like the characters i read of male the study of the doctrine of evolution has added immensely to the christian plan of salvation female misfortunes have been the greatest influence female hard fortune has developed my character and moral courage male the sight of wicked people increased my desire to live a religious life female i determined not to live as my father was living male the death of my father and being thrown on my resources have had much to do with my growth male the death of my brother increased my faith and drew me nearer to god the fact of greatest significance in regard to the external influences is that they belong almost exclusively to childhood and youth it is really that a deep impression is received after maturity during early years it is the quieter influences that surround the child those of home parents and church that they leave their impress the child is impressionable and it seems to drink in its environment unconsciously and afterward to appreciate its worth the experiences of adolescence are more dramatic youth is called out in great ways by contact with persons and books the religious life is stirred by coming upon scientific conceptions or by some fresh enthusiasm for art or nature it is often shaken by misfortunes and struggles youth is an explosive condition and is ready to be touched off by this influence or that the adult is doubtless thrown into as many new surroundings encounters as many crises in his contact with science or literature or people but they do not in the same way call for a response his habits are already formed his ways have become established the mature person's life is controlled largely by ideals of his own it is determined more from within while that of the child and that of the youth are influenced more from without the biographies afford us glimpses into each step of the process of emancipation from the control of environment older persons repeatedly avow themselves free from the authority of church bible doctrines and the like life is conducted in its own way with all these as helps one person a woman of 35 says as my religious life has deepened i care less about attending church although at times the service appeals to me strongly although with the deepening of her own religious life a certain sense of self-sufficiency increases among the younger respondents however we sometimes find them in the act of shaking themselves free from external control a girl of seventeen writes because of circumstances i am a member of the church to which i belong i am so troubled by the narrow views of my teachers that i have about decided to stay away from sunday school and study the bible for myself doubt and storm and stresses are evidences that the person is calling into question the established order of things and gaining the power of conscious self-direction end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the psychology of religion by edwin diller starbuck this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four growth without definite transitions so far one important group has been neglected in our discussion of the growth from childhood to maturity many persons develop so evenly that it is impossible to distinguish transition points in their progress before proceeding to complete the picture of the religious life of maturity we must bring this in review if they have been neglected up to this present point it is in part because of their line of growth is not easily describable frequently all that can be said is that they grew out of a religion of childish simplicity and we have now put away childish things those persons to whom the last few chapters have been devoted who have passed through a zigzag course of development reflect more clearly the processes of growth and taken all together show in more picturesque way the paths leading from childhood to adult life although as will be seen later 
They come out at about the same point as those whose development has been a process of unconscious growth and who cannot mark out times and seasons. The mode of progress of the ones we have been considering is comparable to that of the insect, which is now in the larva stage, now in the pupa, now has become a full-grown butterfly. The others grow more as a tree, which year by year has been added to by a little. And when the progress is completed, one can only say it was then a tiny sprout, now it was a sturdy oak. Although there is often little to be said about the way in which these persons have passed from childhood to a vital grasp of spiritual things and the causes which have led to the unfoldment, they were usually able at least to point out the direction of growth by contrasting its nature and the earlier and later times, and to indicate some of the conditions which have favored so harmonious a development. The direction of their advance, as marked by the extremes between childhood and maturity, will be discussed in the latter chapters. At present we shall confine ourselves to the consideration of those conditions which bring about gradual growth, and of some of the difficulties in the way of attaining it. One condition which seems to conduce to gradual development is religious surroundings in childhood. Female. Mother taught me to pray at her knee, and I always had a whispered prayer that none but God could understand. When I did anything wrong, mother required me to seek forgiveness. The change from carelessness and different childhood to earnest, warm interest in God's work was very gradual and very natural after the good training I received. Female. Mother was patient and gentle with me. I had church and Sunday school associations of the pleasantest kind. I was not taught anything about hell and Satan. I have not changed my childhood phrase, our Father in heaven, except to widen the term. Male, I had God-fearing parents and was surrounded by all the influences which go to make godly character. From infancy, I was taught to believe that I belonged to the Savior and that He loved me. My delight in Christian thought and association has changed with the passing years, only to become intensified. The value of these surroundings was shown in a statistical way in the last chapter. Of the factors which have exerted a positive effect on the religious life, the influences of home were most frequently mentioned. It often happens that the religion of a child in an atmosphere of which he breathes, so wholesome and enlivened that he takes it up and works it over into his very being. If we recall the fact and appreciate the causes underlying it, that adult religion is often found to be simply an enlargement of the central conceptions of childhood, we shall see that not only the line of growth, but the quality of the developed spiritual consciousness is in part determined by the quality of the spiritual air breathed by the child. If from the earliest years a child drinks in the conception that religion is a life of love and helpfulness and not a body of doctrines, it will go far toward obviating the necessity of learning it as a painful lesson. Another pretty clearly marked condition of gradual growth is that children be kept reasonably free from dogmas which they are incapable of assimilating. The dogmas may be, in essence, right if they can be fully interpreted. And it may be, and probably is necessary, to teach much that they cannot understand. In fact, many things that appeal to the deeper intuitions and that will be never understood as clear cognitions, but it should not be forgotten that religious conceptions easily crystallize, and that one of the greatest hindrances to growth is that these set forms which project themselves out of an earlier life frequently become so numerous and insoluble as to be unassimable by the young person who is starting life afresh. The freedom of childhood to grow in a natural and unhampered way seems often a means of escaping serious crisis, one woman writes, I had no religious obligations imposed upon me, but followed my own will. My child life was a delight. I have had complete faith in God from childhood. Another respondent, a man, says, Traditional theology never appealed to me, but always since my early years I have felt myself a child of God. My growth has been even from childhood. The danger, on the other hand, of forcing conceptions upon children which do not fit is illustrated in the following instance. Female, a Sunday school teacher tried to impress my unworthiness and sin upon me, and told me that I would be lost forever if I was not converted. For three years I waited in misery of mind for the expected conversion. Fortunately, a dear friend explained that unless I had done something very wrong, or had some heathen beliefs to cast aside, all I needed was to make a public avowal of my faith and purpose. I was tremendously relieved, and joined church in a month. 
I realize more and more my insignificance and God's power and glory. Still another cause which facilitates even and harmonious growth is that the needs of the child be carefully met at every point in its development. A typical case is the following. A woman whose surroundings apparently adapted themselves progressively to her needs. As I grew older and read more and was guided and strengthened by parents and teachers, I gradually came to understand what Christianity means and to trust it. I had religious convictions from childhood. Their influence on me grew as my love and Christian surroundings grew and gradually shaped my spiritual life. Especially are these helps needed toward the beginning of adolescence. At that time, a certain amount of independence of thought and action seems a natural and wholesome demand of one's nature. If serious intellectual questionings are met seriously, it appears that often youth is kept steady when otherwise it might rebel. A minister of the writer's acquaintance, who was a wise teacher and parent, learned indirectly that his son was beginning to inquire into things he had been taught, and had even asked for reasons why he should believe in the existence of God. Instead of treating the slumbering doubt as an offense against religion and fearing that the boy was on the downward road, he awaited his opportunity to help him through his difficulties. He describes the incident in this way. It was in the evening. We walked together, chatting in most familiar fashion. I took him by the hand, and after a little pause in the conversation, I said substantially, I heard something good about you the other day, something that showed that you are growing toward manhood. Of course he wanted to know what I had heard, and I told him. I told him that children get most of their first ideas from their parents, just as the little robins get their food from their parents, but that as they grow they want to know some reason for their opinions, that I was glad to have him ask for reasons for believing that there is a God, that this question of his made my heart leap with gladness as I thought of the time when we would sit in my study as companions in thought and talk over great things. The father adds, the boy is a Christian man at this writing, preparing a graduating thesis on Christian ethics. The cases are numerous which indicate the lack of wisdom of teachers or parents in failing to sympathize with the real needs of young persons and the consequent reaction against social standards. The following instances will illustrate. Female, I was pushed by older people into questionable extremes of piety. Years of revolt succeeded. Female, my Sunday school teacher tried to get me to join the church. When he talked to me, it would harden me instantly. Male, my parents and teachers impressed upon me that I must believe all or nothing at 19. It did not take me long to decide which. Male, among all my childish troubles, keeping the Sabbath holy and being slicked up and dragged to church and Sunday school were the most dreadful. On Sundays we could not whittle, go faster than a walk down to the river, laugh, play in any way, whistle, etc., Sunday was a black chasm. No one who had passed through it can imagine how I felt as Saturday night drew on. It was as if I were about to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We were obliged to spend the day at church and Sunday school, both of which I loathed. I must have listened to a certain pastor for nearly ten years, but the only impression left on my mind was of a blue jay jumping up and down on a limb and scolding me at the top of his voice, and I hated the sight or even thought of him. In addition to the torture of church and Sunday school, we were obliged to commit to memory whole psalms, chapters of the Bible, hymns, and the thing I worst of all detested was the reading of certain so-called religious books. I rather enjoyed Pilgrim's Progress, but one particular book caused me more distress than everything else in my boyish experience put together. It is Jeremy Taylor's Memoirs. I never got more than half through it, but I was compelled to read at it for years. Such an utter loathing was developed toward that book that it seems as if now it would be an agreeable pastime to tear out the leaves one by one and crumple and burn them. Every touch of religious ideas was paralyzing, and they were forced upon me and smeared all over me. It seems like an attempt to crust over the actively moving, growing, and feeding larva with the puba case too soon. It left behind it a strong aversion to developing in the direction of the sort of religious life which had been revealed to my child mind and this may account for the course of my subsequent growth, or for some features of it at least. Reaction and indifference followed from 24 to 26. One reason why the religious lives of so many persons develop symmetrically and harmoniously is clearly that there is a certain mixture of faith and doubt continually, a sufficient degree of freedom to question all things, to ensure a clear horizon, 
and enough to trust and insight and poise of spirit to remain firmly rooted in the heart of religion. Male. Doubts at 18 were the occasion of giving up weaker for stronger incentives to virtue. Spiritual growth preceded the doubt. I always felt beneath me a strong foundation of truth. Female, my growth has been gradual. Since I came in contact with people of other faiths, my beliefs have broadened. I have come to see good in almost every faith, but have clung to my own church. I have accepted the latter ideas of atonement and the inspiration of the Bible. God is my rock and fortress, and I trust him. Male, clergyman of an Orthodox church. Studies have carried me away from some of the old landmarks. I never get excited when I see another one disappearing. I have learned, too, to doubt my doubts. I am an evolutionist. Female, I never was orthodox, so doubts do not trouble me. I am sifting, changing, and rejecting all the time. I am holding my opinions open to change, modification and adjustment of any kind. After the testimony on the subject, both for and against, is all in. The proper balance of faith and doubt during adolescence appears to be of relatively rare occurrence. The conception of life which seems to underlie these instances is that religion is a growing thing and that its growth consists in an endless process of refining. They raise the question as to whether it would not be in the interest of religion for such an attitude to become habitual. We shall see in the next chapter that it is a common trend of development for adults to reach that point of view at which they look upon religion as a dynamic rather than a completed thing. Not only is the spiritual life so considered, but the body of religious conceptions are looked upon as capable of indefinite modification and progress. An instance already referred to in the chapter on doubt is so much in point that it bears repetition in this connection. It is that of a clergyman who writes, I have not passed through a series of beliefs. All my thinking has been an expansion of the fundamental conception reached while in college, that the death of Christ was a declaration that there never was, nor never could be, an obstacle between God and man. I always hailed doubt as sure to reveal some unexpected truth. As often as I have tried to dodge doubts, I have suffered. My real doubts have always come upon me suddenly and unaccountably, and have been the precursors of fresh discovery. In this case there has been supreme reverence for the fundamental conception reached while in college, but at the same time there has been that attitude toward it which allows it to expand and intensify indefinitely. In light of these records it seems possible to come to such attitude in regard to honest doubt that it will be a means of conserving energy and of rendering growth even and harmonious instead of being the very thing which so often throws life into a state of discord and perplexity. These are some of the conditions, then, which contribute to the gradual type of religious growth in which a high degree of spiritual perfection is attained as naturally and easily as a plant unfolds. That such harmonious development is possible is beautifully illustrated in the case of Dr. Edward Everett Hale, the strength and symmetry of whose character needs no emphasis. He discusses the nature of his growth and the influences which led to it in these words. I observe with profound regret the religious struggles which come into many biographies, as if almost essential to the formation of the hero. I ought to speak of these, to say that any man has an advantage not to be estimated who was born, as I was, into a family where the religion is simple and rational, who is trained in the theory of such a religion so that he never knows for an hour what these religious or irreligious struggles are. I always knew God loved me, and I was always grateful to him for the world he placed me in. I always liked to tell him so, and was always glad to receive his suggestions to me. To grow up in this way saves boy or youth from those battles which men try to describe and cannot describe, which seem to use up a great deal of young life. I can remember perfectly that, when I was coming to manhood, the half-philosophical novels of the time had a deal to say about young men and maidens who were facing the problem of life. I had no idea whatever what the problem of life was. To live with all my might, seemed to me easy. To learn there was so much to learn seemed pleasant and almost, of course, to lend a hand. If one had a chance, natural, and if one did this, why, he enjoyed life because he could not help it, and without proving to himself that he ought to enjoy it. I suppose that a skillful professor of the business could have prodded up my conscience, which is, I think, as sensitive as in others. I suppose I could have been made very wretched, and that I could have made others very wretched. But I was in the hands of no such professor, 
and my relations with the God whose child I am were permitted to develop themselves in the natural way. Now no man can choose the religious communion into which he can be born more than he can choose the place of his birth, but it may be possible for those who have to direct the education of children to see that that education shall be conducted on the lines which I have indicated. A child who is clearly taught that he is God's child, that he may live and move and have his being in God, and that he has, therefore, infinite strength at hand for the conquering of any difficulty, will take life more easily and probably will make more of it than one who is told that he is born the child of wrath and wholly incapable of good. In this description, Dr. Hale undoubtedly holds up the ideal that is well worth striving after, namely to make the most of life with the least waste of energy. But the standard here must remain for the majority of human beings an ideal. We have to face the fact that at the present time, and with the conditions under which we live, growth usually does not come in that way. And if we appreciate only a fraction of the difficulties in passing from childhood to maturity, we shall see that, that such a course is well nigh impossible. As has been fitly said, the child is to traverse in a few years the path which has been passed over by the race in as many millions of years. It is the miracle producing in this short time an essentially spiritual life, which is as much above the innocent life of childhood as the indefinitely fine and complex physiological functioning of a mammal is above that of a protozoan. The quality of life on this higher plane is infinitely complex and delicate, and in the interplay of forces there is a chance at every point for the normal course of development to be sidetracked. In the records we are studying, there are many instances in which it appears that all the conditions pointed out above for the attainment of harmonious growth have been fulfilled, and in which growth, after all, is attained with friction and difficulty. Some of the forces which tend to thwart even development and which are relatively out of the possibility of control, are apparent in the records. One of these is the one we have already mentioned, a lack of physical vitality sufficient to support the mental activity. One of the respondents, a man whose youth was full of storm and stress, writes, I was reared in a Christian home and sheltered as closely from evil as one could be. I was taught from the first to regard myself a Christian, and, above all, to do right and to please God. I stopped going to high school from nervous prostration at 16. Religion was my all-absorbing interest, and I sought to carry it out in practice. I studied and began to doubt. There came a time when I would have answered the questions of God and immortality in the negative. The difficulty of getting through adolescence without a crisis is also heightened by the fact that physiological growth is not so continuous. During a year or two at the beginning of youth, the volume of the heart increases almost up to the size of that of an adult. The arterial system diminishes in volume, and blood pressure is very much augmented. There are more red corpuscles in the blood, the lung capacity is increased, and there is more carbonic acid in the breath, all of which show that rapid transformations are going on in the organism. If nature has established this developmental crisis in physiological growth, which we must regard as normal, we should not be surprised to find as marked irregularities in the psychic life. Indeed, it is a well-recognized fact that the physiological changes are directly connected with the psychic condition. It is not uncommon to regard peculiarities of temperament as dependent largely on circulation. In temperament, we have found to be one of the central factors which determines the character of religious experience. Given two persons reared in perfectly wholesome religious surroundings, if one is naturally highly sensitive and the other phlegmatic, the former is more likely to become restless and reactionary during the adolescent transformations, while the other may have an uneventful growth. If we appreciate the complexity of life in both its outer and inner relations, we shall see the liability of producing a tangle in the warp of woof of the interacting forces. In the multiform society in which a human being is compelled to live, it is manifestly impossible to control all the influences and be sure that they are the very best. Many of the difficulties which arise are professedly the result of unpropitious surroundings. And the complexity is just as great on the subjective side. Out of the multitude of conceptions which it is possible for a mind to entertain, only one, or at most a few, can be held as the objective of clear consciousness at one time. But we live in an environment in which there are no end of conceptions that are imposed on one, in which there are countless duties that arise to crowd out or 
or offset one's habitual mode of activity. The problem of squaring one's life in these is not the difficulty of steering between Sila and Cherubdis, but a thousandfold more delicate. One can, indeed, let the problems go and live in one's own way, but unless one's own way happens to be nature's way, as determined by the course that the whole of life is pursuing, one's life becomes served from the whole and is consequently lost. Society insists on her forms as inviolably right. Each individual is compelled sooner or later to take them into account, and this is no easy matter, for it is one of the deepest instincts which shows itself at the very beginning of life, to hold one's own ground, to insist one's own point of view. But another instinct, just as forceful, draws one toward the thought life of the whole, the instinct of sociality, the desire to share the life of society. The chances are very great that one will be caught between these warring influences. It is an inevitable condition of developing consciousness that there shall be great tenacity for a conception, religious or otherwise, which is once entertained. Consciousness grows by such conceptions, and for a time they seem all important. It is equally inevitable as one develops out of a childhood in which a few conceptions fill one's mental horizon, that new ones should project themselves into the field of consciousness. It is difficult to gain a new idea, and next to impossible to change one's point of view. Some sort of friction and clash is almost sure to arise. It is certain to come in adolescence, when the great transition from a life of the senses into a world of ideas and spiritual perceptions is to be accomplished. Unless the youth is so happily constituted that nature works out the result for him, and he wakens up to the fact that he is a full-grown spirit. And this struggle is likely to continue until one comes to welcome the approach of new conceptions, while at the same time treasuring the old, until he looks on life as a growing thing, until he has set his faith on ideals, and has learned the secret of helping them to develop. The end of life seems to be growth, and in the very analysis of these difficulties, which seem to bar the way of free development, they present themselves as imperfections which must be overcome. That is, it appears to be an ideal constantly to be striven after, that growth should be full and harmonious and beautiful, and that the end should be reached without a hitch. We may be led into some wisdom in the attainment of this ideal by keeping in mind what appears to be the condition which underlies it. Expressed in physiological terms, namely the final, complete coordination of the lower and higher brain areas. The difficulty during adolescence is to bring into activity a new brain area and make it harmonize with the rest. Whatever steps will make this coordination keep up with the rate of growth, whatever will progressively bring into free activity any part which is ripe for functioning will tend to ward off a catastrophe. Expressed in these terms, one sees the danger, for example, of crystallizing the life of a child about conceptions which are too far beyond its grasp. To dose children on constantly reiterated theological doctrines establishes channels of nervous discharge which must of necessity in childhood be on a lower level and which are so deeply cut that a little later any new discharges from a higher level are willfully inhibited. There is doubtless no sure way of passing through adolescence safely than by wise anticipation during later childhood of the most healthy lines of growth. If the higher brain areas which are to function in the fully developed spiritual life are brought little by little into activity, their more complete functioning at a later time will be a matter of course. Any means whatsoever which will lead toward the most complete coordination of the brain areas and unification of the personality by a process of harmonious development seems to be in accord with nature's way. A few persons seem to have an uneventful development because they do not leave the religion of childhood, perhaps never wake up to an immediate realization of religion. They raise the question whether it would not have been conducive to growth even to have suffered a little on the rack of doubt and storm and stress. End of chapter 24. Chapter 25, The Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25, Adult Life, Beliefs. In the chapter preceding, we have followed the development of religion from childhood through the many diverging lines of adolescence. In these complexities, we found a unifying center in the development of religious self-consciousness. Somewhat to our surprise, at the close of adolescence, we came upon a definite turning point which marked the entrance upon mature life. 
The fact which underlay the transition from youth to manhood and womanhood and brought unity into its very great diversity appeared to be the final coordination of the higher life of intelligence and insight and the lower life of the senses. The mature person we found to be one who carries his higher unity over into a life of action. In the following three chapters, we shall follow up the line of evidence still further by analyzing the beliefs, feelings, and ideals given by the respondents as a description of their status at the time when they made the records. In doing this, we shall meet greater differences than heretofore. As life advances, it becomes progressively more complex. There are in reality as many lines of growth from earliest childhood as there are persons who develop, but by studying them in their relation to one another, we are able to find a few well-marked types that reflect certain great trends of development. We may trace the line of growth by three methods. In the first place, we may follow the individual tendencies as the respondents analyze their development step by step. Again, since we have already noticed a tendency toward adolescent storms and stress, followed usually by a reconstruction, we may keep the beliefs, feelings, and ideals of the person in different stages of this process separate and so let them cast their special horoscope at different points in the line of advance. These persons in turn we shall compare with those whose growth has been entirely gradual. In the third place, we may separate the subjects into age groups, and so determine what beliefs, feelings, and ideals are characteristics of different periods of life. Central Beliefs Before we trace the line of growth through mature life, it is important to get a picture of those beliefs that are actually present and central in adult religious consciousness and about which religious consciousness organizes itself. These, together with the percentages of their frequency, are shown in Table 26. These headings will not be clear without some elucidation. Each of them is a composite of somewhat varying conceptions. The beliefs included in the first heading center in the conception of a being who is back of the world and in it and who controls it. God is variously described as a creator or father, as law or love, as force or underlying reality, as the spirit in all things and the like. Those instances are included which evade the term God, but nevertheless profess faith in an existence analogous to what other people mean by it. One person, for example, says, I feel myself a part of something bigger than I that controls me. The belief in Christ has also a diverse content. With some, he is a personal savior, or the savior of the world in a unique sense, and with others he is the ideal of perfect manhood. A number simply express belief in Christ without saying further what they mean by the term. The character of the belief in immortality was usually not specified. One described the future life as non-corporeal, and two as the indestructibility of that which exists. The next heading includes those who regard right conduct as an essential element in religion. The meaning of the heading can be most readily seen by some typical quotations. A man of 34 writes, Religion with me means a system of life, an integral part of human evolution. Morality is the thing to be striven for, but morality must have a religious sanction, a loving deity. A similar point of view is expressed by a woman of 54 who says, The higher life means health and spiritual tone and sympathy with people. It means to me a higher relationship with my fellow man. God is a spring of this life, but it finds its expression in activity. The term religion as a life within demands fuller explanation. Persons frequently come to feel that the sanctions of life are not to be found at all in anything except external, but within one's own consciousness. That the higher life, if found at all, is revealed within one's personality. That religion exists as an impulse toward a higher life. That specific beliefs are not essential that the significance of religion is to be grasped not by reason but by faith, and that the essence of life is spirit. These persons represent a somewhat distinct type of belief, or rather of attitude toward life, which is almost diametrically opposed to the group comprised in the last heading of the table. The character of the type is suggested by the following quotations. Male, 37. Not with the intellect, but with the spirit, man finds God. Female, 30. Vital religion is the breadth of life with all earnest souls and is not confined to creeds or formulas. Male, 44. Religion to me is a sort of instinct, an impulse toward a higher life. Female, 36. The most bottom truth is my own existence with capacity for working, feeling, loving, and worshiping. That which commands my love and reverence is universal and is for all. 
The next heading, Religion as a Process of Growth, is somewhat akin to the last, but differs from it in respect to the prominence of the notion that life is dynamic, that religion consists essentially not in something that remains fixed as an object of faith, but in a progression from the lower to the higher. Male, 27. I believe in evolution, in spiritual progress, as expressed in the chambered Nautilus. My conception of the world is that phenomena represent a progression out of mystery toward truth, goodness and beauty in increasing ratio to evil. Male, 57. Religion means steadily upward progress. In distinction from the last two groups are those who regard religion as largely conditioned by philosophic or scientific conceptions. These are typical. Male, 24. I have a profound and earnest belief in the doctrine of evolution. It has had more to do with the direction of my beliefs than anything else. It has added immensely to the grandeur of the Christian plan of redemption. I have honest doubt as to many popular beliefs, because they are absolutely contradictory to established scientific facts. Male, 23. The philosophic search for truth and devotion to ideals is my doctrine. Female, 74. Science is the only source of enlightened wisdom, morality, and peace. Male, 32. I look to nature's laws for all I hope for. These cases represent the demand for a clear intellectual horizon for a grasp of the world as a system. The unity which is gained in the instrument of selection of one's religious conceptions. Those beliefs are retained which easily harmonize with it. The system itself even comes to have religious significance. These seven most important objects of belief are given in the table above in their order of frequency. The figures show the percentage of cases in which the various items are mentioned. Each of these conceptions is sometimes spoken of as that in which belief centers. The one without the whole religious attitude would change. The order of frequency with which each is central happens to be the same as that in the table, with the one exception that conduct stands first instead of fourth. The line of growth and belief. In the first place, we shall inquire into the line of growth of one particular group of our subjects, namely, those who have passed through adolescent storm and stress and doubt. We found in an earlier chapter that these could easily be divided into three groups, those who still have a negative attitude towards religion, those in process of reconstruction, and those whose faith has been reconstructed. We notice further that the ages of these persons formed an ascending series. Consequently, if we compare the religious convictions of these three classes, we shall have a means of determining the line of advance in belief with age for this particular type of experience. We shall be able at the same time to contribute something to the preceding picture of adolescence and the way toward positive faith by noticing what beliefs are central in the earlier years and how they increase or decrease with age. This is shown in the first three vertical columns of Table 27. The numbers give the percentage of the persons in each of the three groups by whom a certain object of belief is mentioned. From the first column, it is evident that the three beliefs which remain most firm during negation are those which center in God, conduct, and scientific conceptions. The number of persons, especially of men, in this column is so small that the figures do not bear close interpretation. Their value is enhanced, however, by the fact that they fall so well in line with what we found in the study of adolescence. It was observed there that, during the absence of distinctly religious feelings, the ethical and intellectual impulses came to the front. We see from the table that, in respect to belief, likewise, these two aspects of consciousness are active, the one making religion center about morality, the other about scientific or philosophic conceptions. Also prominent is the belief in God, which is clearly, for all the groups and all the ages, the greatest organizing center of belief. The first three of these types of belief have a tendency to decrease during the second and last stages of reconstruction, while the belief in God distinctly increases. During negation, the beliefs in Christ and immortality suffer an almost complete rejection. The conceptions of religion as a dynamic power and as a life within have not yet become appreciated. This fact fits it perfectly with the prominence of the philosophic and scientific ideas, which may be regarded as diametrically opposed to them. During the second and third stages in the process, we notice some marked changes. The belief in Christ, which was rejected during the period of negation, is already becoming reinstated in the second stage. And among those whose faith is finally reconstructed, it has come to be present in about half the cases. 
The belief in immortality, however, does not reappear until the final reconstruction and is then present in about one-third of the cases. As a help to the farther discussion, we must consider the sexes separately. The rational conceptions almost disappear among the women, but persist among the men. The religious life of men during the process of reconstruction centers to a remarkably large degree in conduct, but this factor remains fairly constant among women. It is during the second stage that religion as a process of growth and as a life within comes suddenly to the front with women, but this development does not appear among the men until the time of final reconstruction. During the process of reconstruction, the life of women centers in a subjective appreciation of religion, as shown in the prominence of religion, as growth, as a life within, while that of the men passes over into thinking and doing, as evidenced by the large percentages under science and philosophy and conduct. If we take the sexes together and consider all the types of belief, it is evident that the line of growth toward the reinstatement of the faith in Christ and that in immortality, toward the gradual depreciation of rational and ethical conceptions, and toward the enlargement of the belief in religion as a growing thing and as a life appreciated from within. We are now to ascertain the line of growth and beliefs of the larger group of the cases, those whose development has been gradual. In columns 4 and 5 of table 27 is found a comparison of the beliefs of those above 24 with those below that age. For the sake of convenience in comparing the beliefs of the older persons with those of the latter stages of reconstruction, the natural order of the two gradual growth columns in regard to age is reversed. Comparing, then, the fifth column with the fourth, we find, just as in the last group, an increase in the beliefs in God, an immortality, and a persistence in ethical beliefs. These contradict the last group, however, in the respect that there is a considerable decrease in the belief in Christ, and that the worth of rational conceptions is enhanced with age. This seems to be due to the fact that those whose development has been gradual have not been roused during the earlier years seriously to question matters of religious doctrine, whereas the others have passed through the period of negation at an earlier time and have to come to a positive point of view. In regard to the comparison of religion as growth, it decreases among the men and increases among the women, which is just the reverse order of that in the last group. This difference entices one attempt at an explanation, which may at the same time prove faulty. It seems to bear out the difference already pointed out, that the persons of the gradual growth group now begin to question religious matters more seriously, just at the time when those who have reconstructed their faith have settled their difficulties and are moving along spiritually. Although there is an increase in the percentage of women who regard religion as a growth, this would not have been the case if the dividing line had been taken at 30 instead of 24. All those who make up the 15% of women in column 4 of the table are between the ages of 24 and 30. The most marked increment in any of the groups is that in the class who appreciate religion as a life within. This is in accordance with what we found in the last group, and points toward this as one of the most central tendencies in adult religious development. This result is of a special interest as being the first pointed answer to the question whether those whose growth has been even come out at the same point, and whose have wandered through the adolescence by devious ways. In this respect, which is most central for both classes, they exactly agree. The similarity in the final outcome of the two lines of growth is yet more fully brought out if we compare columns 3 and 4 in the table which represent adult persons of a comparable age. Glancing down the columns, we find not only the same beliefs present in both classes, but the percentage is almost the same in every instance. The only marked differences are those in the ethical beliefs among women and in the conception of religion as growth in both sexes, differences the signification of which is not clear. The inference from the comparison of the mature life as determined by its attitude toward various great questions of religious belief is that gradual growth and that which is accompanied by stress and fluctuations are different ways of attaining the same end. For the sake of a more complete picture of the line of growth, all the cases separated into age groups are thrown together in Table 28. The figures represent the percentages of the number in each age group who mention any of the beliefs. The value of the table is in following the line from the left to right to see whether the different beliefs increase or decline with age. The belief in God in some form is by far the most central conception and grows in importance as years advance. After 40, there are almost none who do not mention it. 
There is advance likewise in the quality of the belief which is not shown by the figures. Several younger persons express it in the exact same phraseology as the Apostles' Creed, but there are none of those over 25 who do not describe it with an evident appreciation of its content. A girl of 17, for example, says, Everything in the Apostles' Creed embodies my deepest belief. These younger persons are often found in the process of awakening to the signification of the idea of God. One young woman of 18 writes, I really believe there is a God. Belief in God as a larger unnamed force or spirit, or as a power that works for righteousness, while common among the older persons, is almost never given by the younger. The belief in immortality, another world problem, enters more into consciousness with age. In the last line of the table we also see that the conception of immortality is more and more set aside as non-essential as life advances. The fact that acceptance and rejection of it both increase with age shows that it is a vital question which forces itself forward for consideration and must be decided one way or the other. The belief in Christ, which we found to increase with age among those whose faith is reconstructed, continues to have about the same worth when both groups are taken together. With both sexes it has greatest prominence in the early twenties. It is of importance to notice the place which conduct holds as an organizing center of belief all through mature life. Underlying this fact is the same thing which has been forcing itself upon our attention all the way along from earliest childhood. The ethical instinct, the effort to do right, is far the most constant and persistent of all the forces that are active in the child life. In adolescence, when the new life bursts forth, its most important content was ethical. During storm and stress and doubt, that which remained firmest when life was least organized was this same instinct. And now we find, in describing their fundamental attitudes toward life, that the respondents already in the late teens and twenties mention conduct almost as frequently as at any later time in life. It apparently continues to play a vital part all through life, while among the older women it seems to have even greater worth than among the younger. It should be recalled that among the things which are given as absolutely essential, the sine qua non of religion, conduct was most frequently mentioned. As a woman of forty writes, Life would be meaningless to me without a belief in God, but life without it, I would still continue to do my duty. The test of religion is conduct towards my fellow beings. Another person, a man of thirty, says, Religion is more a life, a living, than a system. It is a series of daily actions which determines conduct. Its essence is doing of good to one's fellow men. Again, a woman of thirty-one says, In case of the absence of a belief in God, I would still live by a categorical imperative. The ethical instinct, although not the most prominent, is the most constant and persistent factor in religious life. That attitude toward religion which makes it center in a rational system is relatively infrequent among the women. Among the men, although it remains common throughout life, it occurs most often in the early twenties. It is an interesting suggestion in the comparison of the sexes that its importance is greatest in the earlier years among men and in the later years among women. The conception of religion as a process of growth, with the exception of the women under 20, begins vigorously, but later it declines in both sexes. It is natural that it should be greatest during those years when life is fullest of energy and activity. With the exception of the beliefs in God and immortality, the conception of religion as a life within undergoes the most definite progress with years. It has more value than the belief in immortality in showing the central tendency in development from the fact that immortality is taught as a religious dogma, while the appreciation of religion as an inner life must, or at least apparently does, spring up spontaneously. It is not grasped by any of the women under twenty, and seldom by those of either sex before thirty. Among those instances which occur in the earlier years, most show this conception in the process of formation. A man of twenty-two says, I see more of goodness of God in everything. I am trying to see his will in whatever I do. Another says, Religion with me involves love and beauty, and possibly a realization of myself as one with God. It is instructive to contrast this tentative and uncertain point of view with that of some of the others in whom it has been worked over as one of the certainties of life. One person writes, The deepest religious truth to me is the power of a man to live out a devout life. No beliefs are necessary, for religion is feeling. Running parallel with the increase of this conception of religion with years 
is the setting aside of certain beliefs as not essential. Among these are the divinity of Christ, immortality, the authority of the church, the inspiration of the Bible, and the like, most of which are beliefs embodied in traditional doctrines. This shows that the person is progressively working out for himself or herself an independent point of view and is coming to appreciate religion rather than to look upon it objectively. This is the same tendency which was observed in regard to the belief in God. The two conceptions, belief in God and the one we are now considering, sometimes work together as that of the oneness of God and man, of God expressing himself through human life. These two types show that the most central tendency is toward an appreciation of religion as a life within and toward a realization of this as a part of the life of God. This falls in line with what we found in the study of conversion, which showed itself to be essentially a definite step in the birth of a spiritual self that was felt to be a part of a larger life. The three groups of persons, those who have experienced conversion, those who have passed through storm, stress, and doubt, and those whose growth has been gradual, in this respect show a similar culmination in the trend to establish the fact that we have here one of the great tendencies in religious development. End of chapter 25. Chapter 26 of The Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26, Adult Life, Religious Feelings. The religious feelings of mature life center most naturally about three things. The sense of one's own spiritual life, the consciousness of the larger life outside the self, and an appreciation of the relationship existing between the self and this larger life. Those feelings which are intimately connected with the sense of one's own spiritual life are such as these, independence and freedom, joy and ecstasy, and spiritual exaltation. Adolescence we found to be a time when new life was beginning to function. At the same time, distinctively, religious feelings were rare. In maturity, the fresh life rises into consciousness and is worked over into actual possession. One has a sense of the new energy within. This shows itself in one way in the sense of freedom. One person says, I feel immortal and indestructible. Others express it in a similar way. I feel independent of the world and superior to fate. When in the hills I desire nothing, feel nothing, but just exult in the reality of being. This attitude represents the bare feeling of self-existence. Frequently the sense of one's own personality is suffused with emotion and expresses itself as the feeling of joyousness while engaged in religious activity or during contemplation. For example, it is a delight to me to do God's work. Often at church my heart heaves with emotion and finds an outlet in tears. It is relatively infrequent that this type of feeling exists pure. On the contrary, it is usually mingled with the sense of one's relationship to one's fellow man and God. There is again the mere sense of the larger life, God, nature, persons, and society, outside the self as an object of contemplation. This shows itself as awe, the sense of mystery, reverence, love, aesthetic, appreciation. These quotations will illustrate. Female, I have an instinctive feeling that there is something higher and better than myself to revere. There has been a slow and steady growth in the veneration and love for the one spirit of goodness. Male, I never felt emotion of the kind others have. Sometimes a contemplation of the world, humanity, and of the universe awakens a sense of sublimity and infinity. This arouses awe and wonder at the mystery of life and of its unity. Sometimes this grows into a sense of the great world spirit in and through all things. This outgoing love finds its object just as frequently in love and helpfulness towards one's fellows, in the pleasure of helping along the growth of human institutions. It is an indication, doubtless, of the complexity of the mental associations that are forming, especially in the late adolescence and in early adult life, that the world outside presents itself as something not only grand and mysterious, but beautiful. The finer qualities of human life are idealized. The aesthetic side of external nature and of church forms and the like is the aspect which is most appreciated. This is well reflected in the following instance of a woman who professes not to have the usual religious feelings. I am satisfied that I feel more serene in church than most Christians. I feel most reverent in a Catholic church, whether it is empty or during service, and more reverent in an Episcopal than in any other Protestant church. There are some things that call forth my feelings. A burial service, an eclipse of the sun, the sight of Niagara, the power of the ocean, these have moved me most. 
It is not infrequent for the life outside of one to present itself in this way in a transfigured form. It is far more common for religious feelings to grow out of a sense of the relationship between the self and the whole. The relationship conceived takes every possible form, depending on whether the life outside is more vivid in consciousness or whether the fact of one's own life is more keenly appreciated. When the former condition obtains, that is, when the fact of God's greatness and majesty and of man's smallness is vividly felt, there results a distinct class of feelings, dependence, humility, and resignation. The character of this group is illustrated by the following quotations. Female, I lost myself in the recognition of freedom, power, and love. Female, I feel my weakness and unworthiness. I long for more strength. Female, something in me makes me feel myself a part of something bigger than I that is controlling. Male, I feel dependence on and an intimate relation to a power not myself. Male, I have no confidence in myself or anything but God. I have completely submitted to God's way. During adolescence, as we saw, the fact that presented itself in the case of spontaneous awakenings and conversions was that of the dawning of a new life within. But now that sense seems to give way, and gradually, as life advances, one awakens to the other fact that the life of the whole is more important, and consequently, as we shall see, the sense of dependence increases with years. One frequently finds in single instances evidences of the transformation in this respect. A woman who had passed through an adolescent upheaval in which she professed not to have a religion writes in regard to her present position, God, immortality, and freedom have more meaning to me now than ever before, not so theoretical as a few years ago, but near and more real, while the ego is now not so important. The feeling of dependence in the process of formation is clearly seen in the following instance of a young woman of 17. I cannot explain what I think of God. I cling to the idea because I find it a comfort in distress. It helps me to look up to something vastly superior to myself, morally and intellectually. It is a comfort to me, so even if it is foolish, why should I give it up? I must have someone to pray to. This last instance seems to show at the same time the raw material out of which another religious feeling develops that of the sense of oneness with God and of divine companionship. It centers in one of the deepest instincts of human life, the need for society, for companionship, for kinship. This instinct fully developed shows itself in unmistakable terms in such instances as the following. A woman writes, I have the sense of a presence strong and at the same time soothing, which hovers over me. Sometimes it seems to enwrap me with sustaining arms. God is a personal being who knows and cares for his creatures. Another woman writes, I often have a consciousness of a divine presence, and sweet words of comfort come to me. The sense of oneness and nearness shows itself in many ways, whether personal or impersonal, in which the essential thing is the feeling of close relationship between the self and the whole. These instances will illustrate. Female, I feel the presence of Jesus in me as life, force, and divinity. Female, I have a sense of the presence of a living God. Male, I have heightened experiences when God seems very near. Male, I have a sense of a spiritual presence in the world. Male, my soul feels itself alone with God and resolves to listen to His voice in the depths of spirit. My soul and God seek each other. The sublime feeling of a presence comes over me. Another feeling which grows out of this relationship is that of faith and trust. Female, each year my faith is stronger and richer. Female, I have an unquestioned assurance that what is pure, honorable, and enlightened is best in harmony with the frame of things, and I need not see how. Female, when I pray, a sense of love and trust comes over me. Female, I do not understand, but I believe God. Male, after getting to work for Christ, my faith took strong hold. This shades off into rest and peace. A woman who had passed through several years of severe storm and stress and doubt and suffered misfortune writes, 144, I feel rest and security of soul. All of these groups of feelings taken together seem to indicate that the condition underlying them is the organization of life within the sphere of the higher mental activities. In terms of the nervous system, they may be said to imply that the personality has become identified with the association centers in the brain. The different phases of feeling are an index of greater or less success in living from the standpoint of highest association centers. Joy and spiritual exaltation are an expression of the fact that this final coordination of brain areas has been fairly completed. 
There is delight in the exercise of the higher psychic functions. Peace and rest are the natural consequence of the feeling of unity and wholeness that grows out of the complete unification of nerve elements. The stress and strain and tension that underlay the adolescent experiences has been relieved. There is no inhibition of the normal discharge of nervous energy. The functioning of life on this higher plane brings with it the awakening of ideas. Things are now seen in their relationships. In the intellectual sphere, one appreciates the unity of the world and human life in its relationships to other psychic realities. In the social complex, one appreciates one's own life as one of the units in society. So in the realm of spiritual things, one feels oneself to be a part of a larger life. Human life is appreciated in its relationship to the life of God. The sense of oneness and divine companionship is the expression of the fact that life has had its birth into this larger world of spirit, and that it feels its kinship with the spiritual forces that exist. The most frequent accompaniment of this psychical awakening is the perception of the infinitude of the world order and a sense of humility and dependence on it. It appears that the deeper instinctive life is almost invariably carried up to the higher level. The spiritual life is nearly always described in terms of sense and of natural human relationships. One listens to God's voice in the depths of spirit. Another's relationship to God is that of a son to a father. He carries into it the demands for kinship and intimacy. These things seem to indicate that the lower mental activities have been carried up into the higher complex. The evidence that this condition obtains is found only in its aptness in bringing unity into the diversity of phenomena. If one follows the development of religious feeling in its process of formation from youth toward maturity, the theory is reduced almost to a certainty. An experience which is especially true for latter adolescence and early maturity is that of yearning after the higher life, a striving after the life of spirit. It is a condition which we have noticed heretofore in which the different regions of the association tracts in the brain are beginning to function, but function separately which results in the feeling of incompleteness. The striving after the higher life is a struggle of a complete coordination of all the nerve elements on the higher level. A woman whom not only her years but the character of her experience indicates an adolescent case says, I yearn to realize more of the infinite. Another woman who is a very busy teacher writes, I never seem to get up the lively experience I strive for. I have more need of contemplation, devotion, and prayer. A girl of 18 says, Sometimes when rushed at school I do not think of God enough, and that is bad for me. Then I go to him and he comforts me. The two latter experiences seem to be those of persons who are ripe for the fuller coordination of the higher brain areas, but in whom the rush and hurry of work and activity prevents its complete fruition. Still further back in the process is the experience of a girl of 17. I have no heightened experiences and cannot understand why people in books have them. Again, a little further on the side towards complete success is the case of a man of 26 who says, I am emerging into a distinctly positive stage. I have developed into the conviction of the essential religious nature of every human feeling and have whole-souled sympathy for diverse humanity. In this instance, the manifoldness of the normal human activities and feelings has begun to be synthesized. This point of view helps to explain perhaps a case like the following of a woman of 26 who has already passed the normal time for a spiritual awakening without complete success and in whom the breach between the lower and higher levels is considerable, with the result that the two function separately. There is a constant irritation resulting from the separate functioning of the higher and lower centers, and from an organic craving for their unity. She says, I always try to speak kindly to others. I try to do those things that would please God. I often struggled in prayer to know God's will. What troubles my conscience is that I do not take religion seriously enough. It is not so serious an affair with me as with most people. I often feel nearer to God and have a sense that He loves me better after a cry over my sins. I like everybody and everything better afterwards. The anomaly of not taking religion seriously enough and of crying over her sin seems to be the normal accompaniment of the physiological condition described. When the coordination has become complete and one's whole being is reduced to a unity, when the deeper instincts express themselves freely, then we have an entirely different state of feeling. 
there is a sense of living within the spiritual sphere. One person says, It seems to me that spirit talks to me. We have cases like the above in which the soul feels itself alone with God and listens to his voice in the depths of spirit or in which one feels the personality of Jesus as life, force, and divinity. This condition in its extremer forms is one that is so often described in the lives of the mystics. One's consciousness is entirely absorbed in the all-sufficiency of the love of God that expresses itself through human personality. It is a condition that often develops into a pathological tendency. The person falls into the bottomless sea of instinct and seems to lose all connection with the world of sense. An instance of this in which there is apparently at least a close approach to abnormality is the following of a woman of 47. I believe in the circulation of mind through corporate humanity as practically as I believe in the circulation of blood through the corporeal man. The sweet peace that flows the undefinable and unutterable waves of sorrow that bruise the spirit assures me that a breach has been repaired, an offense condoned, a sin blotted out, a balance adjusted for the common weal. Deep calleth unto deep. While man's sins must redeem, the bugbear of orthodoxy has long since vanished beyond the searchlight. I am. God is still creator. I would abide with the saints. I would go in and out of human hearts and sup up with those I love. I would rear again the human temple and live the life of a world's conqueror. I would reveal the things unseen and unconvinced to the lovers of God. This case is analogous to the extreme sanctification experiences in which life has been completely organized from the standpoint of the higher brain areas, but has been partially cut off from its contact with the lower. Having pointed out the extremes in the possible relationship existing between the higher and lower areas, that on the one hand in which the higher have never been aroused, and that on the other hand in which the higher have become overdeveloped and have partially lost their connection with the lower, it is a matter of individual opinion to decide what is the mean between them which represents a normal condition. The relative prominence of the more characteristic types of feelings is shown in Table 29. The figures represent in percentages of the whole number of persons those who experience the various feelings at the time of making the records. They stand in the table in the order of frequency. The sense of dependence, humility, etc. stands at the head. This furnishes a partial justification for the tendency in vogue since Schleiermacher to define religion in terms of the sense of dependence and freedom. The freedom side of the definition, however, seldom finds corroboration in the records before us, at least not explicitly. If one were setting out to define religion, it would have to be borne in mind that several other feelings are about as prominent as dependence. The percentages in the column for males are larger than those for females. This may be taken to signify that men are more given to religious feelings than women. The inference is only true in part. The feelings of the men are more numerous and more explicit. They are more clearly stated, and the attempt to organize them was attended with far less difficulty and uncertainty. The real explanation of the difference is to be found in the distinction tersely stated by Mr. Coe that women feel more while men feel more intensely. We shall next inquire into any evidences which show the line of growth from childhood towards maturity. The partial answer to the question is found by comparing Table 28 on page 192, which represents some facts in childhood religion, with the one above. Reverence, which almost never appears in childhood religion, stands almost at the head in adult life. The sense of oneness with God or Christ and trust are prominent in both tables. Peace and spiritual exaltation are also frequent later, but seldom occur during childhood. Dependence and humility in adult life appear to correspond somewhat to credulity and the tendency among children to use God for their own personal ends. Comparison of the two tables seems to show that the constant elements from childhood to maturity are dependence and the sense of oneness and faith. Fear is transformed, perhaps, into reverence, into which the childish familiarity with God is also changed. Peace and joy would appear to follow naturally on the unrest of adolescence. Spiritual exaltation among the adults, which presupposes a considerable degree of mental development, could not have been present in childhood. Only a small part of that group of feelings termed reverence, gratitude, and love consisted of love which had any definite object. The spiritual attachments, which are classed by the respondents as religious, 
have apparently become so complex and abstract that they take the form of contemplation and reverence. The line of growth in regard to feeling was further studied by separating the cases into age groups and comparing the prominence of the different types of feelings among those groups. The feelings which show the most distinct increase with age are dependence, reverence, oneness with God, and faith. The increase of the sense of dependence, for example, is represented in the following series of figures, which are the percentages of the persons in each group who describe their religious attitude in terms of this feeling. 13, 27, 27, 33, 50. The advance with years among the men is not so clearly marked. It should be noted of these four groups of feelings, which tend to increase during mature life, that three of them, namely dependent sense of oneness and faith, are those which were carried over from childhood. The fourth one, reverence, also has its counterpart then in the sense of fear, the former being apparently the irradiation into a more spiritualized form of the latter. It is safe to say, provided the cases we are studying are typical, that the line along which religion grows, when represented in terms of feeling, is expressed as dependence, reverence, sense of oneness with God and faith. These feelings represent the religious attitude which is not only carried over from childhood to maturity, but which increases with advancing years. They all express relation between the self and the larger life outside. This bears out the conclusions reached in the last chapter while discussing the nature of religious beliefs. Both feelings and beliefs indicate that the bottom truth of religion is that which centers about the relationship of the human being with God. It is a fact of no little interest that the number of religious feelings expressed increases in a marked way with age. The frequency in each age group is shown in the following diagram. During late adolescence, it is evident that the number is relatively very small. About the end of adolescence, they have increased, however, to almost the highest point reached, which is in the year group from 40 years and over. Thus, in terms of feeling, we find a definite transition period at the end of adolescence. It is explainable by the fact that the latter adolescence is the nascent period for readjustments. By summing up the number of beliefs expressed in Table 28 on page 320, it is evident that the number of beliefs among the latter adolescents is nearly as great as that during any of the years following. Among the males, the number of beliefs between 20 and 25 is even greater than the number between 25 and 30, which exactly contradicts the line of growth in feeling. While the number of feelings increase from 95 to 165, the number of beliefs decrease in about the same ratio. This point at which the transition occurs coincides with that which was designated as the age of reconstruction and marks the transition from a rational point of view of the world to a life of action. Adolescence is a period, as has been noticed, of great instability and uncertainty. A new personality is just beginning to take shape and form habits of its own. Now, at this latter period, its point of view has become established and the person begins to live. Accompanying this change, there naturally arise those feelings which express an attitude which has already become vital to the person. The fact that during adolescence there are comparatively few specific religious feelings expressed does not necessarily mean that in some form they are not present. A truer interpretation, doubtless, is that not until as late as the period of reconstruction do they become differentiated and separated from one another out of the organic mass of feeling that is surging up during youth and take shape as specific, distinct feelings. Adolescence is an intensely formative period, and life does not take on its peculiar character until, say, the 25th year. When the four most dominant types of religious feeling are taken separately from the others and considered together, the peculiarities just noticed come out even more distinctly. There is a tendency for them either to culminate in frequency between the years 25 and 30, or to rise at that period to as great prominence as during any of the later years. They rise to the greatest prominence during these years of greatest human vitality. The groups of feelings represented as joy, spiritual exaltation, peace and joy, on the contrary, tend to culminate during the earlier and the latter years. This bears out the conclusion that those four types of feelings which stood out above the rest are the ones which more distinctly belong to a human life as its best. The number of persons in the Doubt and Reconstruction group who recorded specific feelings was greater than that of the gradual growth group by as much as the ratio of 10 to 7. This would seem to show that, with those whose religion has once become partially objective and faith has become reconstructed, 
religion is fully as vital as those whose growth has been uneventful. End of chapter 26. Chapter 27 of the Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27, Adult Life, Motives, and Purposes. The question was asked, what would you now be and do if you realized all your ideals of the higher life? The replies were full and apparently given with the greatest frankness. In the organization of the motives and purposes which inspire mature persons, we may hope to arrive at the most accurate picture, provided the respondents have been both honest and frank, of the trend of life from childhood toward maturity, and of the point or points toward which it is moving. In bringing the ideals together, they fall into several more or less distinct headings. These in turn seem to show in one way or another three great tendencies in growth. In the first place, there are those motives and purposes which have, for their end, the perfection and enlargement of the individual life, and which express the growth instincts that make for self-enlargement. Secondly, there are those motives, the purpose of which is to curb the individual life, and which express the tendency to hold in check the egoistic impulses that bring the individual out of harmony with social life. In the third place, there are the purposes that center in the life outside of the self. They are the social and altruistic impulses, and grow out of the recognition of the fact that the self is only a small part of the larger whole and that the individual will must be given up to subserve the interest of the organism of which it is a part. The present chapter will be devoted to a simple elucidation of those three classes of motives, the relationship they sustain among themselves, and their significance in religious development. The egoistic impulses show themselves in several different ways. The most prominent of these is the ideal of self-perfection, which seems to center in the biological instinct of realization of the fullest life. The way this shows itself is tersely illustrated in the following quotations. Female, where once I said, I want to be good, I now say, I want to develop, to improve, to grow strong. Female, my one motive is to grow, not especially spiritually, but every way. Female, I would live an honest, upright, beautiful, sincere life. Male, I would build up a pure and unselfish character. Male, I would lead such an open life that everybody would understand it and it would be so pure and true that all who saw it would want to be like it. The central thing in these impulses is that an ideal has been established, and that growth toward it has become an end in itself. A motive that is closely akin to the last is self-expression. Back of it is pleasure in activity. One gets the best glimpse of this impulse in the uncouth and naive form in which some of the young girls express it. One says, my ideal is to be a woman of thirty, beautiful in form and feature, to have wonderful power with my voice, to be very rich, and use all my wealth for doing good. Another says, if I realize my highest ideal, I would write a book like Thomas A. Kempis or Helen Hunt's Ramona. Among the older persons, this same impulse is found, but in a more refined form, and usually mingled with other motives. One man says, I would have a wide sphere of influence, provided the influence be for good. I desire to be loved, but am willing to be hated. A woman writes, If I realize my ideal, it would be nothing radically different. I would be a better wife and mother. I would be a tower of strength to be discouraged and suffering about me, and an inspiration to my friends to live a better life. The pleasure in doing and achieving is certainly one of the deepest instincts of human life. It is the same impulse that one sees in the play instincts of animals and in manifold activities of human beings, in which the activity is not directed toward a definite end, but is an outlet of the oversupply of stored-up energy. In the religious sphere, one finds the same instinct present, but expending itself in the direction of spiritual ends. Another motive, somewhat like the last two, is the impulse to know. A single sentence taken from each of several cases will be sufficient to illustrate this impulse. My ideal is to ascertain truth. I am striving to ground my faith on known laws. I would find all possible knowledge. A love of knowledge and a passionate zeal for right are central in my life. My highest purpose is to know nature, to be true to it, and to utilize it. Such instances occur most frequently between the years 20 and 25. It is natural that this should come at the most formative period of the rational life. 
In this respect, the present group bears a close similarity to the one just above. That was an expression of the pleasure of activity in a general way, while underneath the impulse to know is the pleasure in self-expression along the intellectual line. This differs from the last two in being egocentric. The last two expressed the expenditure of energy without being actuated by personal advantage, while the impulse to know represents the instinct to make conquest of the world and work it over as an individual possession. It is a psychical instinct which is analogous on the physiological side to the food-getting instinct. This ends that class of impulses which tend toward the enlargement of self. It is a fact of considerable significance that almost never is a distinctly egocentric impulse mentioned as a religious motive. The nearest approach to it is the pleasure in intellectual conquest of the world noted above. There are, to be sure, two or three solitary instances of impulses in which the advantage of the individual seems to be the spring of action. For example, a woman says, My one thought is to lead my children aright, and to be joined hereafter to those who have gone on before. There is but one other instance in which the desire for future happiness, a selfish impulse put off a little into the future, is acknowledged as a religious motive. One other person says, I would live so that people would think of me as having helped other people. The fewness of instances of this sort is so conspicuous that it emphasizes the fact that immediate personal ends are almost never present as a religious ideal. The counterpart of the general class of motives just described are those which tend to the curbing of the egoistic impulses. They imply that certain ones in the complex of self-assertive instincts have become disproportionate to the rest and demand being held in check. They show the necessity of lopping off and plucking out exaggerated and harmful tendencies of self-activity which make the highest personal or social perfection possible. The person has gained the power of standing outside his life and judging it, of feeling within himself the strong racial impulses that are likely to rupture the unity of his own being. These motives are shown in the craving for meekness, patience, sobriety, justice, honesty, cheerfulness, personal purity, and self-control. They are the ones most frequently mentioned. A number of them are shown together in the following instance of a man of 22 who says, My highest purpose is to overcome the imperfections of youth, to renounce worldly ambition. I have an ardent desire to be pure and to attain a common sense, patient, and self-sacrificing life. I have now a chance to become rich, but it would mean spiritual death. The demand for curbing egoistic instincts in one way or another works itself over into the abstract ideal of self-abnegation. In its extreme form, this ideal is that expressed in the aesthetic severities that at one time were regarded as among the highest virtues. It is sometimes expressed in religious songs as, for example, Oh, to be nothing, nothing, only to lie at his feet. In the records before us, the ideal of self-abnegation is not found in any instance in which it is held entirely apart from that of self-perfection or of helpfulness to others. The following extracts will illustrate. Female, I would forget self entirely and spend my life in an unobtrusive way in order to make the world better. Female, I would give up everything for others and not count anything dear for the sake of doing good. Male, my highest purpose is the utter abandonment of self for the welfare of others. The way in which this becomes an instinct and tends to establish itself as an abstract ideal is illustrated in the case of a woman who writes, If I could only love my neighbor as myself, but that is a long way off, I fear. This illustrates the impulse reduced to the second power. There is not so much a desire to help others as there is a desire for the desire. One source of this detached motive is doubtless to be found in the fact that society sets certain standards of conduct and so awakens the impulse in the individual to attain those standards before he has come upon them spontaneously himself. This fact explains frequently reoccurring instances like the following. If I could attain my ideal, it would be to have a stronger desire to save souls for Christ. This leads us to consider the third large group of motives, those in which the end of conduct is found in society and in the spiritual life of which the person is a part. The transition to this point of view shows itself in three groups of ideals. In the first place, there are the motives in which the social instinct is especially strong in which the end is the welfare of society rather than of the individual. 
They take shape in some form of helpfulness to others. Phew, my ideal would be realized by a person who could be described by the one word, unselfish. Female, I would bring great happiness to all with whom I am brought in contact. Female, I would like to do favors for people, even for those I do not care for. Male, my highest desire is to make others happy by administering to their needs. Male, my chief purpose is to work with God to bring it about, that good may fall at last to all. The same impulse, in a more abstract and spiritualized form, is expressed as the love and service of God. This is shown in such sentences as these. I would think of God and do good for His glory. My one purpose is to do what God desires. I have a deep desire to promote God's work. My ideal is to love God and serve Him better. These last two groups of motives are different from the self-perfection and self-expression ones in that they seek a more specific object, which object is found outside of immediate personal interests. Another impulse which likewise centers outside the limits of oneself is a desire for oneness with God. Female, I would grow nearer God by every thought and action. Female, my chief purpose is to find God in every part of his universe. Male, I would get more and more in harmony with God's laws. Male, my desire is to fulfill God's purpose in me as a child of his. Underlying this is the instinct for companionship. The same thing seems to underlie, although in an unexpressed form, the desire to help others. These all seem to have their birth in awakening of the social instinct. The relative prominence of some of these groups of motives is shown in Table 30. The numbers represent the percent of all the persons giving ideals who mention the various ones. Foremost in frequency of all the ideals is helpfulness to others. It is mentioned nearly twice as often as any other one. For the sake of comparison, we shall combine the motives helpfulness to others, oneness with God and service of God, and call them for convenience the altruistic group. We shall likewise combine those ideals which center about self-perfection, self-expression, and the desire for knowledge, and call them the self-enlargement group. It is evident that the former class somewhat exceeds the latter numerically. To the altruistic may fairly be added also those whose object is the curbing of self, since that is one of the clearest conditions of transferring the center of interest from the self to the life outside of it. The inference is according that the altruistic group of motives is a far more powerful factor in adult life than the ideal of self-enlargement which perhaps arose earlier in racial development. It would be unfair to say that the trend of life is simply away from the self-enlargement motives toward the altruistic. As a matter of fact, the evidence is pretty clear that both the self-enlargement and altruistic groups increase with years. If we separate the cases into age groups, as we have been accustomed to do heretofore, the frequency of the two classes of motives in the different years is shown in the following diagram. In the case of the women, there is clearly an advance with years in respect to both types of motives. They will appear to be supplementary ideals that run parallel. As the years advance, life is given over more and more, not only to doing more, but to being more. It increases in fullness itself, and progressively enters into fuller and fuller relationships with the life outside of it. It is noticeable that both groups of motives decrease among the men with years. The same thing we found to be true in regard to the number of religious feelings expressed by them. The explanation of this seems to be that the ideals among the males are more keenly appreciated and consequently more often recorded during the earlier years than during the latter. During the twenties, when these instincts are being awakened to becoming worked over into the personality as part of it, they have greater worth to consciousness than after they have become habitual. That the increment is more constant among women is in line with what we have noticed repeatedly that they develop later on the spiritual side than do men in those respects which concern their conscious activity and that they are furthermore more constant and even in their line of development than men. The point to be noticed in this connection is that the altruistic motives are more frequent in each instance than are the self-enlargement motives. And if we should take the women as a type, both the groups of ideals increase constantly with years. There are some lines of evidence which seem conclusive that the trend of life is more and more towards altruism. In the record of childhood faults, records which are pretty fully given by the respondents, Selfishness is greater than any other item among the girls and stands second among the boys. Taking all the faults which may be classed as distinctly egoistic, 
such as jealousy, anger, covetousness, pride, stealing, and the like, we find them to foot up 70% among the girls and 72% among the boys of all the childhood faults mentioned. While these faults do not represent the religious cast of childhood, they nevertheless show these propensities which are strong and away from which growth tends. If we notice among the adult motives the prominence of those which center about the curbing of these same egocentric propensities, and that in only about 3.5% of the cases does self-interest in any form appear, if we notice further that the most prominent group of motives in adult life is the altruistic, it shows conclusively that from childhood to maturity the trend of life has been persistently away from the self-assertive, egocentric instincts toward those which are society-centered and God-centered. Another evidence that this is the common trend is found in the frequency in individual records with which there is a definite struggle to attain life in which self-interest shall be swallowed up in the life of the whole. We find persons, especially in the younger years, hammering away in one way or another at the limits which shut the personality in and trying to break over them and escape. One young woman of 20 says, I would like to be good and true, through and through, with pure motives and thinking only of God and doing good for His glory. I wish I were not conceited. I should like never to think of self at all. I should like to be a foreign missionary. A woman of 74 who had been actuated during earlier life by the ideal self-perfection says of her latter development, which came when she was 43, I got out of the prison of self and took my stand in the objective universe. She further writes, speaking of her purposes, I would work out the welfare of the race, not with fear and trembling, but with serene hope and assurance. A woman of 22 says, I would receive every trouble, disappointment, pain, and temptation as a true opportunity and blessed occasion of dying to self and of entering into fuller fellowship with my self-denying, suffering Savior. I would recognize with delight all generous, beautiful actions and all good qualities, even of my bitterest opponents. This statement bears in it the evidence of a previous struggle to break down the limitations of self. Christ, to her mind, who clearly represents her ideal of attainment, is pictured as a self-denying, suffering Savior. In the desire to recognize the good qualities of her bitterest opponents, there is evidence that a barrier has been surmounted, and with no little difficulty, and that this has carried her life on to a considerable distance in the direction it has come. Sure enough, when we come to examine the case, we find it to be a person whose life during earlier years had been filled with intense struggles. She says, They grew out of selfishness and jealousy. Nature had favored my sisters with powers and attainment which excelled my own. This aroused in me most bitter feelings against God and His injustice to me. I became unruly and unlovable. I finally realized that I needed more than human help. It drew me to seek peace in the religious life. My real change of character began when I was 16. I took a class in Sunday school, sang in the choir, and set up ideals and made great struggles to live up to them. While there are many instances in the records before us of growth away from the self-perfection ideal towards the altruistic, there are no counts of a development in the opposite direction. It is safe to lay it down with a high degree of emphasis that in this growth from that class of motives, which center in self towards those which find their spring of action in the organized life outside of the self, we have one of the most fundamental lines of development. Usually we find them existing side by side, as in the following instance recorded by a woman of 38. I would be just myself, only with more patience, less selfishness, greater sense of God's friendliness to me, and arrive at the true union of the service of God and man. One sees in this case the fusion of the self-enlargement, self-abnegation, and altruistic motives. The ideal striven after is often found in a person whose life is admired. A girl writes, If I realized my ideal, I would be just like my mother, making everyone happy and doing all for the glory of God. The personality of Christ is frequently the embodiment of the ideal. Female, my highest aim is to follow Christ's teaching. Female, I am trying to follow Christ's life as nearly as I can in all its glorious self-abnegation, its wondrous purity and marvelous helpfulness. Male, I have no definite ideal aside from Christ. This type bears close kinship both to the self-expression group of motives and to those which strive after oneness with God. If we glance at the growth from childhood to youth, 
and on through maturity, we find in it a constant element running throughout, namely that factor which is the outgrowth of the deep-seated racial instinct of self-preservation. In childhood, we find a propensity for self-assertion and self-indulgence. Among the childhood faults which were mentioned, these were frequent. Sexual temptations stand first among the evils from which the boys have grown and are striving still to be free themselves. Other forms of fault of this type are drinking, stubbornness, sauciness, lying, willfulness, revengefulness, and ill temper. These are all branches running out this way and that from the instincts of self-preservation, self-defense, and self-enlargement. In mature life we find these transformed and spiritualized into the impulse to be all that it is in one's power to become a spiritual being, to exercise one's fullest power, to conquer and work over into one's own life the most possible of the intellectual and spiritual worlds. We find that the impulses toward self-expression, thus spiritualized and transformed into a religious motive, not only persists through the rest of life, but even increases. This, then, seems to be one of the great streams of religious development, to give those deeper racial instincts which are consistent with self-development and the development of society the fullest possible expression and gradually to transform and enlarge them into spiritual forces. Running parallel with this is another line of growth which is likewise constant throughout life. Indeed, it is not only the accompaniment, but the very condition of the tendency we have just noticed. It is the exercise of the curbing or regulative impulse which keeps the egoistic instincts within their proper range and in harmonious relationships with each other. The fact that the egoistic impulses in childhood, when overemphasized, are described as faults, showing that they are that way from which growth tends. In most instances, the way in which and the time at which these were set aside is given by the respondents. The prevalence of the sense of sin during adolescence, occurring as it does in the majority of the cases, whether there has been actual waywardness or not, is doubtless a complex of the same impulse. All the little imperfections are asserting themselves and are felt as an organic tendency. Along with the dawning of rational and spiritual insight, one gains the power to look back on these and to feel a higher life, which could only be attained by the overcoming and crushing out of the complex of tendencies that make up the imperfect self. So that, in a very true sense, the whole adolescent stress may be viewed as a clash between the higher and lower selves in which the crisis is brought about through the activity of this curbing and regulative impulse. We have found that this continues throughout adult life and expresses itself in many virtues such as patience, honesty, purity, self-control, and the like, each of which becomes transparent and shows beneath it some impulse trying to assert itself. During maturity, this motive becomes complex and refined and is shown in the abstract ideal of self-abnegation. Mr. Marshall, in his analysis of religion from the biological standpoint, arrives at a similar conclusion in regard to this element of religion. He says, The function of religion, which lies back of its ceremonial, is the suppression of the force of individualistic elemental impulses in favor of those which have higher significance. Again, he says, It will appear upon examination that the various groups of religious expression which we shall examine tend to produce a suppression of individualistic reaction and lead us to listen for the guiding voices within us. That direction of religious development first noticed above, which concerns a transition from the egoistic point of view to that which regards the life outside as the center of activity, is in reality simply a transition from youth to adult life. It represents the second great step in the line of growth from childhood towards maturity. In order to complete the picture, it should be borne in mind that the central fact which marked the transition from childhood was the birth of religious self-consciousness, a necessary step in the acquisition of the ability to refer spiritual experiences to the ego and to appreciate religion from within. Back of this was the life of childhood, in which the world was looked upon purely as an external fact. There was not yet the ability to appreciate the self as even a factor in its own experiences. This has become one of the most commonly recognized facts in regard to childhood experience. Miss Miles, for example, in her study of reminiscent experiences says, The predominant direction of the mind of the child is shown by the fact that 70% attention to the outside world and only 27 to self. 
Even when the child thinks of himself, he is more apt to regard himself as a victim of sensation than as an agent in bringing things to pass. In our study the religion of childhood, it was evident that the child's religious experiences were viewed as objective. God was a being external to itself and above it, dwelling in the sky. The most pronounced feature of its religion was that which involved its relationship to this being, expressed usually in the most concrete and objective terms. The most marked and characteristic of adolescence, on the contrary, was the breaking away from religion as something external. New life wells up within the consciousness of the youth, and this either surges above the threshold of consciousness as a clearly appreciated spiritual product or makes itself felt as opposing currents of life in the undefined sphere of feeling. Out of it all is born the clear consciousness of a self, which is an organ for the expression of spiritual life. And now comes the third step, which we have already noticed, in which the person's consciousness of the world order is aroused, and he appreciates the relationships existing between part and part, feels that his own personality is only a small fraction of the larger life. He transfers the center of his activity to the life of the whole. His most prominent motive is to live in the lives of other persons and to lose his life in love and service, in unison with God. There are, consequently, in this aspect of religious growth, three great steps in development. First, that in which religion is viewed externally. Second, that in which the center of activity is one's own personality. And thirdly, that in which the center of activity again becomes objective. The growing individual tends to obtain a knowledge of himself as a spiritual personality and to gain control of himself as a unit in society and then to give himself back again as an organic part of the world life. End of chapter 27「Part three: The Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three: Comparison of the lines of growth with and without conversion. Chapter 28, The Line of Growth Following Conversion We finally require to bring together the most salient facts and principles adduced in the foregoing chapters and see them in their relationships. Before doing this, we shall turn to a brief survey of the latter development of those persons who have experienced conversion. The conclusions already reached will be either verified or limited as laws of growth of universal application by what we find true in regard to this other class of persons. When we have ascertained the likenesses and differences between these two types of religious growth, we shall be able to turn with somewhat fuller knowledge to a concise statement of the line of development from childhood toward maturity. In taking up the study of those lines of growth which persons pass through after conversion, we shall hope not only to arrive at a more complete comprehension of the trends of religious development, but shall at the same time have a means of determining more adequately than was possible in the analysis of the crisis itself, the nature of conversion. We shall apply to it this test. What is the effect of conversion on after-development? What new factors are turned loose in consciousness which vary the line of growth from that through which persons seem to pass whose development has been more gradual? For example, are these persons freed from the storm and stress, struggle, anxiety, and doubt that so frequently attend the progress of those whom we have just been studying? Toward the end of the individual development, do they come out with the same general attitude toward life and with a similar appreciation of spiritual things? In the comparison of the two groups, there are some conclusions that we can safely leave behind us as fairly well established. We have found that conversion, viewed simply from the standpoint of its immediate significance, was in no sense a unique phenomena, but that, in its most essential aspect, it was a sudden outburst of religious life and awakening to spiritual insight. It has its correspondence in gradual growth. The character of the experiences in the one group and in the other shade off into each other by imperceptible gradations and correspond in the time at which they occur. The sense of sin and that of imperfection we have found to attach themselves to no theological doctrine but to be the natural outgrowth of the developmental processes which are going on during adolescence. The result which seemed to be attained in conversion and that which was working itself out during adolescence among those persons who have not experienced conversion, are at bottom essentially the same, namely the birth of human consciousness on a higher spiritual level. This is attended by the awakening of a fuller and keener self-consciousness, and at the same time by the birth of a social instinct, which leads the person to reach out and feel his life 
one with that of the larger social, institutional, and spiritual worlds. With these likenesses in view, the question narrows itself down mainly to this. To what extent is the result which seems to be reflected in conversion fully reached? Is it simply the opening up of an ideal that has to be actualized, a vivid foretaste of a life that may become one's own, or does the person actually attain the new life at the instant of conversion and immediately begin living on an indefinitely higher plane of existence? Unfortunately, the persons whose experiences we studied in Part 1 were not asked for their post-conversion development. However, Miss Fanny E. Johnston, a student in my seminary, has brought together 100 autobiographies of persons who have experienced conversion and has made, under my direction, a special investigation of the line of post-conversion growth. These records were written in response to a special list of questions which call out into considerable detail the experiences at conversion, those immediately following and the development since conversion. The cases used are in most respects comparable to those used in the study of conversion itself in Part 1. They are usually persons reared in favorable religious surroundings and are well distributed as to vocation and condition in life. Just as in the groups we have already studied, there are rather too many college-bred people among the number for them to be entirely representative. There is a single marked difference, that of the cases we are now studying, Somewhat more than one-half belong to the Methodist denomination. As for the remainder, there is a good sprinkling of nearly all the other Protestant sects. The nature of the conversion phenomena itself in these cases does not differ in any respect which demands special consideration from those which furnish the basis of the study of conversion in Part 1. The persons usually experienced at conversion the same sense of joy, peace, and contentment as did those we have studied heretofore. After conversion, they almost invariably set out with new and high resolves. Their attitude towards life had been transformed. In the presence of the new life, old habits had apparently passed away. New interests and enthusiasms had been awakened. Motives and purposes had been purified. Higher ideals aroused. Frequently, the personality seemed entirely changed. But when we follow up the events which mark the trend of life after conversion, the crucial question we have just raised is almost directly answered. For we find that nearly all the persons are sooner or later beset with the same difficulties that ordinarily attend adolescent development. Indeed, the percentage of those difficulties in this group of persons is slightly greater than in the case of those whose growth was not attended by conversion. While in this latter group, there were 80% of the women and 89% of the men who had storm and stress or doubt. In the cases we are now studying, there are 93% of the women and 77% of the men who had similar experiences. The immediate conclusion which might be drawn from these statistics is that conversion fails of its purpose and has no marked effect on after development. Before we settle on an interpretation, however, of its significance, we must look more minutely at the nature of experiences which follow conversion as compared with those which occur under other conditions. We must likewise take into consideration that we are dealing with a class of persons who are temperamentally different. We have found that they are more susceptible to external influences and more impressionable by suggestion. Consequently, we have to keep constantly before our minds the question as to how these persons would have developed in the absence of conversion. Presumably, they would naturally have shown greater irregularities than those who were less open to impressions. If we proceed to consider the nature of the struggles which follow conversion, we find at the same time many similarities and many differences between these and the usual adolescent difficulties. In Table 31 are shown some of the types of the post-conversion struggles, together with the percentages of their frequency in each of the sexes. In the first place, we should notice that complete relapses are few, whereas periods of inactivity and indifference are numerous. In fact, with women, these latter are the rule. Those experiences classed in the table as relapses correspond fairly to complete alienation in the cases studied in Part 2, whom we shall, for convenience, call the non-conversion group. They represent the tendency for persons to feel themselves aloof from the religious interests of other people. If we recall the fact that more than a third of the non-conversion cases have passed through more or less definite period of alienation, and note that only 6% of the conversion group have completely relapsed, we have one of the most important differences between the two types. While the religious difficulties 
which follow conversion are rather more frequent than those which otherwise accompany adolescent growth the instances are far less numerous among the conversion group of complete alienation from conventional standards in other words the persons who have passed through conversion having once taken a stand for the religious life tend to feel themselves identified with it no matter how much their religious enthusiasm declines the periods of inactivity and indifference seem to be the outgrowth of a natural tendency of human interest to ebb and flow nervous energy when directed vigorously in a certain way completely expends itself and must then have a period of recuperation rhythms in the supply of available energy are coming to be a universally recognized phenomena if with the proper apparatus one tries continuously to lift a weight with one finger at successive intervals of a second one can lift it to a less and less distance until finally it cannot be lifted at all but suddenly the ability to perform the work is almost fully regained and it continues to come and go at intervals the same fluctuations are true in regard to the higher mental activities one of the stock experiments on fluctuations of the attention illustrates in a concrete way the general principle if a watch is placed at such a distance that the ticking can just be heard with strained attention the sound of the ticking comes and goes with rhythmical regularity the commonly accepted explanation is that the nerve cells involved in the act of attention must have time to recuperate when a cell is exploded it must have time to recover it cannot explode again until it has been recharged that is why the attention is interrupted why we can attend only for a few seconds at a time the spurts of the attention wave correspond to the successive discharges of cortical cells in this instance we have a specific illustration of what is true for any sort of mental activity spells of depression are likely to come at the close of a very busy day with the breaking of a fever the physician has to guard against a sudden variation to the opposite extreme in these well-known facts we have doubtless a parallel to the variation in religious feeling almost invariably the subjects who are active in religious work have ups and downs in their degree of religious enthusiasm one of them seems to have had for several years wave-like fluctuations of religious interest at pretty regular intervals of two years another a woman of forty writes my religious experience has been a succession of waves of pulsations following each other in quite regular order indifference and inactivity are always followed by self-examination at such times disgust is stronger than regret then follows the effort to regain the lost ground and as a result arise renewed enthusiasm heightened activity and fresh devotion to religious work but it seems impossible to hold myself to the high tide mark in her personal attachments this person shows the same fluctuations as in her religious attitude one is doubtless to look for the explanation of such instances as the following in the rhythms in the supply of nervous energy a woman who had been converted at fourteen who had before conversion had struggles with an uncontrollable temper and at the time of conversion wept and felt very joyous says of her latter development i had a period of introspection at seventeen caused by over enthusiasm religion was on my mind so constantly that my nervous system gave way i had a feeling of despair and longed to die it is the rule and to be expected that after the great enthusiasm conversion there should follow a decline the duration of the enthusiasm and the period of the ebb of feeling vary greatly with different individuals this seems to be conditioned by the nervous constitution of different persons it has been found by experiment that scarcely two persons have the same fatigue curve some are exhausted quickly with slight expenditure while others have great endurance under great exertion so in religious feeling the enthusiasm aroused at conversion continues according to individual differences all the way from a few hours to several years sometimes the rise and fall in religious feeling seems to attach itself to other natural rhythms one person reports that during f five successive years he was awakened to religious enthusiasm during the winter which declined in the summer mailing hansen has established the fact of a yearly rhythm and growth in his tests on children he ascertained that physical growth is the greatest during the autumn months less from december to the end of april and that there is a minimal period from the end of april to the end of july almost the whole weight gained from december to april is lost during the minimal period the rise in religious feeling during the winter may be conditioned 
in part by the more rapid metabolic changes going on in the organism at that time. There is an unconscious recognition of the principle in the fact that religious revivals were almost always held during the winter. The true understanding of so-called backsliding, a very common phenomena, is to be found in part in the principle of the natural fluctuations of religious feeling. In the first publication of the study of conversion, an attempt was made to classify the cases according to their degree of performance. That has been found since to be a futile effort. It is more fair to say that the instances arranged themselves in a series from the few at the one extreme in which there was complete relapse to those at the other in which there was a slight ebb of religious ardor. Although a large proportion of the respondents admit to a lack of constancy in the warmth of their enthusiasm, there are almost none, about 6%, of these who did not maintain at the same time that their religious status was little affected. One woman, who reports that through the influence of a skeptical husband, her religious activity for a time completely ceased, and she was thrown into a period of indifference and introspection, maintains that her faith never waned. A man of 35, who, after his conversion at 19, had passed through both doubt and storm and stress, says, I have never given up in the least degree my religious faith. From what has been said, it would appear that the effect of conversion is to bring with it a changed attitude toward life, which is fairly constant and permanent, although the feelings fluctuate. It is as if the new nerve connections in the association centers of the brain, with which the personality is now identified, had become somewhat permanently fixed. But the flow of the nerve energy were intermittent, and sometimes were not sufficient in intensity to awaken a simultaneous response in the sympathetic and vasomotor systems. In such times of low tension, the nervous discharges are sufficient to make themselves felt in consciousness, but not intense enough to overflow into the motor areas. One is accordingly not only different, but inactive in the direction of the new life. We must not make too much of the principle of fluctuations of feeling. However, as an explanation of the difficulties that follow conversion, there are other causes equally as apparent. An important one among these is the persistence of old habits, which for the time have lost their force and have become hidden from view in the presence of the new lines of activity. When, after a time, the newly acquired enthusiasm has partly died away, these old habits reassert themselves. From the table we observe that more than one-fourth of the women and about one-third of the men are disturbed after conversion by the persistence of old habits. This general type of experience is well illustrated in the following case of a man converted at twenty. His awakening was sudden and spontaneous after several years of conflict with evils and imperfections and aspiration toward a higher life. In describing the feelings immediately following conversion, he says, I had a liberty, a freedom, a joy that I had not before. My general health at once improved. I at once began to study the best books, to seek for the best things, plan to be something for God. I read the Bible with more delight. I wanted others to know that I was a Christian. I worked hard, played hard, did everything with enthusiasm and reason for the glory of my Master. I thought all sin was killed. I thought I could be tempted with anything and yet not feel the temptation. I thought sin would never live again in me. I loathed impurity. My desires and aspirations were for the purest of the pure. Writing of his present experience, some ten years later, he says, But I have found since, and find now, that sin is very much alive, and I have a constant struggle to keep it down. Laziness, sluggishness, low groveling desires, the old impure images and fancies, the remembrance of the past still haunts me. I have never doubted that a change then took place in my life, although I have doubted the explanation of it. The condition underlying the necessity of having to fight the old battles over again is clear. The habits of early life, which have cut out deep channels in the nervous system and have left their impression there, are still easy outlets for the discharge of nervous force, provided it is not drafted off along new channels. The moment the enthusiasm declines and the tension which holds life steady and firm in the newly acquired channels is relaxed, one falls back into the old modes of activity. This aspect of the adolescent conflict represents the incongruity between the old nerve tracks which correspond to the habits that have at one time been forsaken and the new lines of nervous activity which have not yet become thoroughly established. As we shall see, the tendency 
is for the effort to continue until the new set of neural habits that correspond to the conduct of life on a spiritual plane have become so deeply ingrained that life expresses itself naturally and easily through them. When this is accomplished, the old habits have lost their force. If this physiological point of view is a true one, it should bring to our mind with the greatest emphasis some points of practical importance in regard to the post-conversion period. The nerve tracts involved in the old life are perhaps structurally as much a part of the person's makeup just after conversion as are his arms or legs. They may cease to exist as functioning organs in either of two ways. They may be completely taken up into the new centers and coordinated with them, or left empty because nervous energy is all expended in other ways. In either case, the old neural channels are still there to assume their former functions the moment the new are off guard. The old may cease, but only by becoming hopelessly enslaved and subordinated to the new, or by withering up and dying for want of exercise. The futility of it expecting a new insight to become permanent, however genuine it may be, without following it up with conduct that works the new life over into neural habit is apparent on the face of it. The new must be drilled in as inevitably as was the old. The Salvation Army has caught the secret of it. They set the convert, by every means available, to the task of cultivating nervous discharges in the brain areas connected with the spiritual life. He is to make the higher life habitual. He is to get it ingrained into his very structure. He pounds it in while beating a drum. He walks it in while marching. He sings it, talks it, acts it out in deeds of service. And all this so persistently that it is finally a part of himself. He has finally cast out the evil with the good. Another form of adolescent struggle which is given in the table is that due to a sense of incompleteness. It occurs in 33% of the women and 15% of the men. It is a phenomenon which bears the same general interpretation as does that of the struggle with habits. It is a general and organic experience which habit is the specific. The struggle with habits is the recognition of the conflict between some bit of the old life and the new. The feeling underlying the sense of incompleteness is that life in toto is evil and sets itself in conflict with the ideals awakened at the time of conversion. It should be noticed that the struggles with habit are more common with the men, while the sense of incompleteness is more than twice as frequent among the women. This is in accordance with the sex differences which have been pointed out all the way along. The sense of incompleteness, or the struggle after an ideal, which follows conversion, is not different in kind from that which precedes conversion, nor from what we have found to belong to adolescent development among the non-conversion group. The fact of its prominence after conversion helps to demonstrate that conversion, which usually comes in early adolescence, has openly opened up the possibility of real development on the spiritual plane. Conversion is most frequently an awakening to some truth, but is a truth which is yet only perceived and has not yet been worked out over into conduct. It remains for the person to make at least a fraction of the ideal a part of himself to grow towards it. This seems to be the function of the several years of adolescent instability, to enable the youth to keep on trying in the direction of the higher life until it is made habitual. The storm and stress experiences which follow conversion are not different, in kind from those which we have already become familiar and need no further illustration. The point of interest for us is that they occur even more frequently by about 10% in each of the sexes among the persons who have experienced conversion than among the others. One may look for the causes underlying this difference in several directions. In the first place, it seems to be due to the fact that, as has already been pointed out, that the conversion group are persons who are more suggestible, more impressionable, and accordingly more liable to undergo mental crisis. The difference seems to be due in part likewise to the fact that at conversion, the ideal life and the past life are brought into definite conflict. There is a sharper cleavage between the higher and lower selves. An ideal is established which is more difficult to attain because it's great incongruity with the old life. The person is suddenly expected to identify himself with the conventional ways of the churches, which are at variance with his usual habits of life. It seems natural, if these causes obtain, that the conflict and friction in the adjustment of the life to the new standard 
should be greater in the case of the conversion type. While storm and stress is relatively more frequent after conversion than in the non-conversion group, doubts, on the other hand, are much less frequent. They occur in 38% of the women and 57% of the men. The fact that they are fewer seems to indicate that when the person has already publicly identified himself with religious matters, doubt and rejection is a more serious step. Also, that when the person is kept active in religious performance, there is not so great opportunity to stop and weigh matters of doctrine. Still, it should be observed that the percentages are large. They seem to indicate the difficulty of complete mental assimilation of religious doctrines. The young convert has usually given his assent to the theological teachings with which he is now identified in a purely emotional way and not as the result of having weighed them intellectually. In order to make them really his own, he must pass through the process which is involved in mental assimilation of any kind. He must hold them off and perceive them and weigh them and then accept them in so far as they can fit into his own mental makeup. This is the same mental procedure, usually extending through several years, which we found to belong normally to the period of adolescence, namely that the individual must appreciate and assimilate those modes of thought and life which belong to the social whole. We have now passed into review some of the characteristic difficulties that follow conversion, and found them to be exactly the same in kind, although there are some marked differences in degree as those which are experienced in the absence of conversion. We should notice one other marked similarity, that in both groups the spiritual difficulties are limited to about the same years. They come most frequently in the middle period of adolescence, during the late teens, less frequently in the early twenties, and almost never after thirty. In only six percent of the cases do the troubles intensify after twenty-five years of age. This is further evidence which tends to set adolescence off as a distinct stage in growth and to demonstrate that events of the particular nature we have found all along in the study of adolescence belong to this period, whether conversion occurs or not, that these experiences belong to adolescence was further borne out in this way. The number of conversions in both sexes were separated into two groups according to age. In the first group were included the females under 13 and males under 15, in the second group, those above these ages. This made a nearly equal number of males and females in each group. It was found that storm and stress and doubt occurred during adolescence with just about the same frequency among those who were converted early as among those whose conversion took place within the years of greater maturity. It appears that in either event, whether conversion comes early or late, it is the beginning of a process of growth. A first insight into a life which has to be appropriated and assimilated and worked over into conduct. This much is clear to the present point, that while the events that occur in the process of spiritual readjustment in the two types of growth are identical in character, the persons who experience conversion continue to feel themselves identified with religion to a greater degree. They are less likely to become alienated from it and to look upon it objectively as is shown in the infrequency of complete relapses and the relative fewness of skeptical doubts. Whether or not this is a wholesome tendency must be left until we come to consider the present status of the two groups. In still another respect, we find that the line of growth following conversion runs exactly parallel with that pointed out in Part 2. Here, likewise, we find a definite period of reconstruction, and, reviewing the cases in the rough, it appears that, while nearly all have had adolescent difficulties, at the time of making the records, all the respondents except three have arrived at a positive and constructive attitude toward life. Almost without exception, they have left their struggles behind them. Although there are doubts still of certain things that other people regard as essential, they give no especial anxiety. The right to question beliefs is, on the contrary, often regarded as a condition of arriving at truth. For example, one man says, I have tested my hold on truth by reason and experience. I hold every belief subject to revision. Nothing is outside the sphere of doubt and inquiry. I never consider a matter settled until its truth seems irresistible. The definite age at which reconstruction occurs does not come out so clearly here as in the former study on account of the fewness of cases. From what has been said, however, it is clear that it is here again not later than 25.
It is even more marked in this class than in the former, judging by the larger percentage who have finally entered upon a positive stage. The instinct of sociality is greater in this class of persons whose life is usually conducted in close conjunction with organized institutions. The fact of having to work along with people brings with it the necessity of adapting one's own religious conceptions to those of society. One must either do this or stand aloof from one's fellows, and persons almost invariably choose the former alternative. Another influence which is strongly at work in bringing about the prayer reconstruction seems to be the psychological necessity of gaining a clear mental horizon. One cannot remain in uncertainty. There is, in the cases of a distinct working of the will to believe. One person says, faith is man's comprehensive duty. We occasionally find persons in the act of trying to reconstruct their faith. A woman converted at 16 says, I am doubtful of the truth of the 39 articles. I have a growing belief in the existence of God, who is a universal Father. I am trying again to believe in the divinity of Christ. In these people, then, who have passed through conversion, we have the same reconstruction process of growth illustrated that we found heretofore. This correspondence makes it appear a little more probable that it is a universal tendency in religious development that the period of adolescence should end by transition to a positive and active religious attitude. Since we have now learned that whether or not conversion has been experienced, persons tend to pass through the same general line of growth, we come to the question whether or not they merge into mature life with the same general religious conceptions and attitudes. A partial answer to the question can be found by considering the beliefs, feelings, and ideals of the two groups. These three aspects of the adult religion of the conversion group were tabulated under the same headings which grew up in the study of the non-conversion cases. If we compare first the feelings, we find among the conversion cases the same emotions, but with these essential differences, the feelings which represent a sense of oneness with God and Christ and the Holy Spirit are far more common, and there is apparently greater subjectivity of feeling. These persons show to a less degree the feeling of humility and dependence, but this is no evidence of the absence of a sense of kinship between themselves and God, but rather that there is not an intellectual recognition of the relationship. There is more commonly than in the other group a sense of inward joy and satisfaction. Such forms of expressions as these are common. The Spirit beareth witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. We know that he abideth in us by the Spirit he hath given us. The most decided difference seems to be that in the conversion groups the range of feelings has become narrowed and intensified. There is to a greater degree inward assurance of a satisfactory personal experience. In the comparison of the beliefs of the two groups, there are some likenesses and differences that stand out clearly. In both, the beliefs center most often around three great questions of God, Christ, and immortality. The belief in God is mentioned with about the same frequency as in the other group. It is by far the most important of all the items. There is this difference, which the percentages do not show, that the conception of God is nearly always expressed in conventional language. The representation of God as mystery, as infinity, force, or life, or law, as the underlying reality of the world, conceptions which indicate that the person is in the process of gaining a first-hand appreciation of the God idea and assimilating it, almost never occur, although these conceptions were frequent among the non-conversion group. Twice as often do they describe their beliefs in terms of the Apostles' Creed. The belief in Christ is a somewhat more vital conception among the conversion cases by as much as the ratio of 51 to 43. The belief in immortality, if one were to judge by the frequency with which it is mentioned, is not so central, the ratio being 12 to 26. It seems often not to have been mentioned because it is so much a matter of course. This, however, does not sufficiently explain its absence. In the relative infrequency of skeptical doubts, the question seems not to have forced itself upon their notice. We saw in the previous discussion of adult beliefs that the immortality question got more and more consideration as a life problem as life advanced. It is a noteworthy fact that in the development of religions, the conception of immortality has arisen later than the theistic notions. A suggestive contrast between the two groups is that the conception of religion as a life within, which we found to represent the most central tendency in the growth 
in the non-conversion group does not appear so frequently here as a matter of belief. One would anticipate from the results of the comparison of the feelings that it would figure as one of the central conceptions. It is more a feeling than a rational cognition. This is in line with what we have been ascertaining. The process of intellectual assimilation is less among the persons who have passed through the conversion experience. In accordance with their constitutional and temperamental differences, they to a great extent feel their way. Storm and stress, as a sequel to conversion, we found to be more frequent, while doubts were fewer. If we notice a contrast between the two groups in regard to the other things which we found to be important elements in belief, religion as centering in scientific and philosophical conceptions, religion as a process of growth, and religion as concerned with conduct, we have ample evidence that this crucial difference obtains. These three types of feelings are all conspicuously absent among the conversion group. The ratio of the conception of religion as centering in scientific and philosophical conceptions in the two groups is 1 to 11, that of religion as a process of growth is 1 to 3, and that of religion as conduct is 1 to 5. The prominence of these items among the non-conversion group indicates that they are trying to reduce their world to a system and to solve their relation with it. They objectify religion sufficiently to see it in its time aspects and to appreciate it as a process of growth. They take into account a vital way the relationship to society and feel that right doing is a test of religion. The tendency among the conversion cases, on the contrary, seems to be to feel that they possess a definite relation with God and Christ without having so large concern about the intellectual comprehension of this relation. Among the more subjectified attitude, there is a higher degree of finality and all sufficiency in the experience. The idea of progression to an end towards which growth tends is taken less into account. They cognize their personal relationships less perfectly. Practical ethical matters appeal less to clear consciousness. This we shall find to be true also in the decision of their ideals. Nevertheless, the personal relationships are more strongly appreciated from the standpoint of intuitions. Nearly all the records of conversion experience speak of God in terms of his personal attributes. They picture him as a loving father who cares for his children, but less frequently than the other cases do they speak of him as a father or spirit or a being who inspires awe and reverence. In short, the conversion group approach religion more from the subjective emotional standpoint, but at the sacrifice of an intellectual comprehension of it, and of a rational appreciation of relationship they sustain to the world. Even more suggestive is the comparison of the ideals of the two groups. In the consideration of the ideals, we shall assume that they represent that which is most alive in consciousness. They indicate neither that which has already been perfectly assimilated, nor that which is entirely unattained, but rather the point at which growth is most rapid. A comparison of ideals is shown in Table 32. We find the same ideals expressed, but with variations in their relative prominence. Before proceeding to a general comparison of the two groups, there are some differences between the sexes which deserve notice. In the conversion group, the men express ideals more frequently than the women in every class, with single exception of gaining knowledge. In the non-conversion group, this relation tends to be reversed. This is especially true in the altruistic class of ideals. We found in Part 1 that conversion was a more living experience with men. That fact may account for the contrast. If we take into consideration that the effect of conversion was to awaken consciousness vigorously in the direction of the spiritual life. In comparing the groups of ideals and the two sets of persons, the altruistic seemed to be somewhat heightened by conversion, by as much as the ratio of 100 to 95. If the ideals centering in Christ, which, as we have seen, are partly altruistic, were added, the difference would be increased to that represented by the ratio of 139 to 110. We may invoke the principle just spoken of to explain this variance likewise. One immediate effect of the conversion we found to be to arouse the social and altruistic impulses. The other market effect of the conversion was to call forth an exalted self-consciousness in awakening to greater emotional activity. This is reflected among the ideals in the fact that the self-expression motive is far more frequent in the conversion cases. At the same time, the desire for knowledge and self-interest are somewhat greater in the non-conversion group. 
The greatest contrast between the two is in the regulative impulses. They are far more numerous among the non-conversion people. This falls in line with the distinction pointed out in discussing the beliefs. Those who have passed through conversion are much less concerned with matters of conduct. The conversion ideal, as usually held up, emphasizes complete self-mastery. The giving up of self wholly to the service of God. This is what we find reflected in the table. In the smaller number of regulative impulses, there is evidence that the old nature has been more completely eradicated. The fact that self-expression, love, and service of God, and the ideal as embodied in Christ's life, are greater implies that there has been a more complete birth on the spiritual plane. There is a more definite giving up of self, except as represented in the self-enlargement impulses of self-perfection and self-expression, and a more complete transferring of the center of activity to an objective standard. But the case has been made too strong. We must bear in mind that the conclusion just reached grows out of one aspect of the comparison of the two groups. One condition which clearly lies back of the contrast in the ideals is that the conversion group are temperamentally different. They are more emotional, they see things more in general and abstract terms, they are controlled less by rational insight. The small number of the regulative impulses may indicate simply self-forgetfulness in the presence of stirring emotions. The relative absence of the specific virtues may be the result of less skill in self-analysis. The difference between the two groups may be most comprehensively expressed in terms of the nervous system. The condition is as if in the conversion group the association centers in the cortex after having been awakened at conversion were now less completely coordinated with the lower than is the case among the non-conversion cases. There is accordingly greater subjectivity and immediacy of experience. The withinness of religion is appreciated as a matter of feeling and not as an intellectual comprehension. Rational insight, which involves the coordination and association of the lower brain areas through the higher, that is to say, which implies that the spiritual life shall be interpreted in terms of sensual experience, is relatively absent. The association centers are doubtless most directly evolved out of those activities which are connected with social organization. Accordingly, we have found that the social and altruistic impulses are the ones most vitally connected with the functioning of these brain centers. In both of the groups we are studying, these impulses are important elements in religion. Helpfulness to others is equally prominent in both groups. But, on the other hand, the conversion group is awakened more on the side of abstract ideals. Love and service of God and Christ are far more common. While, on the other hand, the non-conversion group are more concerned with the specific and practical aspect of the problem, that which involves the regulation of personal conduct in accordance with social demands. That such is the normal sequence of conversion, we shall have additional evidence in the next chapter when we come to the consideration of sanctification. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 in Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29, Sanctification. The religious experience, known in theological terms as sanctification, or the second work of grace, lends itself so readily to psychological analysis that it deserves a special consideration. Its chief value in our present discussion is that it shows in an emphasized form certain aspects of growth which have found both to follow conversion and also to occur in the religion of mature life of those who have not passed through conversion. In its usual designation, sanctification is regarded as a special act of the Holy Spirit by which one is, in a peculiar way, freed from sin and set apart for a holy life. For our purpose, we shall leave behind the theological content of the term, its distinction from regeneration and justification, the question as to whether it is a sudden experience or a process of growth and grace, and shall allow our conception of the experience to develop as it may out of the analysis of the records of their own experiences, as made by persons who have professed sanctification. Its relation to conversion and its significance in religious growth will appear as we proceed. One of my pupils, Dr. Ivan Deitch, succeeded in bringing together and organizing 51 records of sanctification. His list of questions was exhaustive enough, 
call out not only the immediate events centering around sanctification, but also the essential features of the life history of the respondents. He has kindly allowed me to use his tabulated results. The interpretation of the data is partly Dr. Deach's and partly my own. Before proceeding to a discussion of sanctification itself, we should stop a moment to look at the personnel of the respondents. As to age at the time of replying, they range from 20 to 77. Only five are below 30. The greater number are between 30 and 60. In respect to nationality, 23 are American, 11 English, 5 Scotch. Besides these, there are a few scattered ones. Just as in the study of the post-conversion development about one half of the Methodists, besides these, 14 belong to the Salvation Army, 9 are Baptists, 2 Christian Scientists, and 1 is a Unitarian, 35 are men, and 16 are women. Sanctification seems to bear throughout close relation to conversion. All but one of the 51 persons passed through conversion at some time previous to sanctification. 38 of the number experienced sudden conversion. Of the 100 persons whose post-conversion growth was followed in the last chapter, 14, not used in this section, had already, at the time of writing, gone on to sanctification. That is, it seems that sanctification is almost invariably preceded by conversion. These service considerations indicate that it is a step in one of the normal lines of growth which follow conversion. On the other hand, among the 237 persons studied in Part 2, none claim sanctification as a distinct step in growth, although many of the characteristics of adult religion among those persons bear, as we shall see, close kinship to the essential qualities of sanctification. There are several different views of sanctification among the Protestant churches. Two conceptions somewhat at variance are those which regard it, on the one hand, as a gradual development following upon regeneration, and on the other, as an instantaneous act. Those who hold the latter view are usually the ones who likewise believe that regeneration is a sudden, definite step, such as has been described in conversion. Of those who replied to the list of questions, 48 of the 51 were of this second class, and said that sanctification was an instantaneous event. This should be taken into account in the discussion which follows. It is obvious that these people are temperamentally similar to those studied in Part 1, except that they possess the peculiarities which distinguish the conversion group in even greater degree. Nearly half of the 51 cases report that outside of these two marked events in their development, they pass through periods of unusual exhilaration. More than a fourth had such periods frequently. As we proceed, we shall find evidences continually that the qualities of the sanctification phenomena are colored by temperamental conditions. While it would be desirable to have an equal number of those who profess sanctification as a result of gradual development, we may nevertheless expect to find the same essential elements in the process brought into clearer relief in the study of the sudden experience. When we come to consider the intimate nature of sanctification, its similarities to conversion appear on every hand. The distinctive things in the earlier experience are even emphasized in the later. Both events in the lives of the persons we are studying usually come suddenly. Both mark a transition from a lower to a higher state of perfection. Both are preceded by a period of longing and discontent, of striving after satisfaction. Before sanctification, this discontent is similar to the conviction period before conversion, but as a rule, with the difference that the sense of sin has given place to a feeling of incompleteness and imperfection. These extracts from the sanctification records will illustrate. I felt a deep inward conviction of the need of something from God for myself and felt God's call to complete union with Him. I felt I was living below the experience God would have me attain. With others, I had been earnestly seeking for complete consecration for a number of years. I had been troubled and distressed for some time. It was a period of longing and determination to lead a holy life. The ideal life towards which the person is striving is more distinctly present in consciousness than was true before conversion. The effect of conversion seems to be, as we saw in Part 1, to bring a possible righteous life and the old imperfections into sharp contrast. There is the same persistent struggle after the higher life as we found there, but in an exaggerated form. The final attainment of the desired experience is conditioned, just as was conversion, by faith, self-surrender, and consecration. This was mentioned by 23 of the respondents as an important element of the realization of the second experience. One of them writes, I had been told that implicit faith was a prerequisite. 
with positive belief came the experience. Another, who had tried long in vain, says, Then I went on my knees alone, determined to get the victory. I made a complete consecration of all I had and all I was to God. I felt that God had accepted my offering and that all sin was taken out of my heart. Perfect self-surrender seems to be an even more inevitable condition of sanctification than of conversion. One man describes visibly how the Lord tested him with one demand after another, and the experience came only after he had expressed his willingness to renounce everything, even, finally, his family ties. After all the longing and striving, and then the faith and self-surrender, the part played by those forces which are outside of one's immediate control are more prominent than is the case in conversion. The element of spontaneity, of unconscious activity of the mind, the work of the Holy Spirit, which we found to be common to all the groups studied, is even more markedly and persistently present at this crisis. One person, for example, says, in describing the event, I was walking alone over the fields and suddenly filled with the most marvelous power. The impulse sometimes comes as a force that is not to be withstood. I was doing my morning housework and felt an irresistible desire to pray. Three times I was thus called away from my work. Another was so powerfully impelled that while going home from meeting, he kneeled down in the rain and mud and prayed. He goes on to say, Suddenly the darkness of the night seemed lit up. I felt, realized, knew that God had answered my prayer, and a feeling of sweet peace and satisfaction and happiness came over me. I felt that I was accepted into the inner circle of God's loved ones. Two persons woke up with it after a night's rest. It will be recalled that we pointed out in the discussion of similar instances of conversion how common it is for the mind to solve its problems during sleep. The feeling of God's forgiveness, the freedom from the sense of sin, prominent at the critical point in conversion, is one of the most frequently expressed characteristics of sanctification. But the form of expression has changed. While the former was a mere act of pardon, this is usually described as a complete cleansing. These are typical. I felt pure and clean, so that I wished I were made of glass, so that everyone could look within my heart. I had the witness of God's Spirit that a clean heart had been created within me. Self-mastery and a real purification of my nature became manifest in me. The work of forgiveness seems to be more thorough. It involves one's entire being. The person feels not only that his sins have been forgiven, but that he has been made wholly pure. The sense of oneness with God or Christ, another immediate result of conversion, is likewise emphasized in sanctification. It is now expressed with greater fullness of feeling. The last assurance came that God had taken me for his own and had come to abide. My joy was full. It brought me to a deeper consciousness of God's presence. A sense of perfect harmony with God and joy unspeakable filled my heart. A deeper composure seized me, a sense of divine nearness. In view of all these similarities, the question arises, wherein does sanctification differ from conversion? Does it bring with it any new, over and above, what was experienced in conversion? For the distinction, we shall rely first upon the testimony of the respondents, most of whom attempted an answer to the question, and later on we shall interpret the difference in the light of the experiences which intervene between conversion and sanctification. As told by the respondents, the distinction is expressed tersely by one of them thus. It was the climax of the spiritual development that had been going on within me. It differed from conversion not in kind but in degree. This gives the spirit of most of the others, and almost the manner of expression of many of them. The specific ways in which it is a culmination of conversion are along the lines of the change wrought then in one's nature. Evil habits are more completely broken up. For example, at conversion I experienced pardon from sin, a new heart, a disposition to do right, although an evil tendency remained. Sanctification took away this tendency. The feeling of harmony with God is heightened. Sanctification brought a fuller consciousness of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification brings with it a fullness and all aroundness of experience which is new. The joy of conversion has been enlarged so that it approaches a state of ecstasy in which one's whole nature participates. I was cleansed from all sin and filled with the fullness of God as I had not been at conversion. Conversion was a consecration to God. Sanctification was an exalted state of soul, an indwelling of power. In these instances one sees also the heightened subjectivity of experience which we shall find to be one of the distinguishing aspects of sanctification. But so far as understanding sanctification in psychological terms is concerned, we are yet on the outside of it. 
what is going on beneath the surface when persons who already had a sudden awakening into religious truth profess instantly to be lifted to a yet higher plane of religious life we can adequately appreciate the mental processes involved in it and their significance in religious development only by following up the experiences which intervene between conversion and sanctification the number of years between the two events varies they range from two months to forty years it is a singular fact the cause of which is not clear that sanctification is likely to fall inside of the first year after conversion or to be postponed for at least twenty years considerably more than half of the cases occur either before the first year has ended or after a period of twenty years has elapsed it appears that the time of least frequency with which sanctification follows conversion is five to ten years the fact of greatest significance in the light it throws on sanctification regard to this intervening period is that eighty percent of the persons who have troubled and uneven growth this it will be recalled is about the same percentage of storm and stretch we found among the hundreds of persons studied in the last chapter the difficulties encountered by these respondents are the same ones described there and to set them forth in detail would be but repetition the enthusiasm aroused at conversion is intermittent uncertainty occasionally arises as to whether the experience was genuine doubts are frequent incident upon the striving for a clear horizon they are the same storm and stress phenomena with which we have become familiar the old lie professedly abandoned at conversion is continually cropping up temptations recur in the direction of former evils the sense of sin and imperfection persists all of which shows that the old life although it is for a time lost sight of still exists in the fiber of one's being and has by no means entirely dropped away interpreted from the psychological point of view the whole struggle after conversion and the consequent necessity which many persons feel of passing on to a second work of grace grows out of the conflict between an old habitual life and a new set of functionings which have not yet become well established in the nervous mechanism the new set of activities are those connected with the association centers in the brain and correspond to spiritual insight the old habitual activities are those which constitute the lower reflex sensuous arcs in the nervous structure which so they have been ingrained during all the preceding years into its tissue not until adolescence are the more higher psychic powers aroused in earnest the function of conversion is to set them going for religious ends the person to be sure has acted as if he were a spiritual being but in so far as there has been self-direction the lower centers have been organized simply within their own sphere they have been a law to themselves but now after the higher centers are awakened after the person in conversion has accepted the spiritual life as his own those activities remain a law in one's members which wars against the higher sanctification is a fresh affirmation when the new life has become established that the old one does not exist if we notice the nature of the difficulties after conversion we find none of them which do not fit readily into this conception in a description like the following one might suppose the person were trying to set forth in figurative language the brain tract idea the tree of sin had been cut down but the young sprouts of temper pride and many others were springing up from the old root in other words the old synthesis of the nervous discharges had been shattered but the nerve elements continued to come together bit by bit into their old combinations and these were inharmonious with the new spiritual attitude after persistent effort toward a life which is wholly spiritual the nervous system forms itself in that direction the new set of activities furnish a substantial basis for the conduct of life when this same respondent became conscious of new power the step by which he identified himself with it was sanctification he himself had apparently been ignorant of the strength that had been accumulating when it arose into consciousness it marked a great event after sanctification he carries out the same figure and says i know that it took all the roots of envy jealousy malice hatred false pride bitterness and impatience out of my heart this is expressed in many ways one person in describing the life after conversion writes my self-control was not fully complete i gave way to anger my life was more or less checkered a tendency to evil still remains although at conversion there has been pardon for sin and a new heart a tendency to evil remained sanctification took away this tendency but not only must the old habits be broken an entirely new set of habits must be formed and must have time to become ingrained into the nervous tissue at conversion the person has accepted a new ideal as his own 
It is vivid and real enough, but it exists largely as a possibility for future development. Before it can supplant the old life, it must become real in the same sense as the old was real. The person is usually thrown into wholly different surroundings, which demands changed modes of life. Church going, saying prayers, participating in the sacraments, taking part in the ritual, taking on occasion upon religious topics, all these things and a hundred more are foreign. The chances are to his way of thinking and acting. He must act as if he understood them all. They cannot really be his until they are worked over through habit and become part of his physical and spiritual makeup. He is like a little child who was thrown into the world where an entirely strange environment is to be assimilated. But there is this difference, that he is usually expected to learn to adapt his life in the new way without sufficient tutelage. Unless he has already been ripe for the fresh insight and new activities, he has difficulties in making the readjustment. Hence results the friction which so often follows conversion, an irritation and discontent. One person who represents a large number of her kind writes, I experienced temptations and was discontented. I did not feel that I was in accord with Christian standards. The way was uncertain and uneven. I felt dissatisfied and was filled with unrest. But after sanctification, the story has changed. I became courageous and willing to show my colors. I felt nearer to God in my prayers. One now feels at home in the new life. With these facts in mind, we are able to read with a greater degree of clearness all of the accounts of sanctification. One of the respondents says, Conversion removed the sense of condemnation and brought into my heart peace towards God in a fervent love that prompted an earnest effort to lead a Christian life. Sanctification removed from within my heart all sense of depravity, weakness, and fear, making the service of God a delight. I had more courage and strength to discharge Christian duty. It far exceeded in depth and fullness the first blessing. Thus we have seen how rarely it is that peace and discontentment are attained after conversion, until the old habits which contradict the new attitude are completely broken. A life of harmony cannot be reached until the new set of activities have become habitual and carry with them a tone of familiarity. Sanctification is a step, usually after much striving and discontent, by which the personality is finally identified with the spiritual life, which at conversion exists merely as a hazy possibility. The difficulties experienced after conversion have now been largely overcome. Twenty-two of the cases record that they have altogether disappeared. Seventeen say that they have lessened. The persons are tempted, to be sure, are confessed by forty-three of the fifty-one, but there is not the disposition to yield. One writes, The old temptations would arise, but strength from God made resistance easy. Another expresses the same thing in a terse and suggestive way. Temptations from without still avail me, but there is nothing within to respond to them. Three of the number report that they are not even tempted. It will be recalled that one pronounced feature of adult religion in the conversion group was their great sense of religion as a subjective possession. This is even more marked among those who have experienced sanctification. In fact, one meaning of sanctification is that now the person feels right with God. He appreciates religion as his own. God is his friend and companion. When I was converted, the Holy Spirit came to be with me. When I was sanctified, he came into my heart. I had a rich consciousness of the incoming of the Holy Spirit, an unspeakable fullness of blessedness. The richness of inward experience is in exact contrast with the state shortly after conversion when the first enthusiasm had passed. That condition is represented in the following extracts. At times, I felt a fear of death and wondered if there were not an experience beyond this that I could attain. I had a longing for a steadier and more satisfactory experience. There was a steady and rapid growth toward sanctification, but I did not realize the fullness of religion, the state which is striven after and which is attained at sanctification, is that in which the person is no longer a mere participant in the divine life, but is a medium through which it expresses itself. One sees the same thing illustrated in a similar way in matters that are commonplaces in everyday life. In learning to play a game, an athlete soon becomes aware of his ability to perform the necessary feats skillfully. He sometimes awakens suddenly to an understanding of the fine points of the game and to a real enjoyment of it, just as the convert awakens to an appreciation of religion. But if he keeps on engaging in the sport, 
there may come a day when all at once the game plays itself through him when he loses himself in some great contest in the same way a musician may suddenly reach a point at which pleasure in the technique of the art entirely falls away and in some moment of inspiration he becomes the instrument through which music flows the writer has chanced to hear two different married persons both of whose wedded lives had been beautiful from the beginning relate that not until a year or more after marriage did they really awaken to the full blessedness of married life so it is with the religious experience of these persons we are studying the new life begun at conversion must be lived before it can be appreciated from within sanctification is the condition in which one has so completely assimilated spiritual truth that he feels himself one with it in which he awakens to the inner realization of its meaning in which he attains the state wherein the divine life can freely express itself through him the increased subjectivity and inner appreciation of religion which accompanies sanctification does not come without a sacrifice there is at the same time a deciding narrowing of the range of interest in outward things this is the obverse side and is perhaps an inevitable consequence of the awakening of the inner side the mind seems to have drawn in the tentacles with which it felt its way into the manifold interest of its kind in certain ways it has lost its touch with the outer world there is depreciation of all those pleasures that are connected with the life of sense the condition seems to indicate that after the association centers of the cortex have thoroughly come into activity the friction between them and the lower brain areas has been removed once for all by a more or less perfect cutting off of the connection between the lower and higher the association centers are made to constitute a synthesis within themselves the nervous discharges of the lower vegetative and sensuous areas are kept within their own range that fraction of these impulses which is constantly trying to discharge through the association centers is continually inhibited the process is helped along by branding everything bound up with the lower centers as sin this condition in which the association centers connected with the spiritual life are cut off from the lower is often reflected in the way the respondents describe their experiences one of the quotations above for example is now clear in which the person says temptations from without still assail me but there is nothing within to respond to them the ego is wholly identified with the higher centers whose quality of feeling is that of withinness another the respondent says since then although satan tempts me there is as it were a wall of brass around me so that his darts cannot touch me the wall of brass is a good phrase by which to describe the inhibition of direct connection between the lower and higher centers and the fact that the person has taken up his abode permanently in the higher except that the description is perhaps carried too far it is impossible for the connection to be entirely annulled the person must keep on eating breathing and drinking in and assimilating sense impressions and it is inevitable that these affect consciousness in at least an indirect way a more accurate term for the severed relation would be a brass wall with chinks in it the sensuous and vegetative impulses which leak in are however disregarded in the psychic complex involved in the spiritual activities that this condition obtains is shown in many ways 22 express since sanctification a more intense hatred of sin 15 have become so free from it as to profess perfection 24 care less for personal adornment one writes i can spare no time for anything that is merely for pleasure or personal adornment another i stopped wearing jewelry and extravagant dress 34 regard most amusements as sinful one says i do not feel at liberty to attend theaters play cards etc my greatest joy now is to do god's will and that joy exceeds all other joys of life one in the enjoyment of a clean heart perfect love or sanctification has something so much better than the world offers in the way of amusement personal adornments art secular readings science intellectual pursuits in general that it seems but folly to come down to them it is interesting to note in this connection that certain denominations which have split off in order to emphasize spirituality and religion have laid stress on the importance of simplicity and dress in entire unworldliness dancing card playing theater going racing and the like are usually condemned in their church disciplines and are tabooed as worldly even aside from the gambling and other immortality sometimes bound up with them 
the mystics were in the habit of shutting themselves in for the sake of making it easier to engage in quiet contemplation the customs of the monks and the aesthetics too were an historical development which seems to correspond with this tendency in individuals their seclusion and renunciation of all pleasures were means of facilitating a separate independent development of the association centers kant found that he could better engage in philosophical thought while gazing steadily at a neighboring church steeple plato believed that the senses vitiated the wisdom of the true philosopher all of these instances seem to have something in common namely the sacrifice which it is necessary to make in the cultivation of the sensuous life in order that there be a specialization of energy in the brain areas involved in the higher psychic functions the loss of interest in worldly things by those who profess sanctification is the sacrifice they make in order to become spiritual creatures this is in line with the normal development of adolescence experimental tests have established the fact that when the ability to reason and the other mental activities which indicate increased power in the higher brain areas begin to function in earnest the senses not only fail to keep up their former rate of development but even decline in efficiency sanctification carries this process one step further and aims at complete freedom from the life of the senses it is but a corollary of what has already been said to point out how readily sanctification passes over into a pathological condition the frequency with which these persons become inmates of asylums itself indicates that there is danger in this extreme advance toward spirituality of losing balance the signs of abnormality which sanctified persons show judged by the standards of what constitutes a normal citizen are of frequent occurrence they get out of tune with other people often they will have nothing to do with churches which they regard as worldly they become hypercritical towards others they grow careless of their social political and financial obligations as an instance of this type may be mentioned a woman of 68 of whom the writer made a special study she had been a member of the most active and progressive churches in a busy part of a large city her pastor described her as having reached the censorious stage she had grown more and more out of sympathy with the church her connection with it finally consisted simply in attendance at prayer meeting at which her only message was that of reproof and condemnation of the others for living on a low plane at last she withdrew from fellowship with any church the writer found her living alone in a little room on the top story of a cheap boarding house quite out of touch with all human relations but apparently happy in the enjoyment of her own spiritual blessings her time was occupied in writing booklets on sanctification, page after page of dreamy rhapsody. She proves to be one of a small group of persons who claim that entire salvation involves three steps instead of two. Not only must there be a conversion in sanctification, but a third which they call crucifixion or perfect redemption, and which seems to bear the same relation to sanctification that this bears to conversion. She related how the Spirit had said to her, stop going to church stop going to holy meetings go to your own room and i will teach you she professes to care nothing for colleges or preachers or churches but only cares to listen to what god says to her her description of her experience seemed entirely consistent she is happy and contented and her life is perfectly satisfactory to herself while listening to her own story one was tempted to forget that it was from the life of a person who could not live by it in conjunction with her fellows like that of many of her kind, seen simply from its own point of view, her sanctified life is consistent and beautiful enough, but tested by the standard of conduct, of fitting into a useful place in society, it appears extremely circumscribed. This case represents an exaggeration of that tendency in growth which we are now considering. It should be pointed out that there are none of the 51 persons who furnish the basis of study who are not earnest and respected Christians. A singular anomaly meets us in this group, just as in those studied in the last chapter, except that here it is even more marked. Along with a strong tendency toward subjectivity, a narrowing down of objective interests, there is at the same time, when we come to the study of feelings and ideals, the most intense altruism. Love to God and love to man are the mainsprings of action. All who mention the influence of sanctification upon their ideals and feelings, 41 of the 52 
say that its effect has been to increase their interest in their fellow men. Nearly all the ideals center in the love and service of God and in helpfulness to their fellows. The explanation of this seems to be, as was pointed out previously, that the brain areas concerned in spiritual activity have been developed in connection with man's life as a social being. It seems that when the higher centers are most cut off from those impulses directly involved in the egoistic life, they take on to the highest degree their own distinctive coloring. From the very beginning it has doubtless been in union with his fellows that the greatest demands have been made on man's intellectual and spiritual powers. If this is true, there must be intrinsically bound up in the exercise of these areas the social and altruistic instincts. Hence it is that we find existing side by side a tendency to appreciate religion as a personal experience and an impulse toward the service of God and man, extreme subjectivity and intense altruism. These two tendencies are the same which stood out clearly in the adult life of those who had not experienced conversion. Indeed, it seems that sanctification corresponds in some measure to the period of reconstruction in the other group. Aside from the similarity which has been pointed out, there is coincidence in the age at which they occur. There are only two cases of sanctification under 20 years of age, although all but five of the respondents were over 30 at the time when they wrote their records. Far more occur between 20 and 30 than during any other decade. This is exactly what we found in regard to the age of Reconstruction. Sanctification seems to bear the same relation to conversion as does Reconstruction to the early adolescent awakenings. Both are separated from their antecedent experiences by a period of storm and stress and doubt, of adolescent instability. In both, the end of this period is marked by a transition into a life which is self-possessed, constructive, positive, and guided by social impulses. We have, then, this interesting result that religious growth, which is attended by sanctification in many of its essential aspects, reaches the same culmination as do the other two lines of development previously described. There are, to be sure, many differences, principally differences in the prominence of certain qualities of feeling, certain peculiar emphasis in ideals and beliefs, distinctive tones and colorings in the spiritual life, which seem to rest back fundamentally on differences of temperament. But in all three groups we find, after the credulity of childhood, a welling up in adolescence of instinctive religious feeling, followed by the formative period during doubt and storm and stress of latter adolescence, and this in turn merging into the self-possessed, active, helpful life of manhood and womanhood. End of chapter 29. Chapter 30, The Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30, A General View of the Line of Religious Growth. While analyzing and organizing the details in the preceding chapters, they have now and then seemed to become transparent and to furnish glimpses into the operation of spiritual forces. This we have already stopped here and there to consider as we have proceeded. Now we are ready to pull the threads together a little closer and to make the details more organic. Omitting the minor differences, we may gather up from the various groups of persons we have studied those features which will give us the most comprehensive picture of the usual trend of religious development. The character of the phenomenon at different stages of life divides religious growth naturally into three great periods, childhood, adolescence, and maturity. These periods we found to be equally distinct in each of the three different classes of persons. In all, they were so pronounced as to set them forth in unqualified terms as periods which belong naturally to individual growth. To be artificially accurate for the sake of clearness, we have childhood up to about 12, youth extending from this age to about 25, and after that maturity. Seen in its most general aspect, the end of religious growth seems to be to make the credulous and receptive child over into a full-grown spiritual man or woman. The records show at last four distinct lines of advance from childhood to maturity. The first and most prominent of these is that which transfers the center of activity from self-interest to interest in the whole, of which the self is but a part. The person comes to live in the larger life outside himself. The child emerges from the unknown sea, bringing with him racial tendencies. Among these is the brute instinct of self-preservation, 
which shows itself in anger, sensitiveness, jealousy, and the like. Everything goes to contribute to the nucleus of a self. The value of religion to the child is in what it can bring to him. The same tendency appears in the early religion of different peoples. In the Vedas, for instance, the hymns are full of supplications for personal favors from the gods, for protection for wealth and offspring. Mature religion, on the contrary, shows a strenuous advance towards losing the self in service. The interests of the individual become intrinsically bound up in those of society. He now recognizes himself as part of a larger spiritual world to which he is subject, and he finds life only by fitting into an internal plan. He comes to feel himself in harmony with the spiritual life about him, and responds to it with the feelings of faith, love, reverence, and dependence. Self-interest becomes transformed into love of God. The second line of advance is that the individual tends to become a positive spiritual force. The child is in a receptive attitude towards its surroundings and dependent on them. Throughout early life it is held in the lap of society as at first in that of its mother. But the mature person must stand as an organic part of the social whole, a positive factor in it, and find his life in actively contributing to it. The way to mature life, we have found, consists largely in entering upon a life of activity, but it seems to be nature's plan in the third place to produce a mature person who not only acts, but who acts wisely. He must possess a high degree of insight, must see things for himself. With the child, religion consists largely in precepts of dogmas in the authority of parents, church, and religious code. Religion is all external to him. God is a being above and beyond him. This must all be worked over as a part of his own consciousness. At first there is no insight, no immediacy to any of his religious experiences. Although he instinctively asserts it, he does not even consciously appreciate the fact of his own selfhood. All this must be changed. The person must come to apperceive religious truth, feel for himself its inherent worth, make it his own by living it from within. In mature life, he comes more and more to feel himself a medium through which universal life expresses itself. Again, a persistent element in religion is that the person reaches out after fuller life. It seems that the instinct of self-enlargement and the delight in self-expression do not cease even in maturity. There is, however, a transformation in the quality of the impulse. At first, it is egocentric. In adult life, self-interest seems to have become almost eliminated. As life advances, the regulative impulses which keep the instincts in check and hold them within their proper limits are constantly active. In youth, these have grown into the organic feeling of the sense of sin, and in adult life they still persist in the abstract ideal of self-abnegation. Under the influence of these forces we find the impulse toward self-expression and self-enlargement becoming refined in maturity into a craving for righteousness a desire to be all and do all for the glory of God and the service of man. Now, what of the period intervening between childhood and maturity, that of adolescence? Its function is simply to affect those transformations described above. All the fermentation, unrest, instability, and sporadic outbursts are indications on the surface that a personality is forming beneath that has a capacity for self-direction and independent insight. During childhood, Life has been determined largely by heredity and imitation. The infant comes on the scene with most of the peculiarities of its race and even of its immediate parentage already formed. Its nervous system is predetermined to function in certain ways which will make it in general act and feel and think as do those around it. To intensify this conformity there is the instinct of imitation. From its first year, the child mimics the ways of those about it. It doubtless picks up unconsciously the little things which give tone and quality to its life. The instinct is nature's way of saying that the child must conform to its type, that during these early years of tutelage, it must drink in the wisdom of its kind. But if society is to hold its own and is to develop, this nucleus of receptivity must be transformed into a positive unit with force and insight of its own. Adolescence is the time when this new personality is formed. If we take into account all the surface indications, they give unmistakable evidence that the fundamental thing underlying them all is the birth of selfhood, the awakening of a self-conscious personality. 
This is one of the central facts that bring harmony and unity into the multiplicity of adolescent phenomena. Another essential fact that must likewise be kept in mind is the existence of a social organism, fixed in its ways and relentless in its demands, to which the budding nucleus of a self must in some way adapt itself. If we bear in mind these two facts, they will help to bring simplicity, where otherwise there would be only complexity and confusion. Adolescence divides itself naturally into two periods, the first of which extends, we may say roughly, from about 12 to 18, the second from about 18 to 25. The first division is that in which the spontaneous life of will and emotion bursts forth. It comes in a great wave at about 15 or 16, preceded by a smaller one at about 12, and followed by another at about 17 or 18. We are to look upon this welling up of new life as a hereditary outcrop. Biologically, it is remotely connected with the awakening of the reproductive life. This has been sufficiently discussed in Chapter 12. The point of interest for us here is that a new personality is taking shape. This outburst often comes suddenly and unexpectedly, even though sometimes elicited by songs, prayers, sermons, and religious ceremonies. It has a large element of spontaneity. When it bursts forth, it is the first announcement to the person of the store of energy which has lain dormant within him. He has become a center through which racial instincts express themselves. The sea of feeling out of which he was born has begun to break through the nucleus of itself. It is a great event in religious growth when he first becomes conscious of the life that is stirring within him. The consciousness of a self is frequently the purest and almost the only intellectual element involved in the awakening. One person who saw his image reflected in a shop window had this sudden disclosure. I am I. I have a life of my own to live. For some time afterwards, he tells us, the sense of personal responsibility for life and conduct weighed heavily on his boyish mind. It is instructive to note that in racial development this discovery of self has also been an important event. Following upon the Vedic period referred to above, the religious development of the Hindus were sometimes centered about this one fact. It was of such significance as to underlie the whole religious philosophy. That art thou was the constantly reiterated message of the Brahmin priests, by which they meant to disclose the fact of the existence of the self and its oneness with Brahm. We read in one of the Upanishads, there is this city of God, the body, and in it the palace, the small lotus of the heart, and in it that small self. Now, what exists within that small self that is to be sought for and to be understood? Whatever there is of God, here is the world. Whatever has been or will be, that is contained within it. Those who depart from hence have discovered the self, and those true desires, for them there is freedom in all the worlds. In adolescence, the self becomes the point of reference for experience. Everything is judged in terms of one's own consciousness. The conception of self may indeed be but dimly appreciated, but it exists as a subconscious fact without sufficient force to influence conduct. The youth insists on living his life, seeing things for himself. During childhood, he was held in the straitjacket of social custom, which habit had made reflex mechanical and unconscious. He now insists on seeing the reason for the things he does. But the adolescent finds himself face to face with a system of things which is already established. He is born into a society in which the standard of activity is already set. Law and custom have made it fixed and rigid. He has likewise come into a world order whose laws are changeless. The demands of the entire system of things outside of him are relentless. The interesting situation has now arisen in which the new personality has to adapt itself in some way to this external system. The possibilities which open up when this crisis is reached are as varied as the diversity of temperaments and the peculiarities of environment, both past and present, which enter into it. Although the resultant phases of experience are numerous, there are certain well-marked types. If by chance the mental horizon which opens up to the youth harmonizes with his environment, a thing which appears to happen somewhat rarely, there may result an uneventful development. The person may go on progressively assimilating the life about him, and merge into vigorous and healthy manhood or womanhood without knowing how or when. 
Often the new life expresses itself readily in motor terms, and the person enters directly into a life of helpfulness and activity. He acquires by trying and failing and trying again the wisdom which others gain through rational channels. It is more often the case that there is more or less friction in the process of adjusting the self to the whole. Persons often try, but try for a time in vain, and are thrown back into a state of inactivity, indifference, and carelessness. The frequency of storm and stress, which begins in this early period of adolescence, is evidence that the self is feeling its way, and forcing its way into clear light. The soul is torn by unhappiness and discontent. It struggles after an idea which society holds up for it, but which it imperfectly appreciates. All this is the friction of embryonic selfhood against the crystallized forms which society has thrown about it. Doubts and questions are likewise a result of the attempt to square this acquired nucleus of a self with the world outside, to select and assimilate that which is best adapted to its peculiar needs. Although the frequency of storm and stress and doubt may indicate imperfections in training and in physical and environmental conditions, which we may hope eventually will be overcome, still in some sense we must regard them as indissolubly bound up in the process of mental and spiritual acquisition. The facts in the foregoing pages seem conclusive that even when persons have been carefully reared and are full of wholesome habits, even when wise counsel is available, they have, notwithstanding, undergone adolescent struggles. It seems a rare chance when we take into account what the adolescent development means that there should not be some difficulty in stress. Within the space of a few years, a wonderful transformation is to be wrought. The youth is suddenly to come into the full use of those powers, which are the highest product of racial development. During childhood, they lay dormant, ready to function. Now, in so short a time, a marvelous complex psychic life is to be worked into a system within itself, and also to be perfectly coordinated with those modes of thought and activity which have already existed. If we take into account that all this development is reached out into an entirely new sphere, we can appreciate somewhat the uncertainty and stability that must attend the first full functioning of those powers concerned in religious insight. When we combine with the fact of the range of development now to be transversed in a brief space of time, the other fact of the difficulty of acquiring any sort of new knowledge whatever, we are in a position to understand the improbability that a person shall pass smoothly through adolescence and shall, at the same time, realize the full possibility of manhood and womanhood. Society has set certain religious standards which, although the mature person can live in accordance with them, with some degree of ease and composure, seem to the youth entirely beyond his comprehension. The child may be already the embodiment of righteousness, but in the attempt to understand spiritual truth, holding it off for the first time to view it, preparatory to a fuller comprehension of it, it is full of strangeness and mystery. Still, it is necessary for the time to objectify the spiritual truth, either consciously or subconsciously. If one is to attain a higher order of life in which there is spiritual insight and personal forcefulness, the prevalence of religious doubt and storm and stress seems to be the result of natural selection. Those persons have been chosen out as most fit to exist who do not take things simply on authority, but who gain for themselves a rational hold on truth. Nothing is really understood at first hand until it has been called up into consciousness and then worked over into experience. As childhood is the time for the acquisition of good habits through imitation and conformity, so nature has made an otherwise provision by which each person may not only comprehend the best the race has produced, but bring to it his or her bit of improvement. Adolescence is the time for those divergencies from conventional types which enlarge the range of human wisdom and experience. If the line of self-expression of each person is slightly divergent with custom, it may result in friction, but it adds with all to the enlargement and enrichment of human experience. In racial development, likewise, doubt, storm, and stress, and reactionary tendencies have constantly arisen. A period of skepticism arose in the post-Vedic period of India, at a time when the Brahmin code tended to become crystallized. Developing side by side with the extreme dogmatic tendencies in Greek thought during the third and second centuries before Christ, arose the skeptics, who either called into question or rejected the whole of the philosophical systems which had been set up. 
Among religious organizations, similar reactionary tendencies have been frequent. When any organization begins to crystallize, a fraction of it starts off in a new direction with a fresh emphasis of some vital principle. The reasoning, doubting, egoistic, self-asserting period seems to have the double function of calling out the individual into self-possession and personal insight, and of sorting, refining, enriching, enlarging the fund of racial experience. These phenomena we have been considering usually begin in the early period of adolescence, coincident with the emotional awakening which announces the beginning of the new life. The second division of adolescence, from 18 to 25 or thereabouts, is one of rational readjustments. It is a relatively quiet formative period. There is less disturbance at the surface, fewer outbreaks of emotion, and less enthusiasm. Feelings of a distinctly religious nature are rare. There is, however, doubtless just as much real development going on as during earlier adolescence. It is a time of sifting and readjusting forces turned loose in one's nature during the earlier years. It is the nascent period of doubt and of intellectual questionings. It is likewise the period of most frequent alienation and revolt. These latter years of adolescence seem to be nature's alembic in which the distilling is done, which brings to mature life the best of all things stirred up in earlier youth. It is one of the most important, although one of the least eventful periods. Finally, after some years of striving, analyzing, building, following up bits of insight, working out individual point of view, the feelings come into play and give it worth and sanction. This is the period of reconstruction. Usually the individual hold on truth is recognized to be the same essentially as that which all men possess, yet unlike that of anyone, because it is a revelation to one's own deepest consciousness. It is the heart and essence of that which in childhood was only form and observance. The person becomes at least a sympathizer with the world wisdom, a cooperator in social institutions. After sifting religious truth, he works it over into life. He enters into real fellowship with the world of spiritual things. Religion is now lived from within. Religious awakenings come most frequently, we have seen, at about the age of puberty, in a most rapid growth in weight. The principles underlying the coincidence have been sufficiently considered in Chapter 12. The fact that spiritual upheavals center mostly in the early years of adolescence rests ultimately upon the new developments then taking place in connection with the reproductive system. The physiological birth brings with it the dawning of all those spiritual accompaniments which are necessary to the fullest social activities. One of my students, in an unpublished research, has found that the recognition of the rights of others by children has a sudden increment at about the age of puberty. This is the time biologically when one enters into deep relation with racial life. In a certain sense, religious life is an irradiation of the reproductive instinct. That there is a kinship between religion and sex has been fully recognized recently by most sociologists, alienists, and psychiatrists. The interpretation of the connection between them is usually left in such a way, however, as to warrant a few words in regard to their relations in fully developed religion. We are not to suppose that in finding the remote condition under which a relation sprang up, we have found the clue to the nature of the fully developed product. Even if it is true that religion was at first intimately bound up in those duties and ceremonies which are the outgrowth of sex, in its latter stages it may have entirely changed its character. Although the oversight of this fact has led to considerable misapprehension in tracing the growth of religion, the error is now happily being recognized. Professor Caird, for example, in his Evolution of Religion, puts the matter in a clear and forceful way. The phenomena of the beginning of life are now to be regarded as the causes of the phenomena that follow. We cannot, from an examination of the first stage of a development, pronounce any final judgment for good or ill upon the latter results of it. By studying the larva in its habits and structure, we can pronounce nothing with safety beforehand about the nature of the pupa and insect which are to continue its existence. The psychical life of man is an organism which carries with it a unity of its own, a synthesis of its complex elements which is more or less independent of the conditions here and there in its growth which call it out. 
We have to distinguish constantly between the causes and conditions of growth. The sexual life, although it has left its impress on fully developed religion, seems to have originally given the psychic impulse which called out the latent possibilities of development, rather than to have furnished the raw material out of which religion was constructed. The facts we have been studying lead to this conclusion. The answers to the definite point in the question list on the relation in individual experience between the sexual and the moral and religious life were usually very frank. In no instance was the reproductive instinct admitted to be helpful to spiritual attainment, nor was a religious life expressed in terms of it. There is no case in which the matter is discussed, but that regards the instinct in question as a hindrance to the spiritual life unless it is curbed. The checking rather than the free expression seems to be the essential thing. Although the reproductive instinct may be primal, it seems to have been entirely superseded as a direct factor in religious growth by other elements. These latter themselves form a regulative instinct which acts upon the sexual impulse as a check. It seems that the two have become so far differentiated, the separation between them has grown so complete, that in the latter stages of development they have different functions, and the interest of religion demands a suppression rather than the radiation of the reproductive instinct. The sexual instinct, which continues healthy and strong to conserve biological ends, has, from a spiritual standpoint, become a mere incident in growth. It should constantly be borne in mind that religion has not been nourished from a single root, but that, on the contrary, it has many sources. Among the facts in preceding chapters, there are evidences that other deep-rooted instincts besides that of sex have been operative in religious development. Out of the instinct of self-preservation and the desire for fullness of life on the physiological plane, there seemed to have arisen, by progressive refinement and irradiation, the religious impulse toward spiritual self-enlargement. Again, physiological hunger, an instinct even more primal than that of sex, winds into appropriativeness, delight in intellectual conquest, and finally into a craving for spiritual knowledge. That is, the religious feeling of hungering after righteousness may be in some sense an irradiation of the crude instinct of food-getting. Pleasure in activity, growing out of an overflow of nervous energy, seems to also have been lifted to the plane of the spiritual life, and, in part, to underlie self-expression and joy in service as religious impulses. In the beginnings of religion, these instincts existed side by side, and, in their functioning, brought into activity the lower nervous centers. The process of religious development has consisted in arousing discharges from these through the higher psychic centers, and in working them into a higher synthesis. The significance which each of these lines of radiation has in religion at different stages of its development is probably, as we have seen, a varying quantity. The awakening of any one may give an impulse to the rest. It can be said with certainty in regard to the sudden increment at the beginning of youth in the perfection of the reproductive system and the great physiological transformation that comes with it that it is the most direct source of the altruistic side of religion and of the social impulses including even delight in divine kinship furthermore and that is the point which concerns us in this connection it opens the door to the exercise of the other impulses which are not of sexual origin the person is suddenly thrown into society New obligations are forced upon him. In the stress and strain of making the various adjustments incident on becoming a social being, all the latent powers of his nature are called into activity. Now that the social life has been actively aroused, it nourishes itself through various avenues. The person finds that he bears definite relations to the world of things and of spiritual forces, and out of the appreciation of these relations springs up a longing to comprehend them and the sense of awe, reverence, and dependence. It is in this contact with external nature, perhaps, as much as from any other source, that the aesthetic element of religion is fed, after once it has been awakened. The sense of duty, which is, as we have found, one of the most prominent and persistent factors of the spiritual life, seems to have arisen especially out of the relations which are non-sexual. The complications of industry, trade, and government establish rights and duties which become centers of reference for individual conduct. During childhood, while the reproductive functions are lying dormant, social contact is instilling moral feelings into the child, which show themselves already in very early life. 
During adolescence, when religious feelings disappear, and there is a chance to sift the spiritual life to the last degree, the most prominent thing is duty, standing out clear and strong. It is the moral impulse that is cherished at this time, while the person finds it necessary, on the other hand, to curb the reproductive instinct in order to attain the fullest spiritual development. In short, the coincidences in time between the physiological and spiritual awakenings indicate when the various lines of evidence are in that the two may have been originally closely related, but that at present time they are so far differentiated as to have no apparent connection. The reproductive instinct is one of several roots from which religion has been nourished. Since the ends reached by conversion and by the less violent processes of growth are the same, it is worth our while to ask wherein the difference lies. In the first place, it is clear that the difference is often simply one of terminology. We saw that spontaneous awakenings are a very common experience, and that persons familiar with the customary revival methods will describe an awakening as a conversion, while others mention a similar experience as simply an event in the normal course of development. Inasmuch as the accompanying phenomena, the essential process involved, and the results are similar, we are doubtless safe in saying that conversion is a condensed form of adolescent development. Society seems to have unconsciously recognized the ends to be attained by religious growth and to have embodied them in the rites of confirmation and conversion. Even among savage races there are customs at puberty or soon afterward of knocking out the teeth, tattooing, circumcision, changing the form of dress, and the like, the essential purpose of all of which is the initiation of the child into manhood. There is every evidence that the convert in many instances attains, in some measure, quality of life that he might have reached by gradually maturing. The method which society uses to bring into sharp contrast the little world of self in which he has been living, and the ideal of love into which he must enter, it brings together all the habits and desires of his former life, which tend to conserve his selfhood, and lumps them as sin, which he must once for all renounce. It sets in contrast the ideal of perfect goodness, infinite love, and complete happiness through self-sacrifice which is yet far out of reach but which through faith can be attained it pictures the fatal consequences of his present course and the possible well-being to himself and his kind if he repent the power of public opinion is brought to bear to increase the strain the force of his emotional nature is called into activity through eloquence and the rhythm and harmony of music he once for all renounces his little self and pitches his tent beneath the stars he passes from his own narrow sphere and becomes a citizen of the world. His ideas converge into an ideal. His feelings are called into play and he loves and trusts this ideal and strives toward it. The secret of the realization of this new quality of life may be found in part in the attitude of the person. He becomes professedly what he aspires to be. But who can tell what really happens in one's consciousness when one turns seriously into communion with one's deeper self? If we turn to our crude analogy of nerve cells and connections, which we know to be involved in the character and quality of thinking and feeling, we may get a definite picture at whatever cost of accuracy. Granting that the highest consciousness is conditioned by the most highly imperfected organized nervous system, that new ideas imply the functioning of new areas in the nervous system, that the nerve elements that are concerned in spiritual insight are already formed and lying ready to function, if only brought into the right coordination, it is conceivable that during the intense experiences attending conversion, under the heat of the emotional pressure brought to bear, a harmony is struck among these elements which it might have taken months or even years to accomplish if one had been left helpless to grope in doubt and uncertainty. The analysis of the cases before us bears out, from the psychic side, this hypothesis and shows that conversion is often to some extent in anticipation of the direction of adolescent development. It must not be forgotten, however, that the convert has usually still to overcome the same adolescent difficulties as does the person whose growth is gradual. To say that the convert anticipates the growth of the other does not mean at all that steps in growth have been dropped out. One suddenly reaches the stature of a man religiously only if, through the gradual and natural maturing of his powers, he is potentially already a man. The child may map out in the rough the end to be attained, the solid structure has yet to be built. The awakening 
of the association centers which gives glimpses into the higher life is one step toward manhood or womanhood the other more serious step is to bring it about that the new life shall be completely coordinated with the old and that it shall become habitual and easy adolescence is a preparation for manhood the functioning of the whole series of years of youth is to produce out of the dawning of spiritual life with its sense of newness its uncertainty faltering doubting no matter in what way it first shows itself a stable and symmetrical manhood and womanhood end of chapter thirty Chapter 31 of the Psychology of Religion by Edwin Diller Starbuck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31. Some Educational Inferences. The reader who has followed through the preceding pages may have felt, while looking into these groups of facts, the possibility of becoming nature's helper toward wiser and better ways of religious education. We have now to take some little account of the stock of practical wisdom we have gathered. We have found ourselves wandering off here and there into educational implications of the principles we have chanced to discover, when they seemed heavy with practical suggestiveness. In chapters 13 and 28, we deliberately turned aside to discuss the pedagogy of conversion. In the chapter just before this, and in several earlier ones, we indulged in little digressions on the pedagogy of adolescence. The points discussed will not be called up again. We are now to turn to a few considerations of a more general nature. The first thing that impresses us is that the residue has shrunken below what we had anticipated while we were wandering among the groups of details. It seems less than the sum of the bits of wisdom that we seem to gather up here and there. It has been noticeable all the way along that some one of our conclusions which appeared true at the time has been limited and restricted by some other one equally true. In our study of groups, subgroups, and individual records, we have at least somewhat a contradictory array of results. Indeed, if there is any one thing that we learn forcibly from the preceding pages, it is the importance of being shy of making too hasty educational inferences. Especially is this true in applying to individual instances principles that are true for people in general. Temperaments and the complexities of environment are as manifold as the persons who compose the groups we have been studying. The first demand is that in religious education we adapt ourselves to the needs and conditions of each person. One can scarcely think of a single pedagogical maxim in regard to religious training which, if followed in all cases, might not violate the deepest needs of the person whom it is our purpose to help. The first requisite is that the teacher or spiritual leader shall know something of the case he is to deal with, his training, his temperament, and the present trend of his life. It requires careful reading into human nature to know what a person needs and is ripe for. Although it is difficult to lay down rules that will apply to individual persons and to the same person in different periods of his development, still the results are not so barren as we might at first suppose. The value of the study of persons and groups is that it establishes certain standards by which to judge individual instances. To have well-established types by which to estimate religious phenomena is as important in the sphere of spiritual things as to have standards of distance in physics and astronomy, or laws and principles and formulas in mathematics and chemistry. It is even of greater importance inasmuch as the data are intangible. We find in the first place, glancing at the general course of development, that there are different lines of religious growth. If we classify the persons by the way they make the transition from childhood to maturity, we have studied at least four fairly distinct types of experience. There are, first, those who make the transition without any hitch or break, and who reach manhood or womanhood without knowing how or when. There are those, again, in whom the currents of fresh life break at the surface and render youth more or less tempestuous. Of these, one group is fitted temperamentally to work themselves into a crisis and to make the transition suddenly. Of this number there are those, lastly, who are yet more impulsive and who not only enter adolescence by a conversion, but pass from that to maturity in the same way. Religious teachers will accomplish the best results by taking into account all of these ways, which are for different qualities of temperament, doubtless, the normal lines of growth. Among the Christian churches there are distinct ideals held up as true means of entering the spiritual life. A few denominations emphasize the fact of sin, 
set it against that of salvation and insist on a definite, decisive, and more or less momentary change of life. Another group of denominations have recognized the likelihood of the burst of new life at the beginning of adolescence. They take means to cultivate it and have established the right of confirmation, which symbolizes the entrance into the new life. Still a third group of churches hold to the idea that the religious life, just as the mental or physical, is a gradual development, and that alone, and have no ceremony to bring about or symbolize the birth into the new life. Certain denominations have caught up and emphasized one aspect of growth, and overlooked others which seem equally natural and fundamental. We have seen that these groups of persons all reach about the same end. The quality of religion which results in the person's attitude toward life have, in general, more similarities and differences. They are different ways toward the same goal. But now, in spite of the fact that one church holds up as its ideal one of these lines of growth, and another holds exclusively to another, the persons in these churches are scattered among all the groups we have studied. They follow the laws written in their own beings, rather than the ideal held up by the churches. A few churches recognize, to a certain degree, these different tendencies, and attempt to meet them. It is a matter of the greatest moment that religious institutions become so plastic that they can adapt themselves to the peculiarities and needs of individual life, rather than to conform over strenuously to a single abstract ideal. The feature of this study which throws most light on the problem of religious education is the setting forth of the stages in growth from childhood to maturity. Fortunately, we are coming to observe tendencies in growth everywhere. Nothing has helped more in interpreting human life and the world about us, has so brought order and purpose out of chaos as our habit of seeing everything fit into a process of development. Everything is good in proportion as it is seen to contribute to a higher good. The individual human life, too, is a developing thing. Each stage in it contributes to the next. The object of its period, taken together, is to produce a man or woman as it is the purpose of racial life to produce a perfect type of humanity. There are duties and ideals which are especially fitting for each stage in life, and so there is a religious ideal peculiar to each age. In secular education, we are coming rapidly to recognize the varying needs of the growing child and to adapt ourselves to each period of growth, to make the most out of each in order that it may lead on easily and naturally to the next. Ethical and religious education must likewise adapt themselves to the growing personality of the individual. We are now to notice briefly the various stages in life and the different emphasis that our religious precepts must have in each. For our purpose, we shall consider only the principal ones, childhood, youth, and manhood or womanhood. It is characteristic of childhood to be lacking in self-conscious personality. True enough, each child has his own peculiarities, but his acts are largely the result of either heredity or imitation. Through hereditary traits, the child is bound close to racial life. It is necessary for its own well-being and for that of humanity that it be much like its own. Society would be impossible if a child were born a tree or a bird. The instinct of imitation is yet another way nature has of making children embody the characteristics of their kind. By mimicking the habits of those about him, the little dog is becoming more a dog, and the babe more human. Through these two sources, the child is becoming unconsciously filled with good habits, is having ingrained into his nerves, bones, and muscles customs that will be of utility when he takes his place at some future time as a citizen. It has been well observed that the helplessness of childhood and the lengthening out of its period of duration has been a necessary accompaniment and condition of our involved civilization. It furnishes a longer time in which to acquire good habits. Now the condition that a child shall drink in the best of racial life is that it have a considerable degree of submissiveness. Consequently, it has been generally recognized that the central precept for childhood is obedience. Among different peoples this has been regarded as, in early life, the highest virtue. What we have noticed in the religion of childhood seems to be in accordance with this characteristic. The child is credulous. Religion is external to him. He is open and receptive toward his surroundings. He drinks in unconsciously the religious influences about him. The function of childhood is to furnish for after life a rich fund of latent wisdom and to lay by a stock of wholesome tendencies. 
There comes a time, however, when the child must awaken to the fact of his own personality. He is later to stand as a unit in society, is to be a positive force among his fellows. He must become conscious of his own powers. To self-consciousness, he must add self-direction. He must grow strong, cease to be a mere recipient, and become a producer. Now the truest message for youth is that which calls out the personality into clear identity, which helps it on its feet. Youth starts uncertain of itself, halting and stumbling. Morally, physically, every way, the boy or girl in early adolescence is awkward and unsteady. The gait is ambling. The movements are ungainly. The speech is ungraceful. All told, the youth is an uncertain and vacillating quantity. He may have to pass through the whole range of adolescent years before he gains possession of himself. It is the business of the parent and teacher to help the youth become a man, to inspire confidence, to have him pause and listen to the voice within himself. Be still and know that I am God, the Hebrew prophet put into the mouth of Jehovah. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the names of goodness, but must explore if it be goodness. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Absolve you to yourself, and you shall have the suffrage of the world, said Emerson, the herald of the gospel of youth. Insist on yourself, never imitate. To thine own self be true are the wholesome sentences that have called many a slumbering youth into possession of himself and set him into the way which leads to strong and beautiful manhood. Thou art God, thou art God, was the message that burned in the heart of the Brahmin priests. Yea, are the sons of God, said Christ. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Go into thyself, the deepest of depths, he seemed to say, and there thou wilt find thyself to be one with the universal life and infinite truth. This is distinctively the ideal of youth. Be thyself, and to thy own self be true. This seems to be the true message for youth, even if it comes at the cost of a certain degree of conceit and self-assertiveness. Youth is proverbially self-centered. We have found in our analysis of the religion of early adolescence that although the altruistic impulses are inextricably bound up with the rest, the central thing in it is self-realization. Not long ago, the writer listened to a body of earnest young people discussing in a religious gathering the question of man's duty to himself. A single one out of a large number ventured the opinion that one's duty was first to his neighbor and to God and then to himself. The point of view generally was that if one is wholly true to his higher self, then there can be no accounts to square with anyone. If we see what nature is trying to produce in this stage of growth, we shall not only be patient with the egoism of young people, but on occasion encourage it. The lisping and stammering of a little child, if looked upon as a finality, would be a crime against language. But as a step in the child's development, it is not only endurable, but becomes sweet and beautiful in what it promises. Youth, too, is only a step in growth. The person can carry back into life only such strength and poise and self-confidence and helpfulness as he has completely mastered and worked over into his own personality. Faithless and faint a heart, the voice returned. Thou seest no beauty, save thou make it first. Man, woman, nature, each is but a glass, where the soul sees the image of herself, visible echoes, offsprings of herself. He needs to shut himself away from the noisy, hurrying, bustling world and reflect, meditate, commune with the life that is springing up within him, and let the scattered bits of wisdom that he has gathered here and there flow into organic whole. The function, then, of adolescence is to lay the foundation through self-realization for strong, healthy, and vigorous manhood and womanhood. A study of the usual trend of life has shown us that the birth of self and the years of effort toward self-realization are only a preparation for a third stage, which is one primarily of helpfulness and service. Most of those who doubt and struggle in youth persons who are avowedly without a religion, those who toil painfully into clear possession of themselves, who rebel against conventions, who set up their own revelations against those of all the rest, these place their lives again in touch with those of their fellows, come to recognize a law and order that is above their own, 
come to see that their own wills are a reflection of a higher will and that they are one with the life of God and man. It is a conception which emerges into a clear and clear outline as life grows more complex, that society is an organism, that its growth and that of each person on whom the whole depends consists in an endless process of giving and taking. The human beings are members of one body, politically, socially, every way, and must become progressively more so, more rationally and intelligently bound together. The individual comes to feel that he exists for the whole. We see this line of advance also in historical development. In the midst of the egocentric philosophy of the Upanishads, we come upon a feeling of the limitations of the self. The self is a bank, a boundary. He who has crossed that bank, if blind, ceases to be blind, if wounded, ceases to be wounded, if afflicted, ceases to be afflicted. Therefore, when that bank has been crossed, night becomes day indeed, for the world of God is lighted up once for all. This seems to be the fact of greatest significance in Christ's teaching. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. If we have interpreted the line of growth correctly, this is the gospel of mature life. Lose thyself in some worthy service. Count thy life cheap, if only it can be given up to some high end. We have then three precepts representing three stages of growth. In childhood, conform. In youth, be thyself. In maturity, lose thyself. It should not be overlooked that these ideals do not belong exclusively to certain stages of growth. We have only been noticing the special emphasis they demand in each of the periods. Altruism we found to have a definite birth in adolescence, side by side with the birth of self. It is the anticipation of maturity, just as the stilted self-consciousness of a child of six or seven seems to be a premonitory symptom of adolescence. The impulse toward self-enlargement persists, likewise in a religion of maturity. All these are woven in together at every stage of life. Indeed, what we have come gradually to appreciate in the preceding chapters is that spiritual life develops out of a complexity of instincts. The growth from childhood consists in emphasizing enlarging and refining some of these at the proper time, and in suppressing others and allowing them to fall into a relatively subordinate place, or even to wither entirely. Religion in its highest form may be fairly regarded as a radiation, an intermingling, a complication, and spiritualization of the impulses already present in human nature. Professor James has stated the principle in a general form which applies to religious education as well. Every acquired reaction is as a rule, either a complication grafted on a native reaction or a substitute for a native reaction, which the same objective originally intended to provoke. The teacher's art consists in bringing about the substitution or complication, and success in the art presupposes a sympathetic acquaintance with the reactive tendencies natively there. The work of the religious teacher consists in creating such an environment that each of the instincts which enter into the fabric of religion shall be called out through the proper stimuli, that they be lifted up into the higher psychic centers, that each shall have its due emphasis during its nascent period of development, that they be richly interwoven into the texture of the normal psychic reactions and thereby become spiritualized. This brings us to one of the most suggestive practical considerations, namely the importance of wisely anticipating the stages of growth and leading on naturally and easily from one stage into the next. The extreme difficulties and friction that so frequently attend religious development lead one to believe that there is much needless waste. Life seems to take a zigzag course. Instead of following a direct line toward what appears to be its goal, growth too often proceeds by a series of maladjustments and corrections, by groping in the dark rather than by moving straight onward. The highest function of education is conserve the life forces to produce the best results with the least expenditure of energy. With the ideal ends of growth in view, with a clear insight into the lines along which it normally proceeds, it should be more and more possible to escape pitfalls and to make life move on inevitably toward the fullest, most symmetrical proportions. If we come to see clearly that religion is the outgrowth of native instincts, we shall see that it is possible to play upon these instincts and elicit them at any point along the line of growth. 
The friction is largely due to the fact that we stumble unprepared upon new things too great for immediate assimilation. Coming into adolescence, for example, is frequently attended by a shock. Persons suddenly come upon the recognition of great new demands that must be met and are thrown into confusion. Skill in education consists in taking off the newness of the next step in growth by drawing those instincts into activity in an earlier stage, which are to function more strongly in a later. If a little child is called out into sympathetic activity in small ways, the foundation is being laid for the disinterested love and service that are to characterize its life in maturity. Bits of duty and responsibility in childhood, if faithfully discharged, tend to call forth a life which can meet the sense of obligation. That often rises mountain high in youth and crushes the spirit. If, as soon as the intellect begins to pry into things, its craving to comprehend the world be sufficiently met and satisfied, the youth may not have to choose between authority and reason and narrowly cling to either. If the child is kept doing things which imply religion, while yet ignorant of their meaning, and the youth is encouraged to carry into action the wisdom that comes to him, the way will be paved for the life of conduct, which is to supplant the adolescent life by especially absorbed in reflection and insight. In many such ways it seems possible to eliminate unnecessary steps in growth, to obviate wandering aimlessly and ignorantly here and there in the stream of development, or, as often occurs, to pass into some side channel or eddy and remain there, either in the innocence of childhood or in the self-assertion or negation of youth. While it is important to anticipate stages of growth and prepare the way for them, it is just as important that the different steps should not be hastened unduly. If each has its place to fulfill in preparing for the mature life of growth and service, it should be given time to ripen to its full perfection. It seems that nature has a purpose in lengthening out the years of childhood. The age of receptivity, when the child is drinking in, the influences in forming the habits which are the stock on which it is to draw in after life. A purpose seems to underlie also the drawing out of the adolescence to more than a decade in duration. There is often a tendency to defeat the ends nature apparently has in view by skipping steps, by forcing the child to the definite religious awakening which belongs to youth, by hastening the youth into missionary work, or other phrases of intense activity and assumed productivity. While he should be gaining self-mastery and thorough assimilation of the wisdom which, as a mature person, he is to bring back to the world. In organized society, this danger is very great. Religious institutions have gathered up, through experience, a knowledge of the ends of religious growth, and hold to them with unswerving insistency. Society which is composed of adults sees truth naturally from its own point of view. The gospel of mature life crystallizes into a religious ideal, which is not only held up to guide grown men and women, but is thoughtfully thrust upon children and youths as well. It may be the truest wisdom of those who teach it, and yet not fit the needs of younger persons. Even little children are made to assume the religious customs of grown people, and often not in ways appropriate to them, but in forms adapted to their elders. Just at the transition from childhood to adolescence, at the point at which one begins to gain a first-hand grasp of religious truth, is another step, as we saw in an earlier chapter, at which the enthusiasm of grown persons often gets the better of discretion. The testimony of those whose whole youth seems to have lost its equilibrium through inopportune responding, while yet only children, to the gospel of repentance or by following the advice of some well-meaning person who did not understand the function of the first serious questioning of a child into religious truth is a pathetic story. Just when the soul begins to put out its tentacles and feel its way into the higher life, it often happens that someone crashes into it with a gospel that contradicts every need of its nature. The disturbances of youth seem to be as much due to lack of sympathy of older people with the needs of human nature as to temperamental peculiarities and physiological defects. The interests of the religious life demand that in venturing to help in the processes of growth from childhood to maturity, there should be a tract, a knowledge, a delicacy of treatment, in some measure commensurate with the infinite finesseness of the organism with which we are dealing. When, and to what extent, should the child be left with a playful imagery that makes up his early religious conceptions? How far should he conform to the customs of those about him? 
under what conditions should a person be let alone to commune with the life that is speaking through him is the course of his life already wisely directed gravitating surely and steadily toward what seems to be the goal of spiritual attainment are the threads of dawning consciousness being skillfully knit and the tension of feeling symmetrically strung to set the new life going in the right direction and to tune it to every virtue is this person ready for the magic stroke which is to change the child into the man does he only need a hazy mind clarified and a struggling spirit calmed or has he a distorted attitude of life which should be violently forsaken should he be induced into intense activity would his life be perfected by a fuller recognition of the forces at work within him or does he need to be filled and thrilled with the ideal of self-forgetfulness these and many such questions should be taken into account at least implicitly before one ventures to interfere in the delicate processes that are going on in the religious life of any human being this wisdom will come about only when we have gained a knowledge a more intimate knowledge than we now possess of the ends nature has in view in religious development in the lines of approach along which these ends are to be accomplished of the factors which enter into fully developed religion of the steps and their relation to one another which are involved in the line of growth and furthermore a knowledge of human nature in all its complexity and diversity end of chapter 31 end of the psychology of religion by edwin diller starbuck